Okay, so just let me know, Elizabeth, when we're good. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our planning committee meeting for May 12th at a beautiful Port Carling. The weather is spectacular here today. And I'm going to call this meeting to order at 9 a.m. I am um, verbally confirming that we do have um, quorum with our our councillors, I don't believe we're missing Councillor Zavitz, perhaps, and I think that's it. And uh, I'm sure he'll be here momentarily. We haven't heard from him. And I'm also verbally uh, confirming that we have our senior management team here with us. So uh, input to this meeting was accepted at planning at muskokalakes.ca. Um, our, our planning staff, um, circulates all of those comments that come into planning to the councillors before this meeting. So we've all had a chance to look at that. And I also need to uh, let you know that we're, we're, the meeting today is live streamed and recorded on the township uh, website and YouTube channel. And obviously by participating, you are giving confirmation that you will be allowing your voice and comments to be recorded and posted online. And as usual, um, all of the all of the um, motions are pre-populated just to speed things up while we're still in this Zoom uh, format. So, okay. And I do want to acknowledge the supplementary agenda today. We have uh, Arnie Colson, uh, Kay uh, Tickums, and Peter Cowan to provide public comments at 1 p.m. re item 11A, Site Alteration and Tree Preservation Bylaws. And Stephen Farner is coming at 1.30. Um, in terms of the Muskoka Trust, which is item 12A. So hopefully we'll keep to that time schedule. Um, now, my next, uh, my next before we get into the meeting is disclosure of pecuniary interest. Did anyone have that? Um, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to declare, uh, make a disclosure of pecuniary interest on agenda item 8B, the resort village of Minette. Uh, I, I guess I give a reason. I recently became an owner of uh, of units uh, in that hotel commercial property. So I'll be excusing myself from that part. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I will uh, not be uh, declaring on uh, 5D3. That is uh, 118 Holding Inc. Uh, it's a uh, my uh, grandson just started working for, for that company. So I will be declaring. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, our counselors will simply turn their cameras off um, when they're in that conflict of interest and not participate in any discussion or any motion that may come from that. Okay, so the other thing I just wanna remind everybody that our invited delegations have five minutes to speak today. Those who wish to um, speak in our public meetings also have five minutes and um, public comments are permitted to speak for two minutes uh, if they have pre-registered after our time, uh, after our timelines. So with that in mind, I also know we've got a really heavy agenda today. I'm not sure I've ever been able to say we haven't, but um, I'm going to try and keep us moving and uh, we're going to attempt to get through this all today. I know everybody would probably prefer that. We won't uh, cut any corners in terms of proper um, looking at this and debating it, uh, but if, with your indulgence, I'll try and keep us on track. And if you can try to speak just once, think about what you want to say. If you have something more to add, obviously, but let's just um, let's just keep it moving. Okay. So I think those are my comments for this for this morning. And so I believe we can get to our first uh, application. And Ms. Walker, I think that you are up for Orgles Point Limited. Please take it away. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and good morning, everyone. The first applications to be heard are consent applications B-141-21 ML and zoning bylaw amendment applications at BA-72-21 bylaw 2021-211 in the name of Orgles Point Limited. The subject properties are known municipally as 1009, 1035, and 1037 Orgles Point Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted consent sketch and zoning sketch on page 37 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. 
Consent application B slash 141 slash 21 ML has been submitted to create three lots in total, one severed lot and two retained lots. It should be noted that the three lots previously existed and were merged by the previous owners. The purpose of zoning bylaw 2021-211, sorry, is to provide an exemption from the minimum lot frontage and area requirements for the waterfront residential WR4 zone. The severed lot is to have 239 feet of frontage and 1.9 acres of area. Retained lot one is to have 300 feet of frontage and five acres of area. And retained lot two is to have 339 feet of frontage and four acres of area. Zoning bylaw 2021-211 will also permit two exist existing dwelling units to remain on um, retained lot two, an existing dock and two-story boathouse on retained lot two to have a cumulative width of 134 feet and 83.5 feet respectively. It will also permit an existing two-story boathouse on the retained lot two to be 43 feet from a westerly lot line. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 21 days in advance and six submissions have been received to date. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the Township's Chief Building Official, Tim Sopko, the Township's Public Works Technician, Sandy Boss, the Township Septic Inspector, Curtis Severett, Planner at the District of Muskoka, Hydro One, and the Trillium Lakelands District School Board. All of these submissions were circulated to committee prior to today's meeting, and I'm happy to read any of those submissions in full. I have prepared a detailed report for committee's consideration. If committee is considering recommending approval of consent application B slash 141 slash 21 ML or Bulls Point Limited, staff recommend that application be approved subject to the following. One, that a registral description of the severed law and any required rights of ways be submitted to the secretary treasurer along with the registered, registered copy of the reference plan. Two, that confirmation be received that the township is satisfied that the proposed severed and retained laws can be adequately serviced by individual on-site septic systems and that any concerns be addressed to the satisfaction of the township. Three, that it be confirmed that the two-story boathouse on retain lot two does not contain a dwelling use. Four, that exemptions to the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw be approved. And the, these are the following. Uh, recognize the proposed lot frontage and lot area of the severed and retained lots. Permit two sleeping cabins to remain on retained lot two. Recognize the cumulative width of the existing dock in the two-story boathouse on retain lot two, and permit the existing two-story boathouse to be 43 feet from the proposed westerly lot line. If committee's considering recommending approval of ZBA 72 slash 21 by law 2021 at 211, staff recommend the following minor amendment. That exemption C to permit two dwelling units to remain on retain lot two be amended to permit two sleeping cabins. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Thank you, Ms. Walker. And I believe Mr. Allen is here to speak uh, on behalf of the applicant. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Mr. Allen. Good morning, Chair Bridgman. It's nice to see everybody again. Um, good morning. Um, I, I hope you're like me and have shorts on your lower half. Um, <laughs> I am uh, here to represent uh, the application that Mr. Ms. Walker uh, introduced. I um, would note that the, the Bice Streiser family is uh, the holder of Orgles Point Limited. I have a presentation that I would like to uh, briefly go through, if that could be queued up, please. I thank Ms. Walker for her uh, detailed explanation of the application. Next slide, please. I would note that the, uh, there's three properties uh, that are currently subject to this application that previously existed. Each of them have their own roll number and their own civic address. Next slide, please. The lots are located on Lake Joseph and you can see the uh, arrangement of the original lots on this slide. Currently, they have uh, merged into one singular property and the merger occurred uh, by a previous owner. Next slide, please. Each lot is developed with its own uh, dwelling and uh, sleeping cabin and septic system. And the proposal in front of you today is to recreate the original lots 
and as well as to increase the size of 1035 Orgles Point Road uh, to bring it up to the minimum two acre standard that would be expected on Lake Joseph to recognize the two existing dwellings on retained lot number two, which is 1037 Orgles Point Road to recognize the side yard setback of the existing two story boathouse on 1037 Orgles Point Road and also to recognize the existing dock and boathouse widths on 1037 Orgles Point Road. I would note that no development is proposed as part of this application. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, severance sketch that shows the uh, retained and severed lots. The red line that crosses through the severed lot shows the original uh, lot configuration. The gray line shows the proposed lot. And you can see the lot size will be expanded. There's a table on the bottom left that shows the proposed areas and frontages. And uh, we've noted that there's a dwelling and sleeping cabin on each of the lots, as well as a, uh, a second dwelling within the two-story boathouse on sever or oh, retain lot number two. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I think we went the wrong direction. Oh, well, maybe not. Uh, this specific amendment uh, in front of you was uh, thoroughly explained by uh, Ms. Walker, so I don't intend to get into the specific numbers or details, but you can see these are the uh, proposed amendments that are part of the zoning bylaw amendment application. Next slide, please. Retained lot number two, which is 1035 Orbills Point Road, has a number of bylaw exemptions uh, included with this application. One is to recognize the existing dock width and boathouse width. Uh, as well as to deal with the side yard setback that comes from the new lot line from the severed lot, which actually extends across the lake uh, towards uh, retained lot number two, as well as to recognize the existing dwelling within the two story boathouse. And I'll provide some additional comments uh, related to that at the end of my presentation. Next slide, please. Here's some site photos. This is retained lot number one. This is the eastern lot that abuts up to the Sherwood Inn property. Um, you can see the shoreline buffer as well vegetated. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the severed lot, the center lot, the middle lot. Uh, you can see a small sleeping cabin to the right and the existing dwelling. Next slide, please. Uh, the largest uh, of the lots is um, retained lot number two. This is the, uh, the large two-story boathouse that contains the existing dwelling. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, second dwelling that's located behind the two-story boathouse on retained lot number two. Next slide, please. Uh, it's a little bit blurry on this, but this is a panoramic from the dock at 1037 Orbels Point Road, uh, directed towards the shoreline of the subject property. You can see the shoreline buffer is uh, extremely well vegetated and the existing dwellings that are located on those new lots are not visible from lakeside views. Next slide, please. So in terms of planning analysis, the township has allowed the creation of uh, historical lots that have merged. A retained lot one and two comply with the minimum 300 foot um, requirement and two acre requirement on Lake Joseph. Uh, the severed lot, which is the center lot, has been increased uh, to comply with the, the two acre minimum requirement, but it remains at the original 241 feet of frontage. All the existing development is either compliant or legal non-compliant, except for the dwelling that is located within the boathouse on retained lot two. The shoreline buffer is intact, naturally vegetated and well-treated. Uh, recognizing, in, in my opinion, recognizing the second dwelling does not change the intensity of use of the lot and no new buildings or structures are proposed as part of these applications. Next slide, please. Uh, just a few comments on the second dwelling. Um, there is a, as I've mentioned, a, two, uh, a dwelling within the two-story boathouse on 1037 Orbels Point Road. The boathouse was constructed in 1986, and, and the upper story was to be a sleeping cabin at the time. In 1987, the previous owners, the Roundtrees, had converted the sleeping cabin into a dwelling by adding a stove. An affidavit had been provided by Stan Greer that confirmed the date of the stove was installed. Um, and, and up until the application was submitted, the township had pr no prior knowledge that their stove was in the boathouse. The new owners, the Bistreisers, um, want to be open and transparent about the use of the second story of the boathouse uh, being a dwelling, and they would like to maintain and continue to have that use. I would note that 35 years has passed since the stove was installed, 
And uh, myself and the, the BIST racers are not aware of any concerns related to the intensity of use, servicing needs related to that second dwelling in the boathouse. So clearly, uh, the, when the owners purchased the property, the, the dwelling was uh, located in the boathouse and they would like to maintain that boathouse. Uh, but we would also respect any um, decision that the committee would make today. Next slide, please. In my professional opinion, the proposed severance and zoning bylaw amendment conforms with the Township and District Official Plan. This is consistent with the provincial policy statement and represents good planning. And um, Chair Bridgman, um, I think you forgot to remind me to provide my uh, mailing address. Um, I'm with Planscape Inc, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L188. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Allen. I'm sure we could have looked that up somewhere, <laughs> so, but but you are correct. It is needed at the beginning. Um, would the owners uh, care to speak, Mr. Allen, on behalf of this at all? They certainly don't need to, but I just wanted to make that offer. Uh, thank you uh, through you, Chair Bridgman. Um, Asher Bistreiser is listening in to the meeting today and is available to answer any questions if you have some, but he uh, did not plan to speak to the committee. Okay, terrific. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on behalf of this application for this? No, Elizabeth, thank you. Anyone against this? No. All right. Okay. Well, then I'm going to turn it over to committee. Committee, any questions, comments? Councillor Kelly, you look like you're looking for your hand. Just go <laughs> I, ahead. I found it. Thank you. Uh, and through you, um, uh, just a quick question, since really what we're doing is unwinding of uh, the merger of three previously independent lots. I, I'm curious to know whether the, uh, the, lot, the lot merger was inadvertent through operation of law or was there a conscious act taken to, uh, to combine them under one title? And, and if that's the case, was there some advantage that was gained by it? I'm just curious how we wound up in this situation. Okay, Ms. Walker, would you be able to answer that? Or, 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 um, or Ryan, Mr. Allen? Uh, thank you through you, Chair Bridgman. Um, it, it's my understanding when the owners, uh, the Bistracers purchased the property, uh, they were aware that the lots had merged. Um, there was no understanding um, necessarily of uh, why the merger occurred. Uh, mergers occur uh, for a number of reasons when properties change title. Uh, it, sometimes when somebody passes away and someone is removed from the deed, mergers can, uh, previously to the Planning Act um, modifications, would merge on title. So I, I think the, the last point that I would make is that there are significant challenges that are proposed, uh, that are implied when uh, lots merge. Specifically, if you have more than one dwelling or more than one sleeping cabin on a lot, you're not able to expand any of those dwellings or sleeping cabins. That's a significant burden that is placed on a property. So it'd be strange to me to intentionally merge a property that would result in those types of restrictions being applied. Um, but the, the, sh the short answer is, I don't know who merged it. I don't know when it was merged, but the owners would like to reinstate the original lots that previously existed. Each of them have their own civic address, their own roll number. Um, and were uh, bona fide separate lots previously. Okay, thank you. And, and Ms. Walker, I believe, um, I think it's the provincial um, uh, policy statement that originally created lots can be recreated again. I think that, that our planning principles favor that. Thank you, Mr. Bridgman. I'll ask uh, Mr. Sharp to respond to that one. Okay, Mr. Sharp. Welcome, Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and good morning, uh, members of Planning Committee and Mr. Allen, uh, the applicants and members of the public who may be listening. Um, as, as Mr. Allen had, had indicated, uh, the lots have merged and uh, frequently um, applications that are brought forward to recreate lots that have intentionally merged or unintentionally merged rather is referred to as a, a quote unquote technical uh, severance. In this particular instance, uh, the official plan contains policies that allow, um, uh, that, that favor exceptions to minimum lot requirements, uh, where, the, where more than one main uh, building or one main use uh, is, is existing. Um, in, that in this case, there's, there's more than one dwelling. 
uh, more than one sleeping cabin. So uh, the application benefits from those uh, official plan policies. I hope, hopefully that helps clarify. I'm, I'm able to add further insight if needed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. I, I received a text message from, uh, from Asher Bistreiser and he noted that the lots were merged when the previous owners had purchased the property. They bought them all in the same name with one single ownership. These were original lots, so they automatically merged on title. And this was by accident and not intentional. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think my only other question to committee, and I don't see anybody challenging it at this point in time, we are going to uh, remove that second dwelling on the retained property. It would have to go back to a sleeping cabin. Oh, okay. I was going to read the motion, but Councillor Roberts, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you. Um, on um, the lot number two, we'll call it, that has two dwellings in it. It was established as a, a well, considered a, a dwelling many, many years ago when the stove was installed. Is that correct? No, nope, you're shaking your head. My, I no, it was, it was, it was, well, maybe I should let Mr. Sharp answer this, uh, but no, it, it is not officially. Um, Mr. Sharp, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Chair Bridgman. I can try to do my best to explain um, the situation prior to the passing of zoning bylaw 8787. Um, the bylaw that was in effect in the former township of Medora was restricted area bylaw 65-7, which did not permit dwellings in uh, boathouses. Um, so there was a building permit issued in, I believe it was 1986, and there was a specific comment put on the face of that permit that a kitchen uh, would not be uh, permitted in the, the building. Um, subsequent to the, to the final inspection that was undertaken, according to the affidavit that's been provided by Mr. Allen, I understand that the contractor who is responsible for the, uh, the development of the boathouse installed the stovetop, and hence its staff's opinion, regardless of how many years have uh, passed, um, we are now aware that the boathouse contains a dwelling uh, by definition containing a stovetop and we are not of the opinion that that use is lawful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then uh, continuing Madam Chair, uh, I, I used the wrong words. So um, is it um, feasible for us at this time to restrict, um, not to, and I'm just talk, thinking off the top of my head here, not to stop the use of the, of the dwelling but to uh, if 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 the, uh, the buildings change in any way, then then it'd have to go back to the current standard. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking, Councillor Roberts. Our our motion basically says you have to take that that stove out, and it becomes a sleeping cabin again. Okay. So it, okay. So so it, I, we, I was getting the lots confused. Okay. All right. That's what the motion says. The, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry it's, for it, the confusion. My mistake. No, no, no. We all need to understand what we're voting on for sure. So, all right. I am going to read this motion then. Uh, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that consent application B-141-21-ML slash 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 Orgles Point Limited be approved subject to the following conditions. That a registrable description of the severed lot and any required rights of way be submitted to the Secretary Treasurer, along with a registered copy of the reference plan, the confirmation be received that the township is satisfied that the proposed severed and retained lots can be adequately serviced by individual on-site septic systems and that any concerns be addressed to the satisfaction of the township. That it be confirmed that the two-story boathouse on retained lot two does not contain a dwelling use and that exemptions from the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw be approved to recognize the proposed lot cover frontage and lot area of the severed lot and, re, and retained lots one and two, permit two sleeping cabins to remain on re, retained lot number two, recognize the cumulative width of the existing dock and two-story boathouse on retained lot number two, and permit an existing two-story boathouse to be 43 feet from the proposed westerly lot line. Councillor Edwards. Yes, thank you, Chair, Chair Bridgman. Uh, when we take the stove out, uh, this is just for uh, clarification, 
Does the wiring have to come out as well because it's uh, two, two, 220, so uh, it stops them from just a week later putting the stove back in? It was just a, a question for staff, but I don't have a problem with this and I will support it. Thank you. Mr. Sharp, would you be able to answer Councillor Edwards' question? Thank you, uh, Chair Bridgman. I may look to Mr. Pink to provide uh, his insight here. Um, I, I do recall instances, instances in the past where uh, the wiring or the, uh, uh, yeah, I guess the wiring um, or the receptacle for a stove top was be required to be uh, removed. But I see Mr. Pink has his uh, camera on and he has um, more insight uh, in this regard than, than I do at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pink. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Uh, I do believe in the past uh, when change of use permits uh, are applied for to convert uh, or change that use and remove, the electrical connection is removed. However, in this case, I suspect what building staff would do is refer to the 1986 building permit and ensure that the building is still in that uh, state that was permitted in, at that time. So uh, I think they would review those files and ensure it's meeting compliance with those. Okay, thank you. Mayor Hardy? Uh, thank you. I, I guess I'm not so worried necessarily about it. And as I'm forcing that it being removed, uh, this stove has been there for 30 plus years. The owner of the property has voluntarily said, we have a stove, we're going to take it out. We want to make things legal. So I think they're working with us in this particular case and um, appreciate the openness and honesty of the owner. So happy to pass the bylaw as is. Okay. I don't see any further discussions. So I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor? Madam Clerk, okay, carried, thank you. And uh, moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Zavitz, be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA-72-21, Orville's Point Limited, roll number 6-14-010, 6-14-011, 6-14-013 be approved, subject to the following minor amendment that exemption C to permit two dwelling units to remain on retain lot to be amended to permit two sleeping cabins. So this is just a technical. Um, all in favor? Madam Clerk? Okay, okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you, committee, have a good day. You too. Um, all right, now we're moving on to um, Osh, Osh, Oshhorn, I believe, and Ms. Walker, I think you're up again. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. The next application to be heard is consent application B slash 142 slash 21 ML and zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA dash 73 slash 21 bylaw 2021 112 in the name of Oshorn. The subject property is known municipally as 1805 Peninsula Road, Unit 375. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted consent sketch and zoning sketch uh, starting on page 86 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. Consent application B slash 142 slash 21 ML has been submitted to create one additional lot. The purpose of zoning bylaw 2021-112 is to permit an exemption from the minimum lot frontage and area requirements in the waterfront residential WR4 zone. The severed lot is to have 200 feet of frontage and two acres of area. The retained lot is to have 426 feet of frontage and four acres of lot area. Zoning bylaw 2021-112 will also impose a 45 foot side yard setback from the westerly lot line projection for shoreline structures on the severed lot. And it will permit an existing dock and two story boathouse on the retained lot to be 14 feet and 15 feet respectively from the easterly side lot line. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 20 days in advance and nine submissions have been received to date. Comments have been received by Nick Snyder, the township's chief building official, Tim Sopko, the township's public works technician, Sandy Bosch, boss, township septic inspector, Curtis Severett, planner at the District of Muskoka, Hydro One in the Trillium Lakelands District School Board. A letter of support by Jonathan Smoltz, area property owner at 1805 Peninsula Road, Unit 336 has been received. 
A letter of support has also been received from Kimberly Williams, neighboring property owner to the west at 1805 Peninsula Road, Unit 383. All of these submissions were circulated to committee prior to today's meeting. After the circulation of the comments, an additional letter of support was received from Tyler McNamara, an area property owner at 1331 Carlingford Road. The submission is summarized as follows. My name is Tyler McNamara and my wife Clara and I own the property at 1331 Carlingford Road across the river from the proposed severance. We are in full support of the severance of the property at 1805 Peninsula Road, Unit 375. I have prepared a detailed report for committee's consideration. If committee is considering recommending approval of consent application B-141-21 ML, staff recommend that the application be approved subject to the following. That a registral description of the severed lot and any required rights of ways be submitted to the secretary treasurer along with a registered copy of the reference plan. That cash in lieu of parkland be dedicated to the township in the amount of 5% for the assessed value of the newly created vacant lot or the entire subject lands, whichever is less. That, consent, that a consent agreement be entered into with the township under section 5126 of the Planning Act, wherein the owner of the severed lot agrees to implement the recommendations of the species at risk assessment dated April, 2022, and the fish habitat and deer wintering assessment dated October, 2021, prepared by FRI Ecological Services. And that exemptions to zoning, the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 be approved too. Recognize the proposed lot frontage and area of the severed and retained lots. Impose an increased side yard setback for the shoreline structures on the severed lot. From an existing dock on the retained lots be 14 feet from the easterly side lot line projection. Permit an existing two-story boathouse on the retained lots be 15 feet from the easterly side lot, side lot line projection. And to impose an increased minimum front yard setback of 80 feet on the severed lot. If committee is considering recommending approval of ZBA 72 slash 21 bylaw 2021 211, staff recommend the following minor amendments. That a minimum front yard setback of 80 feet be imposed on the suburb lot. I have no further comments, but I'd be happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. All right, so I see the agent here is um, Mr. Uh, Faradas. There you are. Good morning. Good morning, uh, members of the committee. My name is Savas Ferratis of Plan Muskoka, PO Box 5384, Huntsville, Ontario, P1H 2K7. I'm here this morning uh, representing the applicant, uh, Adam O'Shorn, as uh, his agent and as a professional planner. Um, I guess just to begin, I have listened to the presentation here this morning by staff. I've read the report. And uh, I agree with their recommendation for the approval of this application. Um, I think the information you've been provided from a technical standpoint, uh, you know, describes the application accurately. Uh, what I'd like to add is just maybe the rationale of how we ended up getting to this point and uh, the purpose behind these amendments. When the applicants first came to me um, with their property and asked uh, for the potential to sever this lot, um, the property itself has over 600 feet of frontage. And um, it appeared fairly straightforward that we'd be able to create one 300 foot lot with the, with the retained lot containing over 300 feet of frontage um, along the Joseph River. Um, what ended up happening is when we located the uh, structures on the, uh, the proposed, on, on the, the subject lands, the boathouse that exists on the, uh, on, the, on the subject lands ended up being pretty much right in the spot where we'd want to draw that, draw that dividing line. And um, what ended up happening is we just basically took that line, moved it over to the east and bent it to get it out of the way of the boathouse as much as possible to leave the boathouse on the retained lot with the, the existing dwelling that's on it as well. And um, in doing so, created a, a lot that has 200 feet of frontage on the uh, Joseph River versus the 300 feet, which is what we would have preferred. Um, we increased the um, side yard setback of the, any proposed uh, shoreline structures for the severed lot in order to compensate for a decreased side yard setback on the retained lot from, to the existing boathouse in order to keep that line as close to that boathouse as possible and increase the frontage of the severed lot as much as possible. What ended up happening also is um, it, when, when you look at this, uh, this severed lot, um, while it is deficient in frontage um, in terms of the 300 feet that's normally required, um, you still have an average of over 300 feet across both properties, 
um, we've sought to restrict the retained lot to its current um, frontage and area as well. So there would be no attempt to ever divide that lot, that lot in the future. And um, when you view this lot from the river, uh, it should be noted too that there's an original road allowance that's um, on the eastern side of the severed lot that uh, the way the shoreline cuts through that, that original road allowance actually creates about a hundred feet of, of frontage that's just gonna procure to be in its uh, natural state. So this lot, well, at 200 feet would appear um, to have a larger natural area beside it as well too. So visually, it still maintains um, something similar to what a 300 foot lot would look like. Um, we have no problems, the applicants have no problems um, with the minor amendment that's being proposed by staff, which is to increase the, uh, um, the front yard setback to 80 feet versus the 66 feet that's normally required on those lots. Um, this would help to assist um, to keep a larger shoreline buffer between any proposed structures on the severed lot and the shoreline and, um, you know, hopefully um, mitigating more visual impacts that this model lot may have. Um, as noted, there was an EIS prepared that looked at the property from an environmental perspective. All those recommendations made by that report will be implemented by way of the 5126 agreement that's being proposed by staff as a condition. We have no issue with doing that. So ultimately, what you have is, is a lot that would have normally permitted two properties to be created from it, but the unfortunate location of the boathouse caused uh, an issue in drawing that line in the ideal position. So even though the lot, the resulting lot frontages are 200 feet and 400 plus feet, when you combine the two together and average it out, it's still two lots as it would have normally been permitted on the property. So that was the sort of the idea behind where we, we came to this point. So um, again, I just want to reiterate that we agree with staff's recommendation for the approval of this application. Um, if there's any questions uh, I can answer, I'd be happy to do so. And the applicants are also present if you want to ask any questions to them directly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, Elizabeth, is there anyone else who wants to speak on behalf of this? Anyone against? Yeah. All right, I'm going to turn this over to uh, committee at this point then. Any comments from committee? Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> and I just uh, wanna make sure it's interesting as I look at the 200 feet plus the road allowance, um, and obviously we do have a significant frontage. <clears throat> One of the rationales I know in our, our staff report is moving the cottage back to 80 feet from a setback uh, because of a relatively small lot <clears throat> and or a narrow water body. I don't think we have an official plan policy that uh, narrow water bodies or narrow areas need to push a property back. Um, I, I realize the applicants have accepted that, but I just want a little more information from staff because it's the first time I've seen us just because of a visual impact pushing a cottage back. And I wonder if there might be a potential unintended consequence. You know, when we move cottages back, people tend to limb trees even a little bit more. There are more trees and more buffer that they may be somewhat disturbing to have somewhat of a view of the lake. Um, and maybe staff can answer that kind of comment or question how we came up with the 80 feet. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and uh, thank you, Mayor Harding, for your question. I think you, you raise a fair point. I, I, I can't point to a specific policy in the official plan that would necessitate an increased setback, but uh, you know the official plan does contain numerous policies with respect to waterfront character, waterfront aesthetics, privacy, all of those types of, of considerations, including uh, visual impacts. And some members of council may recall um, some quite contentious uh, consent applications uh, to the east of, of the road allowance uh, where a number of lots were created on the Joe River. And in those particular instances, um, there were two lots uh, of the four, I believe, that were created um, where an increased setback of, of 80 feet was imposed. So the idea uh, is to push land base development further away from the Joe River than would normally be required with the expectation that that would improve, um, you, you know, or help buffer, I guess, the appearance of development uh, on a water body that is, you know, a highly traveled water body in the township. Um, you know, it's it's there. It's a narrow area of narrowness from shoreline to shoreline. So I think you know the thinking of staff is that uh, in those areas of of narrowness, um, it's appropriate to do what we can to try to uh, assist with 
uh, protecting those, you know, uh, vegetative uh, aesthetics and uh, shoreline buffers and the character of, of the water body itself. I see that Mr. Pink has his camera on. Who he may wish to uh, jump in and elaborate if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pink. And thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, I just did want to point out the policy B five twelve in regards to front yards does reference the significance of maintaining privacy and noise attenuation in regards to front yard setbacks fronting onto a narrow water body. So, I don't think uh, this is entirely uh, unprecedented, uh, as Mr. Sher pointed out to the property adjacent. Uh, we do think setbacks uh, are uh, important for privacy reasons, particularly on very narrow, busy channels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, on page 105, and that was an uh, environmental thing, it says, where development and site plan alteration is permitted in the deer windering areas, the following standards shall be implemented. A minimum water front frontage of 300 feet, and where possible, a setback from the water of 100 feet. So I think we're being very liberal at 80 feet, and I, I wouldn't change that at all because this is in an environmental report. Thank you. Okay, I am going to, oh no, I'm going to wait to put my two cents worth in. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Well, thank you, Chair. You can go ahead if you want, but, uh, but I'm happy to proceed. Um, yes, I have a couple of things. Uh, it seems to me that this road allowance um, is being used twice. In other words, it was used to create the lots uh, to the south of it. Now it's being used uh, to create this lot. And my concern is that it'll then be used in the future to allow a two-story boat house. So I just wonder if there should be some consideration given to uh, make it, making it clear that if this 200 foot lot is, uh, is created, that a two-story boathouse would not be permitted. That was my, my, uh, my first question. And my second one was, and I, I apologize because I can't find the reference now, but it seemed to me in my reading of this a couple of days ago, there was some concern about the possible uh, um, use of, uh, of a second dwelling or that. And I just wonder if staff could comment on it. There was some issue of whether the use of the property, I just can't find the reference uh, there. But it, thank you. Okay, would would someone, Mr. Sharp? Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Certainly, staff have given some consideration to the uh, to the uh, road allowance that leads to water and council's current strong policy around not selling those uh, road allowances. And I, I think um, you know the the benefit of the road allowance does you know lend some merit to the application so far as an appearance is uh, considered. And, you know, the same argument was made um, to the lot that was created directly to the east. Um, and I would acknowledge that. With respect to this particular property, the, the entire frontage is actually zoned as a restricted water body. Um, so in this case, a, a two-story boathouse would not be permitted on the, the property because of that zoning. And it wouldn't be permitted on the property because of the deficient frontage. And, you know, I think through the work that Mr. Uh, Veratis has done with updated uh, surveys, he's, he's actually demonstrated that the dash R zoning may not be entirely appropriate given the, the distance from shoreline to shoreline. But staff think that, uh, you know, we, we've basically indicated in our report that, you know, part of the reason we're supportive of this application is because of the restrictions that are currently in place through the dash our, our zoning and I think we would uh, we would look to this process in the future if an application was ever brought forward for a two-story boathouse um, and you know I think in this particular instance if the application is approved uh, only a, a single story boathouse fronting onto the separate lot would be permitted no rooftop sun deck would be permitted and the length uh, of both a dock and a single story boathouse would be restricted as per the, the current zoning that is in place. So how, hopefully that helps to uh, um, alleviate some of the concerns, but I'm happy to elaborate or clarify if needed. Thank you. Follow up, Councillor Jaglowitz. Yes, you did answer my first question. Thank you, that was, that, that's appropriate. So I'm, I'm happy there. I guess on the other one about the, uh, 
the use. I guess I'm referring to, isn't there a situation where that there's some concern that the lower level of that boathouse may be used as habitable space? It was, was that a concern of staff? I, I just missed that. And uh, I know it was, uh, it was one of those that came out early when it was built. They just forgot to close in one of the slips and a lot of doors appeared to the side. So I wonder if you could just comment on how you're dealing with that. Thank you. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. And I, I apologize, I, I missed that aspect. I, I happen to have uh, a gentleman outside my window is washing my window, so I'm slightly uh, distracted at the moment. But uh, <laughs> um, so far as I'm concerned, we didn't raise any uh, concerns about the use of the, the lower level of the boathouse. Um, so, so I'm not aware of any concerns in that regard. I would look to, uh, to perhaps Ms. Walker, um, if she noticed anything that would uh, be contrary to what the bylaw would be would require as part of our uh, our site visit. Ms. Walker, your chair Bridgman, um, through my site visit, there wasn't anything we noticed on site that would be out of line with the use of the first story of the boathouse. Obviously, we don't inspect the inside the structures, but there was no concerns noted. Thank you. I must have it confused with another property then. Thank you. Perhaps not, Councillor Jagowitz. I think the pertinent question based on our discussion yesterday is, is there a dishwasher on the on the main level of that boathouse? <laughs> so I'm going to ask that question. Is there a dishwasher on the main level of the boathouse? Mr. Ferratis? Um, I honestly don't really know the answer to that question. I, I didn't inspect the inside of the boathouse as well. When I visited the property, I just sort of walked around the dock and, and had, a, had a peek, but uh, and there was somebody inside at the time. So um, I, I didn't have a, a good enough look to answer that question for you. I do believe it's, sorry. Oh, so could we let the owner in please, Elizabeth? I'm not sure this is part of this planning uh, anyway, but no, Mr. No. Oshorn, yeah. welcome. Yes, thank you, Chair. So I'm the applicant and uh, thank you everybody for today. There is no dishwasher in that boathouse. That is delightful to hear, Mr. Oshorn. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, okay, so I am going to chime in with my two cents worth and I, I cannot support this application. 200 feet to 300 feet is a 33% reduction in what our bylaws are. And it's unfortunate the boathouse was put right in the middle, but that was the owner who chose to do that. So it seems to me that, that if you took the property line to just the other side of the boathouse, you'd probably still be able to, to um, you'd still have a fair amount of frontage on the remaining property. The problem would be, of course, that the boathouse now belongs to another property, but just based on a 33% variance, I cannot do that. And I, I don't wanna use the road allowance as a reason to do that. I don't wanna set up that precedent. So I'm just coming forward with my thoughts on that. So nobody else has any comments. I am going to read the motion. Moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Jaglowitz, be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council the consent application B slash 142 slash 21 slash ML or Shorn be approved subject to the following conditions that a registrable description of the severed lot and any required rights of way be submitted to the Secretary Treasurer along with a registered copy of the reference plan. The cash in lieu of parkland be de dedicated to the township in the amount of 5% of the assessed value of the newly created vacant lot or the entire subject lands, whichever is less. Um, that a consent agreement be entered into in um, with the township under section 5126 of the Planning Act, wherein the owner of the severed lot agrees to implement the recommendations of the species at risk assessment dated April, 2022, and a fish habitat and deer wintering assessment dated October, 2021, prepared by Fry Ecological Services, and that exemptions from the Township's Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 2014-14 be approved to recognize the proposed lot coverage and area of the severed and retained lots, impose an increased side yard setback for shoreline structures on the severed lot, permit an existing dock on the retained lot to be 14 feet from the easterly side lot line projection, 
from an existing two-story boathouse on the retained lot to be 15 feet from the easterly side of lot line projection and impose an increased minimum front yard setback of 80 feet on the severed lot. All right, Ms. Um, Councillor Jaglowitz. Yes, I just wanted to indicate that I, I too will not be supporting this for the reasons that you stated, Chair. I agree with your logic uh, completely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, no more discussion. All right, I'm going to call the motion. Those in favor? Uh, and thank you, Mayor Harding. All opposed? Okay, that motion is denied, which means I'm not reading the second motion of this. Oh, I do want to read it? Sorry? Oh, the same outcome. Sorry. Um, all right. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Mayor Harding. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommends to Township Council that Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA-73-21 or Shern Roll Number 4-12-034-02 be approved, subject to a minor amendment requiring a minimum front yard setback of 80 feet on the severed lot. Any discussion? All in favor? You have that? Yeah. All opposed? Okay, then that is defeated. Okay, thank you everyone. We are now going to move on to, I believe it's the Quinn application, which is up next. And I'm trying to see who's who has that. Oh, Mr. Sawyer, there you are. Welcome, Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Good morning, members of the committee. The next application to be heard is ZBA 0322 in the name of Quinn. Subject property is known municipally as 1218 Hamels Point Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted sketches starting on page 164 of today's agenda package. Uh, the subject property has a lot area approximately one acre with a straight line frontage of 236 feet on Lake Joseph and is developed for waterfront residential purposes. Uh, to provide a bit of background to this application, last year the applicant submitted a minor variance application that was quite similar to today's zoning bylaw amendment application. Its purpose was to request relief from the maximum lot coverage provision of the zoning bylaw to facilitate the construction of a proposed garage. Uh, the minor variance was approved to permit a maximum of 11% lot coverage, but is conditional upon the removal of an as-built sun deck and an associated hot tub, as, as well as a reduction in the size of a shoreline patio. Uh, these recommendations were um, recommended as th these structures do not comply with uh, front yard setback requirements. Uh, the reduction in the size of the shoreline patio was recommended because its size was increased compared to a previously existing patio along the shoreline. Uh, the owner has now decided to proceed by way of a zoning bylaw amendment to request relief from lot coverage and front yard setback requirements. Uh, therefore, the purpose and effect of the application before you today is twofold. Uh, number one, to provide relief from the maximum permitted lot coverage provision in order to permit the construction of a 780 square foot two-story garage. Uh, on Lake Joseph, the maximum permitted lot coverage is 10%. The existing development represents a lot coverage of 8.8% within 200 feet of the high water mark, and the addition of the proposed garage would increase lot coverage to 11%. Uh, the, uh, it is also the purpose of the bylaw to provide an exemption from the minimum front yard setback for a sun deck. New sun decks are required to be set back 50 feet from the high water mark. However, in this case, an as-built sun deck um, with an associated hot tub has been constructed 27 feet from the high water mark. A uh, notice of this public meeting was circulated 20 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act and four submissions have been received to date, all of which have been forwarded to committee for review in advance of today's meeting. Uh, Patricia, Patricia Volker, the owner of a property on the opposite shoreline to the south at 1130 Hamels Point Road, Unit 2, has advised that she does not have any concerns and submissions from the Township's Development Services Division, from the Public Works Department, and from the District of Muskoka all advise that they do not have any concerns. Uh, staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. 
Staff have recommended that the zoning bylaw amendment application be approved, provided that two actions are taken. Uh, number one, that uh, um, involves the removal of two prefabricated storage shelters and removal of the waterfront patio prior to third reading. And uh, so these um, two prefabricated storage shelters are located in the parking area to the rear of the dwelling. The applicant has explained that they are intended to provide temporary sheltered parking until the proposed garage has been constructed. Um, these shelters are not shown on the site plan and their footprint size has not been provided. Um, given that they do contribute to lot coverage and may result in the maximum lot coverage being surpassed, staff have recommended that they be removed. Uh, staff have also recommended removal of the enlarged waterfront stone patio. Um, its removal would provide an opportunity to mitigate the impacts, the sun deck and associated hot tub. It's the intention of staff to require the revegetation of uh, this area, um, including the, the gap in front of the, um, the dwelling through the planting of several additional conifers in the location and including in the location of this uh, store um, shoreline patio through the site plan control process. Staff have also recommended that the proposed development be made subject to site plan control. Um, as mentioned, it would be used to revegetate the gap in the shoreline buffer and to require additional, um, and also to require appropriate discharge of, or to address appropriate discharge of wastewater from the hot tub. Uh, lastly, please note that the draft bylaw does contain an exemption that is not required. Uh, it pertains to the front yard setback for a hot tub. Um, in this case, uh, since a sun deck can include a hot tub by definition, uh, an exemption is only required for the sun deck. Therefore, um, although it is a technical revision, staff would recommend that today's resolution be um, revised to remove, um, to require the removal, or to remove the unnecessary provision through a minor amendment to the bylaw. And I have no further comments at this time, but would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soy. I I think Mr. Zerbach is the agent, so we'll get him in. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of committee. My name is Stefan Sherbach with Planscape, 104 Kimberley Avenue in Bracebridge. Madam Chair, I'm here today to speak on behalf of the Quinn family. I understand that they're observing uh, these proceedings. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you again to Mr. Soya and the other planning staff for their guidance and assistance with this application, together with the thorough planning analysis contained in the staff report. We agree with their review, specifically for the subject request for increased lot coverage and a reduction to the shoreline yard setback to recognize this existing sun deck. We agree with the minor amendment um, that staff are also proposing, as well as the condition to remove the temporary um, structures. Uh, our policy review is similar to one in front of you, and of course it's detailed in the planning justification report. Uh, Mr. Soy is correct uh, to provide a bit of context. We were involved with the previous application to rebuild the dwelling and we were retained only after the uh, minor variance request. At that time, the owners felt that the committee um, did not give them an opportunity to describe the issues with the patio, the open deck at, or the hot tub, um, nor did they have an opportunity to defer um, uh, the attempt to address that condition uh, that was specifically in place for the um, shoreline patio. Um, what's particularly re relevant, and again, as uh, Mr. Soya had mentioned, was staff's recommendation at that time to reduce the size of the waterfront patio and not remove it altogether. Um, this approved condition posed a problem, and we did discuss uh, the appropriate channels with staff, and here we are with the zoning bylaw amendment and um, uh, wanting committee to review this collective request. Again, we agree with staff's uh, opinions related to the matters at hand, being the lot coverage and the reduced setback to the open deck. However, the removal of the shoreline patio altogether, in my opinion, is unreasonable. There was a former patio there that was wet laid with concrete mortar and as such, it was not permeable. There was a large 
old stone fireplace on the side of the patio, and this structure was constructed right up to the former dilapidated shoreline wall. The size at the time, as I understand, was approximately 145 square feet. We would respectfully request the committee delete this recommendation and maintain the structure, or at the very least, follow staff's initial opinion to reduce it in size than what previously existed adjacent to the shoreline wall. Our request is based on the following four reasons. Number one, the patio is not part of this request in front of the committee today. Number two, the matter was already reviewed by the bylaw department and in order to remedy was issued for the shoreline works. If this posed a problem from a bylaw perspective, in my mind, it should have been tied together with this order and not left for a future planning process. Uh, in my opinion, a violation is a violation, and I don't, do not believe that the shoreline patio is requesting any variations at this time. The third point is that an ecologist was retained to assess the shoreline works when the order was issued, and it was their professional opinion that there be a break or a space between the wall and the, and the patio to ensure plantings would be uh, in place between these two built form structures. Uh, and in the staff report, there is a note, and I agree with staff, and I quote, staff acknowledge that the as-built sun deck and waterfront patio on their own do not contribute significantly to built form owing to their low profile. They do occupy locations of the ground and could otherwise be revegetated re for an increase in natural form. Madam Chair, is it possible to just share my screen to show a few um, photographs of the current property? Uh, you, if you can quickly send those to us, we could. Oh, and there's Elizabeth. She's good. Thank you, oh, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just wanted to, to scroll. Yeah, so, so the photograph on the bottom is showing the existing situation. Um, and it's the, the red area is showing the location of the former patio. You can see the break between the wall and the patio. The slot, and in addition, you can see the extensive shoreline vegetation that's buffering the dwelling itself. The next photograph below, please. Um, this is showing an overlying overhead view. Again, note the extensive shoreline vegetation that provides uh, a, a buffer uh, to this structure. And there are some new uh, plantings down below that have been in place for a few years. Clearly, they need to be matured, and that will provide additional buffering. And the final slide down below is just showing the extensive shoreline vegetation looking from the patio towards the boathouse. Thank you for that. And I'm almost uh, just finished finishing up my presentation, Madam Chair. Um, in conclusion, the application in front of you is to consider uh, a, a increase in lot coverage to permit a garage. The garage itself cannot be seen when viewing the property from the water. There's a minor reduction to the shoreline yard setback for the um, a sun deck attached to the dwelling. And again, these structures do not contribute to the built form, uh, specifically the sun deck, do not contribute to the built form on their own due to their low profile, and simply because of the extensive shoreline vegetation and the revegetation that was completed as part of this dwelling rebuild. To rip up an illegally existing patio along the shoreline that contributes to a very small opening along the shoreline, in my opinion, is unreasonable. Please consider uh, our request. And again, if council wishes to meet the applicant halfway, the owner is willing to reduce the size of the patio than what previously existed, but not necessarily in the same footprint. Um, and somehow squeeze in uh, some additional uh, plantings wherever possible. In con again, um, it's my opinion that the application fully conforms to the direction of your official plan, and we would respectfully request the approval application, approval of this application based only on those matters at hand. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Zerbach. Uh, Elizabeth, anybody else to speak on behalf? No? Anyone? Against? No. no. All right. I'm going to turn this over to committee then. Committee, any comments? Councillor Jaglowitz. No, thank you, Chair. I have a couple of questions for staff. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, what's called the sun deck and hot tub. It's 27 feet from the water. I wonder if staff could explain how that... Uh, how that got approved, if it did, and was a building permit issued for that, or is it grandfathered, or how does it? How did that get there, uh, and why is it there now? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sawyer. Oh, Mr. Sharp. 
Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and thank you for your question, uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. As uh, committee is aware, there was a minor variance application submitted uh, to um, permit a, a proposed two-story garage uh, exceeding the maximum lot coverage requirement within 200 feet from the high water mark. Um, it was adjourned uh, due to some considerations related to servicing that were eventually resolved, and it was brought back as an amended application to the Committee of Adjustment. Um, and staff undertook a second site visit. And, you know, it was, I guess it was three quarters of the way through that process uh, when that site visit occurred. And during that site visit, um, the, the sun deck and the, the patio. Um, uh, were, were observed on the property and there was an ongoing enforcement matter related to the retaining wall um, that was occurring in conjunction with the minor variance application at that time and no relief was re was sought for the uh, for the, the sun deck that was located in the front yard and observed by staff at that time so our recommendation um, to the committee if they were to approve that minor variance application was to remove the hot tub and the sun deck and reduce the size of the shoreline uh, patio. Um, you know, as, as we know now, the, the, the applicant's agent has opted to uh, submit a, a zoning bylaw amendment application to recognize uh, the setback of, of the sun deck. Um, and staff are now recommending um, essentially the inverse of what uh, had previously been recommended, that the shoreline patio uh, adjacent to the, the, the waterfront be um, removed and that that area be revegetated if uh, committee is supportive of the proposal to keep the, uh, the larger sun deck uh, containing the, the hot tub. And, and we think this is uh, you know, a reasonable um, recommendation. Uh, um, I would see this as, as you know, a reasonable, you know, meeting the, the applicant halfway, so to speak, as, as Mr. Sherback would put it. I see Mr. Pink has, uh, has his screen on and may wish to elaborate if, if needed. Um, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Pink. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Mr. Pink? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just in response to Councillor Jagot's question, I, I don't believe the sun deck slash hot tub has been approved. Um, a building permit is not required uh, for that work. The owner uh, installed that work, staffs of the opinion it does not comply with the zoning bylaw and hence they have an application before uh, planning committee council uh, to approve of said structure. So uh, to directly respond to your question, um, those uh, uh, structures were not approved and the application is before you. So, quick supplementary. So so if I, as I understand it then you're um, your halfway measure is uh, because it would be easier to remove the patio by the water, it would be less destructive, I guess, that you're recommending that as a way to try to solve the problem and uh, the applicant is resisting that. Is, is that like a fair summary of where we are today? And maybe I should just back up a bit. I was just surprised that you recommended that that hot tub and deck remain there. That, But you've explained it that this was kind of your compromise. Have I, have I characterized that right? Or? Mr. Pink? I'll let uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Sawyer and Mr. Sheriff expand further on their recommendation, but I don't believe uh, I would categorize it as a, as a compromise entirely. I think uh, we looked at the property. It is a quite well vegetated property as Mr. Sherback's photos have indicated. Um, I think removing the patio uh, along the water uh, would reestablish a, a quite uh, satisfactory shoreline buffer. Uh, sun decks in front of the cottage uh, are obviously not um, out of the norm in Muskoka. Uh, there was existing development in front of this cottage previously. Uh, the sun deck uh, patio area with hot tub, um, as I said, is maintaining essentially the building line of the existing elevated wooden sun deck on the property. Uh, to a large extent and staff are comfortable uh, with uh, with retaining it there but feels the patio uh, down by the water should be removed to revegetate that portion so if they if they did not want to remove the patio by the water can i assume then you would not be supporting the uh, uh sun deck remaining would that be fair then i'm, I'm trying to understand if uh, 
if uh, they're asking for both to remain. And if I, I assume your recommendation is that uh, if the patio is removed, you're okay. But if it's not removed, I assume you're not okay. Would that be, you'd be recommending we turn it down if they don't want to remove the patio. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Mr. Pink? I think uh, that largely uh, summarizes it. We, uh, we feel the front patio needs to be uh, removed. I think, uh, again, the, the patios are, again, sun decks in the front yard are typically expected uh, in front of cottages. Uh, but the level or amount in this case, I think uh, staff feels warrants the removal of the patio that's been constructed directly at the water's edge. Thank you. Okay, Councillor uh, Zabitz. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, I, I know that we're talking in a uh, Stefan of Landscape uh, mentioned uh, we should be viewing this in a very narrow sphere of just what is in front of us. But it, to me, this is a, actually indicative of a larger challenge on this property. And <laughs> I will not be in support of this. And in fact, I'm not in support of a, a beautifully built wall right in the water. I'm not in support of uh, many of the things that I see on this property, this small little buffer between a, a, a st beautiful, expensive stone deck and that same wall. Uh, I think a number of things uh, indicate to me that um, uh, this file is ongoing. If we had, if every one of our constituents uh, came to us this often, we would never get our work done. So I'm not going to support this, and I hope that some of the others won't either. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just looking at page 153, figure 13 of the old hot tub, and it was removed as a requirement, okay? And then if you look at uh, the next figure, which is uh, 14, that was the, the shoreline patio compared to what we have now. I can't support it unless it's, that patio is definitely removed. Um, we have a 66 foot setback for, for hot tubs now, but there's a loophole because if you just build them in your, your, your deck, it's allowed. So we've got to look at this uh, in, in the future and just say, are we going to go 66 feet or are, are, are we just going to forget it and put them wherever you want? We're, we've talked about environment and that. I don't like the stone wall, but I can live with it if we have to. But I wouldn't be supporting this unless the stone patio was removed. Thank you. Mayor Harden. Uh, thank you. Through you to staff, I'm trying to understand the difference between a deck and a patio. Um, and I'm also trying to understand a little bit of, you know, where we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, hardscape on a property and we're contemplating, still not in place right now, but at 25% potential hardscape on properties. So I, I, I realize we have, I think it's a 50 foot setback for sun decks. Um, there's this patio, I think Mr. Pink just mentioned that was in front of the old cottage as a sun deck it's now been lowered does it still remain a deck or now that it's built on the ground is it a patio do we have different rules for patios um and i'm i'm just trying to fully understand again when does a deck become a patio and as far as the other <clears throat> front waterfront deck there's no or which is now a fire but there's no question that used to exist um, do we have, do we ever have a, um, an application where they came before us asking for that to be removed? Um, and I'm wondering if it should have been removed and it wasn't removed. So just help me understand deck to patio and what was there and what was asked to be removed and what wasn't asked to be removed. I'm not sure who can answer that. Sorry, Mayor Harding. Can I just get clarification from you? Are you talking about the patio at the shoreline and the one up top? I'm, I'm just a little unclear. So the patio at the shoreline, which I believe is now a fire pit, was that ever asked or contemplated to be removed in a prior application? Or is that now the first time it's being asked to be removed? Regarding the, what looks to me to be a patio, a patio deck, a decking, whatever it is, it, it's not an elevated, what I would call a sun deck in front of a cottage. Um, how, we refer to it as a deck. Do we have a difference? If I don't have a deck in front of my cottage, but I was to landscape all the way forward because we don't have a hardscape buffer, when does that change to become a deck or a patio? 
And hopefully Mr. Sharp understands those questions. No, I don't. I'm clearer on it. Anyway, Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and thank you, Mayor Harding. I, I think I understand the questions. Um, the answers are, are perhaps uh, um, not as straightforward, but um, just to explain, so the township's site alteration bylaw prohibits the placement of fill within 50 feet from the high watermark and the waterfront designation. So I just wanted to, to clarify that point and provide a bit of context. So that activity is prohibited within uh, 50, 50 feet unless it's otherwise exempted. Uh, the sun deck, or in this case, the sun deck is, is located within 50 feet from the high water mark. Township's zoning bylaw um, contains a definition of structure, which I would say is open to some interpretation. And I would just uh, turn to uh, figure 10 on page 150 of your agenda package. Um, Sam's taken a, a great photo of, of what we're referring to and considering a, a sun deck um, in figure 10. Um, and you know the, the definition of structure says, it, it, it says shall mean anything that is built, constructed, or erected of parts joined together, requiring a foundation to hold erect, hold erect the use of which requires location on the ground. Um, so I think in this context, staff are considering this a structure and we're referring to it as a sun deck, which I believe is the, uh, the intended use and would be in line with uh, the, the zoning bylaw definition of a sun deck as well. Um, and I, I, I missed the second part of uh, your, oh yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Um, I'm remembering now. So the, the question about whether we required the shoreline patio uh, that had formerly existed to be removed, the answer is no. But as part of the uh, previous zoning bylaw amendment application that was approved, even prior to the recent minor variance, um, it was in related relation to a sun deck, uh, front yard setback extending off the dwelling. Um, the sun deck and the, the uh, hot tub that were located in the front yard area were required to uh, be removed. So hopefully that helps clarify. Uh, follow up, Mayor Harding. <laughs> yes, please. Just had to find my unmute button. Um, can you sorry define? I'm I'm still struggling with a structure because I believe every patio stone that is ever laid in a front deck has some form of a base and gravel for drainage, or whatever. And I'm just I'm trying to understand the clarity on structure. I, I certainly get a deck structure that has a foundation poured and is bolted. Let me say to that structure. Um, it looks like the corner of figure 10, there's a pole there. Um, and, and more just as we go forward here, I, 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 if I was to walk on this property or another property, I would call this a patio. I'm not sure I would call it a sun deck. So help me understand what we define as a sun deck or a structure. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, uh, Mayor Harding. I mean, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, I get I get the point. Like it's it's somewhat open to uh, some interpretation. Um, I think in this, like I said, in this particular instance, I think given the context of of what we're dealing with and the the specifics of the uh, uh, the patio or the sun deck, uh, it, it is we would consider it to be a structure requiring relief uh, from the the township's um, zoning bylaw. I see that Mr. Pink has his screen on. He may wish to uh, elaborate and perhaps is uh, um, thinking of something that I'm not at this specific time, but uh, Mr. Pink, if you'd like to elaborate, um, feel free to do so. <laughs> Good. Mr. Pink. Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure if I can help the discussion or put it in a different way. I think uh, what Mr. Sharp's trying to say is there's certainly um, a gray area there. There's some discretion. I, I see your point, uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, your Worship, you're correct. Um, alternatively, this could have been dealt with as a site alteration complaint slash issue entirely. Site alteration permit applied for, and we could have considered this a patio. I think staff's review of it, as uh, uh, Mr. Sharp pointed out, looking at the picture, I think it can also be argued it does meet the definition of structure and sun deck in our zoning bylaw. And uh, currently, the zoning bylaw and the site alteration tree bylaw works quite well together. Um, in that, uh, uh, you know, uh, typically we consider the landscaping work to be dealt with under the site alteration and tree, 
and actual buildings um, that require building permits, uh, obviously under the under the zoning bylaw. Uh, but in this case, we felt uh, it was substantial enough. The applicants uh, you know, did not want to meet the condition of the Committee of Adjustment, and they opted to make an application to uh, permit this uh, uh, structure under the zoning bylaw, and that's the application before you. But admittedly, it could have been dealt with uh, um, through alternative processes. Thank you, Mr. Pink. I just a uh, little clarification on the patio at the shoreline. My understanding is it had been enlarged without any approval somewhere along the way. Could I please get clarification on that? Through you, Chair Bridgman. And yes, uh, my understanding based on uh, feedback we received from Mr. Sherback is that the, uh, the patio has been enlarged over what previously existed. Um, my understanding it's by about 30 square feet. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Uh, Councillor Kelly. <clears throat> Thank you, and through you, uh, I, I want to um, I want to make sure that I uh, make a voting decision based on the right set of facts, and I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure that I understand. Um, under the background in 2017, uh, there was a, a, a bylaw granted to the same name. So I assume there's consistent ownership. We don't have a new owner here. And it allowed a raised sun deck, but stipulated that an existing deck and a hot tub needed to be removed. Is that, is that correct? And in fact, I believe from what I'm reading here, that that deck and that hot tub were removed. That is correct. Yep, there was a, a sun deck that was proposed. It's now being built. It extends off the front of the dwelling. It's elevated above the ground. And as, as part of that, council required the hot tub and the sun deck to be removed, which has occurred. And, and the reason that that hot tub had to be removed was because of its proximity to the waterfront. It was inside the uh, front yard setback or, or why was it Mr. Sharp, Mr. Soya. I would perhaps look to, to Mr. Soya to, uh, to provide an answer in that regard. I uh, guess through you, Madam Chair. Um, the removal of that structure was required. Um, it, was not, it was not a recommendation of staff at the time. I believe it was a discussion that was had um, before, prior to the approval, uh, looking at the um, to, to mitigate the impacts of uh, um, what was proposed at the time, which was a reduced front yard setback for that raised sun deck, which has now been built. And uh, the applicant at the time um, agreed to its removal and therefore it was added to the approval um, when it was uh, before um, committee at the time. And, and so subsequent to that, when we are back doing a site visit on another matter, we discover in fact that there is a hot tub that has been uh, built to replace the one that we ordered removed. Is that correct? Mr. Sawyer? Uh, that is correct, yeah. Yeah, and if I, if I might just um, add a little bit of context, I, since I'm the one that has been uh, visiting this, this property, um, it's a uh, it's a bit of a um, there's several things to weigh here and and one of the one of the factors is that uh, the majority of this shoreline is very well vegetated um, and through the redevelopment uh, most of that has has been retained um, the the uh, issues are that the dwelling itself um, was rebuilt at uh, the setback to the former dwelling and uh, therefore encroaches into the, the 50 foot um, buffer that's typically required. Um, and then uh, there is also the, the raised sun deck as well, but that was, that, that which was permitted. Um, and, uh, but there is an opportunity for revegetation in front of that, um, directly in front of um, a portion of the dwelling. And that area, um, like I said, the, the dwelling's only 42 feet away from the, from the shoreline. And um, it's also quite steep in that area. And uh, so for, for 
um, in terms of protecting water quality and in terms of just impact of built form of um, this, the new dwelling and, um, and, uh, and there also being a two-story boathouse, um, staff feel that there, there really is an opportunity to add additional plantings. The applicant has also planted um, in this area However, a lot of those plantings are just um, ground cover um, plants that uh, don't do much for um, mitigating the impact of the built form. And this is where um, staff have felt that there's real opportunity to, um, and, uh, to, to revegetate. And as I've pointed out in the report and have Stefan today also mentioned that the hot tub itself and the sun deck don't add uh, dramatically to built form in the front yard. Um, however, given that there is this gap, there really is an opportunity to, um, to revegetate and, um, and this other um, patio at the shoreline uh, its removal would provide for additional space for some significant replanting in that area. So that that's that's the way that um, that we've we've come at this, seeing this as an opportunity to do that through the removal of that patio. Hopefully, that provides a little bit of context. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Are you? I think I'm. I think that's all my questions. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, and through you. Um, something that Councillor Edwards brought up, uh, hot tubs must be 66 foot back from the waterfront unless they are on a sun deck. Um, I've never heard of a, a stone sun deck. I've heard of a stone patio, but never a stone sun deck. So I'm viewing what's in front of the, the cottage there as a patio. So are hot tubs allowed in patios that close to the waterfront? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe this question goes back to, um, similar to the question that uh, uh, um, the mayor had earlier, and it is uh, related to the definition of a sun deck. And uh, the sun deck definition in the bylaw states, shall mean a non-roof structure designed for lounging or sunbathing and can include a hot tub. Uh, and so I think there's, um, as has been mentioned, um, it's a little, it's not uh, black and white exactly um, what structures may be considered to be a sun deck and which would not. Um, I know that the township has often um, uh, interpreted this to not mean every stone that's put on the ground and um, especially Muskoka, where we have a lot of rock outcrops, we have a lot of um, places where um, you might be adding, a few, putting a few rocks together to create a stone patio. Uh, in this instance, um, as is shown in the photos, it uh, um, was interpreted to that what has been built is a structure and therefore would be considered a sun deck. Um, hopefully that kind of explains where, where staff are coming from with, uh, with suggesting that this, it should be interpreted as a sun deck. Thank you. Um, and, sorry. So and just go ahead, just to ahead. add to that. Um, and the def, the definition specifically states that a hot tub can be part of the sun deck. So that's, that's, uh, that's where we're at with that. Thank you. Okay. So I am going to suggest we take a comfort break now because, uh, well, no, Councillor Nishikawa, you would be first up afterwards. I'm only suggesting. Everybody prefer to carry on or do we want a comfort break at this point? We're carrying on, I guess. Councillor Nishikawa? Thank you. I um, I think I, I'm, I'm just listening trying very hard to decipher some of the conversations because it's certainly not part of the conversations that when we did 1414 and I understand 
that many of our staff were not present uh, during that time. Um, but the hot tub was the issue. Uh, we did not want hot tubs that close to the shore. Um, it's all the chemicals running off and especially on this particular slope. Um, so whether we're gonna get ourselves all tangled up about a hot tub and a deck, a decking or patio, that was not, I, I wanna separate the two. We did not want uh, hot tubs that close to the shore. And that's what I'm looking at right now. Um, and I, I'm hearing so many different ways of, of people trying to say, but yet we can allow a hot tub. No, we don't want hot tubs that close to the shore. And certainly with a slope like that, and knowing that a hot tub has to be filled to the brim for it to function properly. And as soon as, you know, and then the spillover and everything else, that's, that's what we talked about. And I, and I, I'm, I'm, it's just kind of sad to me to hear um, us trying to manipulate what we put in place with 1414. Thank you. Mayor Harding. Thank you, sir. Just a final comment. Um, you know, I, I agree with Councillor Shikawa. The hot tub was the issue originally. Um, I think the hot tub now is in a location further back from the water, which is certainly a net benefit. Um, and uh, that that is good. I'm struggling still with whether this is a patio or a deck. Because, so number one, the other thing I heard is we've got a 15-foot build envelope. And this patio doesn't seem to be more than 15 feet from the shore so I'm, or from the building. So is it actually still within the build envelope or not? I think we have caused ourselves an issue though, because if this was a patio, we don't allow a hot tub on the patio, but our staff are calling this a sun deck, which we allow a patio. So we've somewhat shot ourselves in the foot in this whole particular issue and trying to find a path forward. Um, I, I guess I would agree with staff's recommendation that if we have to remove some waterfront hardscape, and I'll just call it that, the patio down by the water, um, you know, that let's move forward with that. Or is there a, you know, sort of a hybrid version that we return that waterfront patio to its original size, shrink it back down to what was there before. There is a greater, there is a, looks like a one foot buffer of trees and patio and plantings between the waterfront patio and the rock wall to do some buffering of water but um you know I'm, I'm i'm still struggling with patio sun deck what's allowed on a patio what's allowed on a sun deck and a hot tub with this whole application so i, I think you know a reduction in the patio in the front would be the sorry waterfront patio would be my first i can also live with if we had to remove it completely um but to me it still really is a patio and we're going to play both sides of the coin, whether the hot tub can go on the patio or the sun deck. So that's my confusion as we go forward. And I leave that confusion in your hands, Madam Chair, to determine how we vote or what we put on the table. Well, to that point, if I could, Councillor Zavitz, because you have spoken before, I my I can't support this application. And the only way I could support this application is that the obviously the storage shelters be removed. I can support 11% coverage, but that garage has to stipulate that there's no washrooms on the second floor. And the patio by the shoreline has to be reduced to what it was. And the deck or whatever you wanna call it with a hot tub has to be removed. And that is where I am sitting on this. So I just, um, I don't know if anybody else is interested in any of that, but I want you to know that that's where, that's where I've landed on this. So any other comments? All right, so I guess, and you're right, I'm going to try and, and get this going, uh, Mayor Harding. I think the first question that I need to find out is, are we going to allow that hot tub patio area to stay? Are we going to uh, approve um, the, the variance on that? So can I get some sort of a read on that? I'm reading no. Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, straw poles are, are, are tricky. Um, um, 
I, I would I would say no if it's just on its own, but I would give some consideration to staff's recommendation that it that if the other one is completely removed. So I, it, it, it's difficult, Chair. I, uh, um, I, I, I'm gonna just, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know what to say. I don't know how you're, you're gonna do this. So I'll, I'm just saying my answer is that I, I could live with it under certain circumstances, but if the patio at the, at, by the water is not removed, I cannot live with it, period. Thank you. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to break this down so that it's not just a clear yes, no on what we've got in front of us, because we may be able to accommodate some of this. Um, Councillor Hayes. Thank you. If the patio down by the water is removed, um, I have no problem with part of the patio area remaining up by the house, but the hot tub I have an issue with, it has to go. Okay, that would be variation four, I think. <laughs> so, oh dear. Okay, so um, I'm going to, Councillor Edwards. Uh, you know, maybe uh, because it's so, so confusing, we should actually defer this and let them uh, talk to staff because we, we told them we don't want the hot tub, we don't want the patio. We can go with, with what was, was there and that, that before and defer it rather than turning it down flatly because I think that's what's going to happen. Thank you. Good suggestion. So um, I think we need to give staff some sort of guidance on this though. So I, I think we're looking at a deferral here um, in terms of the, in terms of the Okay, Mayor Harding. Um, thank you. And uh, I mean, I'm happy to have a deferral. Um, hopefully the uh, applicant is the same. I, I guess the question is, if we were to vote on staff's recommendation right now, either accept it or reject it, do we allow 30 days when it comes to council to maybe modify, add additional um, minor variance conditions to this? Staff have, staff have recommended that they could allow the patio, sorry, the sun deck, as they call it, next to the cottage, which they're calling it, which would allow for the hot tub to be there. And they're saying our bylaws do that because that is what exists. They've requested the waterfront patio be removed and the garage shelters um, and site plan control. So, you know, we can say yes or no to what staff have recommended and then maybe make additional recommendations when it comes to council might be the path forward because I'm not sure we can give staff clear direction today, to be honest. That's true. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I support the garage. Um, yay, I support the garage, but the, the hot tub has to go. Uh, period for me, and, um, and and our intentions were very very clear. I mean, it, our intentions were very clear about hot tubs in in uh, that close to the shore. So I don't know why or how our language is not clear, but I sure hope that we can work on that because again, this was very well debated uh, during the last official plan for or excuse me the for 1414 and um, I don't know how things got so muddled, but the garage were good, thanks. I see Director Pink would like to speak. Uh, thank you, Chair. Hopefully this helps clarify or move it along. Um, just to clarify the, the rules, uh, Mr. Stoya did read the definition of a sun deck. Uh, council did pass the zoning bylaw and it clearly states that a hot tub is permitted on a sun deck. Um, now with that said, uh, I'm sensing a majority of committee has concerns with the hot tub as much as um, if the sun deck is approved, it would allow it. You do have a bylaw in front of you. You do have a request for the hot tub. You could uh, stipulate, uh, indicate in uh, that approval that a hot tub is not allowed on the sun deck if that is uh, the concern. I do wanna point out though, I think my recollection of those discussions during 2014-14 uh, 
uh, the principal concern is not a visual impact. I don't think many would argue hot tubs uh, really contribute significantly to built form. It's more of a concern about proper disposal of uh, wastewater. And uh, for committee's uh, information, what staff has been doing with uh, typically in site plan agreements for hot tubs located in the front yard is including a wastewater disposal plan that uh, binds the owner to properly dispose of the wastewater. We've worked with uh, um, building staff uh, and come up with a, uh, a brief guide uh, looking at other municipalities and have attached those to a few agreements. So that certainly is an option here. Uh, if that resolves the concerns, if committee still wishes to prohibit the hot tub, again, the bylaw could be worded such that the sun deck is permitted, uh, but no hot tub. Um, so again, sorry for providing more options, but that, uh, um, that may address that concern. Okay. All right. So let me, let me start with that one then. Do we have a majority who are willing to leave the sun deck without the hot tub? if the patio down below was removed. So the patio down below is completely removed. We have revegetation that are real trees as opposed to ground cover. Um, and then the hot tub has to be moved. So I think I've got, I think we've got some agreement on that. It was close. Yeah, see, everything's close. I would prefer a deferral. To be honest with you, I would prefer a deferral. This is the, the heavy work is supposed to be done here, not at council. And I just think that we need to uh, have more time and we need to have our staff come back with defined, maybe defined choices that we vote on individually. I'm not, I'm not quite sure yet. How? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. So, um, uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, yeah, Chair, I think it would be helpful if the uh, applicant would, uh, it, they've listened to us and their consultants have, maybe they can come up, uh, come back to us with something that would meet, you know, most of us, the majority of us. And I think that'd be, that'd be a simpler way. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to now officially ask, are we deferring this application committee? Madam Clerk? Yeah. All right. All right, we are going to defer this application and hopefully our staff can work with the applicant and come back with something that, that uh, we can um, get some clear, give some clear direction on afterwards. So now I'm going to call a 10 minute, um, a 10 minute break. So it's 10 40, 42. Let's come back at 5 to 11. And we'll see you then.
Okay, can I get everybody back, please? Four, five, six, seven. Technically. Okay, so I think we'll get started then. Elizabeth, are we good? You're good. Good to go? Okay, great. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are now on to application with the name Bot and Miss Darling. I think it's you who are up. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Next application to be heard is zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 04 slash 22, bylaw 2022-024 in the name of BOT. The, the lands are known municipally as 1209 Breezy Point Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan and drawings on page 206 to 213 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. The zoning bylaw amendment application has been submitted to construct a two-story boathouse and an associated dock on a lot with 236.4 feet of frontage. An exemption is required to permit a two-story boathouse on a lot with less than 300 feet of frontage on a category one lake. Another exemption is required to permit a second story width to be 36 feet when 13 or 30 feet is permitted. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 20 days in advance and nine submissions have been received to date. Comments were received from Tim Sopko, Township Public Works Technician, Nick Snyder, Chief Building Official, Curtis Sivret, the District Planner, and northerly adjacent neighbors, Barbara Craig, Elizabeth Craig Olins, Elliot Taylor, Margaret Craig, and Stephen Fawner on the Craig's family behalf. Paul Edmund, an area neighbor, also submitted comments and these comments were submitted, uh, were forwarded to planning committee prior to the meeting today. Um, since comments were sent to planning committee, one extra letter was received and it was a second letter um, from Elizabeth Craig Olins. And in summary, she was under the understand, she just wanted to let, let committee know that she was under the understanding that any boathouse and dock would be on the south side of the point from previous ownership. I can read that letter in full if committee wishes. I have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. Staff have no concerns with the application subject to the development being made subject to site plan control. The resolution has been worded for a site plan control bylaw to be brought in conjunction with this application to the June meeting to the June Council meeting if planning committee recommends approval. Staff have no further comments at this time and would be happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Darling. All right, I think Mr. Lenny is the agent. Who will have come in now? It'll be um, she, she works with him, so Ms. Gibbs. All right, thank you. Welcome, Ms. Gibbs. Good morning. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chair. Okay, please go ahead. My name is Lisa Gibbs from the Permit Guide 35 Covered Bridge Trail in Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1Y1. I'm here this morning on behalf of the owners, Stephanie and Bill, and their proposal to build a two-story boathouse on a property that has less than 300 feet of straight line frontage. Stephanie and Bill's property is just over 212,000 square feet with 492 feet of shoreline. The shoreline area is predominantly bedrock with areas of dense mature trees to the north and a mix of natural and manicured landscaping as well as hardscaping features on the south shore. Although 492 feet is well above the frontage requirements for two-story boathouse, a beautiful and unique peninsula that extends into Lake Muskoka makes the front line, front line frontage, sorry, straight line frontage, my problem, uh, only 236 feet. 
The boathouse that we're proposing is going to have two boat slips and 648 square feet of entertaining space on the second floor. The dock in the boathouse will be located on the north shoreline with side yard setbacks of 37.5 and 45 feet respectively. The neighbors to the north have an existing dock. This is located approximately 125 feet to the northeast of our proposed boathouse. The three properties to the south each have boathouses and all are located in excess of 450 feet from the proposed boathouse location. With the boat slips facing due west and directly into Lake Muskoka and the boathouse placed near the tip of the peninsula, the proposed boathouse and its associated boat traffic will have no impact on the current use of the neighboring docks or the boathouses as there is no need for the traffic to enter into the small bays to the north or to the south of the property. Aesthetically, the boathouse and the second floor above have been designed to match the clean lines and the modern design of the existing cottage. The placement of the boathouse has been selected in order to keep it as close to the existing cottage as possible. We feel that this reduces the overall visual width of these two structures and keeps the boathouse as far out of the sight lines as the neighbors as possible. It is our opinion that we have designed the boathouse and placed it in accordance with the general intent of the official plan as it pertains to this unique peninsula property. The boathouse has been placed at the permitted setbacks and the projections and at a farthest spot from the neighbors on all sides. The boathouse with second floor tucked into the rear and under the canopy cover of mature trees is designed for minimal visual impact to the neighbors and passing boaters. The north shoreline also serves as a more appropriate location due to the existing neighboring boathouses to the south and the existing boat traffic that already exists in the bay. With the boathouse placed at the peak of the peninsula, my client's boat traffic will be kept out of both the north and the south bay and a minimum of a 100 feet away from neighboring boathouses, docks, and all swim areas. The owners are also here and they would like to have some time to speak as well. So I'm gonna pass it along to them. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions in regards to the design or placement of the boathouse, I'm here more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Ms. Gibbs. Uh, let's bring the owners in then, Elizabeth. I don't see. Uh, Okay, I'm not sure we see the owners, Ms. Gibbs. Are, what names are we looking for here? Uh, Bill Friedman or Stephanie Bott? Well, there's Bill Friedman. Just going down our list here. <laughs> okay, I, I believe it's Mr. Friedman who is Mr. going Friedman, to be. More than likely, yeah. yes. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Friedman. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillors and Mayor Harding, for allowing me to address the situation. And I'll try to keep it relatively short. If, um, e essentially, uh, what we're trying to do is put the the, the two-story boathouse in a location where it doesn't impede the visual the visual effect of any of our neighbors. And um, the there is no impediment to the going west at all from our neighbor to the north. There may be a slight uh, visual impact, a slight, as I say, going east, but the property um, as uh, we would have the right, as, as of right, to construct a single story boathouse with a sun deck anywhere on the shoreline, even the shoreline facing the north, our northerly neighbor. And if we did that, there would be a lot more impediments caused to their use of their of that shoreline which we share with them but we don't want to impede their use of it and right now there is nothing that impedes it and so what we're asking this committee to what we're asking for is the ability to build a two-story boathouse notwithstanding a 20 percent deficiency in the shoreline uh, uh, on a straight line basis but the assessed shoreline is 492 feet, which is far in excess of the uh, 300 feet requirement. The, um, we, I, can, I can tell you that there's absolutely no invasion of privacy whatsoever as a result of the location of this boathouse, because it does not impede anything within the bay, either the bay to the north or the bay, the bay on the south side of our shorelines. 
um, in, in the the bay, we're we're at least at least 150 feet to maybe closer to 200 feet away from the present dock on the north side. The um, there is there is a, a, an indication that the boathouse footprint appears to be larger than the dwelling. But that is not correct. The boathouse is, is significantly smaller, uh, approximately 650 feet uh, of, um, on, on the second story. And our dwelling is about 1,300 to 1,400 square feet. Uh, so I, I think what's really important is to understand that as of right, we would have the ability to build a single story boathouse with a deck and place it anywhere that we want on the shoreline. And I think that would be, an, that would be a lot worse for our neighbor to the north than what is being proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Could I just get your address uh, to just for our records, please? Yeah, sorry, it's 150. Ferrand, F-E-R-R-A-N-D, Drive, Toronto, Ontario, M3C3E5. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. All right, um, anyone else? I, I see Mr. Fawner wants to come in. I believe he's uh, probably speaking against this. Anybody else uh, that wants to speak for this? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. So let's bring Mr. Fawner in. So this would be in opposition, I believe, but we'll hear from him. Welcome, Mr. Fawner. Yes, good morning, uh, Chair Bridgman, uh, members of the committee. As you say, it's a beautiful day in Muskoka, that's for sure. It's too bad we couldn't uh, roll back the, the roof and the ceiling, I suppose, <laughs> but uh, however. Um, Stephen Fawner, Northern Vision Planning Limited, 109 Meadow Heights Drive. Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1A4. I'm here representing the uh, Craig family, which is the uh, property owner immediately to the north. Um, they, do have, uh, they do have significant concerns about uh, view, um, privacy, uh, and prevent, uh, potential privacy impacts. Um, they also are concerned about access uh, to their dock, uh, even though there's been assurances from the uh, proponent I think I would, uh, you know, take exception to uh, some of that. There's definitely going to be impact. I've seen many, many properties and um, uh, over my career, and this is probably one that uh, is probably one of the worst situations for uh, locating a shoreline structure and impact on neighbors because it really is. Uh, if you look at the key map, you'll see the difficult situation that we're in, where my client really does just look right at their uh, frontage and will look right at this uh, boathouse. Um, anyways, uh, I think there's been maybe a little bit too much emphasis on the actual frontage in this case. Uh, I think you have to look at impacts as well. And uh, I know there's principle of development, and I'll be arguing that one this afternoon, but uh, impacts, uh, you have to take both into account, quite frankly. Uh, and in this case, I think impacts are, are significant. And there really hasn't been any discussion of possible alternate locations uh, for this. There's an existing dock on the other side of the point. Uh, that uh, means if uh, that area was used, there wouldn't be any change in boating uh, traffic uh, and boating habits, if you will. That's already been established. Uh, so that would uh, be maintained. So um, I do have a uh, PowerPoint presentation. If staff could just put that up, I'd appreciate that. It's really just to go through the photos. And I would also say, too, um, uh, this council would have been involved, I believe, and uh, well, it might have been the previous council in 2017. I had an application on Woodwinds Drive, which is just um, to the north of this a little ways on Walker's Point. Very similar situation that I had pointed out to my client that unless we satisfy the neighbors, uh, there is a visual impact. And in that case, a two story boathouse was not approved. And the uh, uh, distance between shoreline structures was uh, greater than we have in this particular situation. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, the view off my client's uh, dock. This is actually standing on shore. And uh, just the angle of the photograph, it, it would appear almost great at the end of the dock is sort of the back of the boathouse, if you will. Um, I measured across, now I must admit it was only on Muskoka Geo Hub, so it's, it's not 100% accurate, but it gives you a good idea. 
that if you went straight across the this little tiny bay and where I'm standing, right straight across approximately 90 feet, as you go further to the right or to the west in this case, uh, it does get wider, but it is extremely tiny, extremely small, technically does not um, constitute a narrow water body, but in essence, it really functions that way. Okay. Next. And this is uh, standing on the dock and the proposed back of the boathouse is sort of off the right hand end of the dock straight across there. And you can see how narrow it is at this uh, particular point. <laughs> Next. This is uh, my client's dwelling and you can see that they've actually there's two angles to this. The uh, portion to the left, the two-story portion, uh, faces out into the more open lake. And the right portion uh, faces actually right down the um, shoreline of the uh, subject land. So anything that happens along that shoreline definitely will be seen from this particular uh, dwelling. This dwelling was constructed in the early 1960s and that predates any zoning bylaw uh, in this area. The original zoning bylaw for Medora Wood was bylaw 65-7, and this was built in the early half of the 1960s. Next. So this is a photograph taken from the deck. Uh, this would be in front of the portion of the dwelling that faces more along the shoreline. Uh, and you can see that anything coming out from that is going to, uh, it is going to impede view. There's no doubt about it. You just, quite frankly, you can't avoid it. Uh, it's there. The boathouse in the distance will be blocked off for sure, and it will come out even farther than that. Uh, next. And this is taken further to the end of the little bay, but still on the deck of the dwelling. And again, you look, and this is, uh, you can see the newer, longer dock to the right, and there's a pre-existing small L-shaped dock uh, down below, of course, in front. And again, anything you do in this regard in terms of putting a boathouse off that shoreline is definitely going to impact view. Next. And this is just a more of a close up picture. One thing you have to realize, and I think many counselors do, and that is when you take a standard photograph from the standard uh, cameras that we have today, it's actually at a slight, slightly wide angle. So you do appear slightly farther away from things as you do. This is, I've tried to sort of focus in on what your eye really sees from, your, from the deck, and that's the case here. Next. This was supplied by the, uh, by the applicant, and uh, just showing they do use their dock uh, quite actively. Um, they are from the States, um, and they haven't been up to the property much because of COVID the last couple of years. Uh, that's my understanding, and, uh, but when they are there, it is an active location. Next. And this again shows that they do, they do enjoy their swimming, that's for sure. And you can see off the corner of that dock, um, that's where the boathouse, proposed boathouse would be shown. You can see the point of the property uh, next door there is the one the sun happens to be uh, showing on it and, and shows up the point. And then it goes back into a bay on the other side. Next. And this is a photograph uh, supplied by the applicant as well. And this is taken from the water's edge. And this is probably a really telling photo, I believe anyways, uh, looking out. And this would be um, actually not necessarily in line with the portion of the dwelling that looks across to the shoreline, but it's, it's actually turned a little to the right and looking out towards the open water. Once again, any boathouse along that shoreline, they're definitely gonna see and it's gonna impede view. Next. I think that might be it. So anyways, in conclusion, I think, uh, you know, obviously we're in committee's hands, but, uh, you know, to me, you know, the, the application could be denied or deferred to look at alternative locations. And again, we've specifically noted the uh, dock on the other side. I do know that there are neighbors on the other side too that would have to be taken into account, but it's my opinion, although I can't trespass on properties, um, that the impact would be less in that location than it is on the north side. And I, I think the photos from my client's uh, property are quite telling. And uh, that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fawner. Uh, Ms. Gibbs, would you like, or Mr. Friedman, I believe either one of you, would you like to answer that before I turn it over to committee? 
Yeah, I would like to respond to, to that if I might, Madam Chair. Please go ahead. All right. Um, just in terms of uh, alternate locations, if we if we chose the other side of the um, of the property, the uh, water is very shallow on that side, and it would it would impede uh, the ability to dock the boat there in the boathouse. In addition to that, in addition to that, our neighbor has a swim platform, and the boat would be entering right into that swim platform, which we would like to avoid completely. The other point that I would like to make, if I can, is that Mr. Fauner, with respect, has not visited the property. That's obvious um, because the their visual impediment to the west from the neighboring property is almost nil. And again, I would like to emphasize that we could put a single story boat house as of right anywhere on our shoreline, which would be, and it would require the boats to enter into the bay, which where with the, which the location of our two story boat house now, there is no entrance into the bay by any, by the boats at all, our boats. And I think that's really, really important. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Friedman. All right, committee, um, any questions, any thoughts, Mr. Fauner, unless you're, unless you're um, asked for input, I don't believe that you have that there, ability. There may, there may be other objectors. Oh, they needed to raise their hands. Okay, I'm seeing that now, but thank you for that, Mr. Fauner. Um, who else have we got here? Okay, let's, okay, if we could bring them in, that would be great. Um, thank you, Mr. Fauner. I should know that you know the rules really well here. <laughs> okay, Mr. Taylor, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Council and Madam Chair, um, and, and appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, we are indeed um, concerned about the visual impact, as, as uh, Mr. Farner pointed out very well. Um, we also are concerned uh, I, the, in, in the presentation uh, about the um, heavily wooded um, uh, shoreline. I think it was obvious that, that, that that's not the case. It, it, there isn't a screen of, heav of heavily wooded shoreline that would actually um, Cover this uh, this proposed structure. Uh, the, the the shoreline actually measured from the end of the dock to the opposite shore is approximately sixty five feet. If you do measure from the dock to where the proposed structure is, and um, as Mr. Forner pointed out, we're talking about approximately ninety feet. It's very close. It's very um, proximal to the location of of the activities. And, and that dock is used not just for swimming, but um, that dock is used for the boat. We tie up the boat on the, on the inside of that dock in the protected area. And um, the final point is having uh, swum up and down that shore many, many times, uh, that, that the proposed location is, is quite rocky. It's a sh there's a lot of shallow rock um, indeed as, as uh, the proponent indicated on the other side, there are there is uh, shallow water on that side, but again, there is a dock on that side that has been used historically um, for boating, including a sailboat that was docked at the other uh, at that dock on the other side. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what the proponent proposes in terms of um, removing or uh, handling the the, the rock. Um, that is that is on that point uh, to allow uh, boat uh, ent entry and exit um, because it is there there the the bathymetry lines that are shown on the on the application are just very general lines it doesn't really reflect what um, that shore looks like. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Could I just oh. get your could I please just get your um, address, please? Yes, yes, of course. It's 7099 Northeast Dolphin Drive, Bainbridge Island, 
Washington, 98110. Okay, thank you. And, and did I, and, did I, is, would this be Miss Taylor or? This is Allison Craig. Yes. yes. Okay. And I just Ms. Craig. to add um, that when you talk about the two bays, they're really very different. That um, the one that our cottage is on is very shallow. On the opposite side, it goes quite far back. Um, as far as depth goes, right off our dock, it's less than five feet sometimes. Um, the boathouse would be angled in, so it would be even closer. Uh, as far as boat traffic goes, most of the boats that we see coming in are coming from the side that our bay is on, because that is where Port Carling, that's where. Uh, so, you know, to say that they would not be, that it's less traffic coming in to locate their boat on our side versus the other side of the point, I just don't agree with that. Um, and as you can see from the photos, privacy is very much impacted and our photos um, are taken, there's nothing misleading about them. And finally, you know, the point was bought knowing what the existing zoning laws are. So to say that a two-story boathouse will be less of an impact than a one-story boathouse with an entertaining section on top and everything else, I'm, I just don't understand your argument. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Craig Olins, um, welcome. And if you, if, yes, if you could just give us your address too, please, before you address us. 232 Allendale Road, Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, 02147. Please go ahead. Okay. I uh, just wanted to say um, that uh, when these lots were created, the boating and swimming activities for lot one were situated on the south side of the point in order to, or thus um, ensuring a mutual respect for each other's private enjoyment of what the lake and the views have to offer. Um, as time went on, we welcomed the zoning restrictions to honor the natural shoreline, prevent overbuilding and protect the peace and tranquility as much as possible. Equally important, for six decades, we enjoyed an implicit neighborly respect for each other's use and privacy. This proposal marks a severe intrusion on our use. Boating in and out will be difficult. It's a challenge to dock as it is. It poses a danger to swimmers, a threat to our peaceful enjoyment. And I do hope that we can be good neighbors and work out a mutually satisfactory solution. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think, I believe Elizabeth, we see one more person who would like to speak. Thank you. Um, Ms. Craig Olins, if I could just get you to mute your, oh, you did it already. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, I wanted oh, to- Ms. Ray. Hi, Amy. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, add um, that when I was trying to understand and look at the plans of the boathouse, it appears to be canted so that um, we I, essentially, I think we would be looking at the back of the boathouse and it would jut out into the bay quite a bit. Um, just from what the plans say, it looks like only a quarter of the, like a, a corner of it is on the um, peninsula. And it just, from the plans that we were looking over, it appears to be quite large, like 50 feet by 50 feet on each side. So I just wanted to point that out because it's, it, it does appear larger than the, the structure, even though I, I understand that um, the structure on land seem smaller according to the plans that were given to me. I just wanted to point that out. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. Could we just get your address uh, to oh, yeah. this ring? It's, um, it's uh, <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting my address right now. It's um, 2235 Pinecrest Road in Agora, A-G-O-U-R-A, -A, California, 91301. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so now that we have had, I, I, Mr. Friedman, I'm not sure if you want to respond again. I, I believe I would like to give you that opportunity if you want to, as we had more people speak up afterwards. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to add that the visual impact is negligible going west 
And I think that's important because that's the area that the, their, their cottage faces. In addition to that, what they don't understand is that we could build the boat, a single story boat with a deck right adjacent to their dock. Uh, and, and that would not be, that would be as of right. And we've decided not to do that, but to move it to the point so that we don't impede their ability to use the bay. And we, we don't have to access the bay at all. Thank you. Okay, noted. Um, Ms. Gibbs. Thank you very much, Chair. Through you, um, I believe Bill may have touched on it, but I just wanted to reiterate to Council today that we aren't looking at whether or not the boathouse itself is permitted. There is um, a boathouse that can be permitted here, one story in this exact location. So really just wanted to remind everyone, we're really just looking at that second floor, um, which again, we've tried to design within bylaws and in keeping with the official plan, but just wanted to make sure that we are you know, defining between whether there's a boathouse allowed and whether there's a second story, because the boathouse has been designed, let's only look at the first story, with the Craigs in mind. It is not directed near their um, property. It is directed directly to the west, where the Craigs are northeast of the boathouse. And also there are minimal windows to the north and to the west of the proposed boathouse. So privacy really isn't an issue. And there isn't an extensive entertainment dock on the north side. So I really don't expect that people are going to be hanging out and staring right onto the Craig's dock. More likely, they're going to be staring out into the beautiful views of Muskoka. If anyone's staring at our boathouse, they're looking in the wrong direction. So anyhow, that's all I have to say. I'm here if there's anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over to committee now. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Uh, I mostly had my hand up earlier because I'm finding it difficult when the maps that I have in front of me um, don't really indicate where people are. Um, you know, we've had a number of speakers and I have no clue which properties they feel that they're in, being impacted. Um, so I, I'd like to find a, a way that we can do that going forward um, with our applications because that, thank you for all speaking, but I have no clue where you're located. So, uh, and, and understanding, um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded for a number of years that we cannot protect views. That is not an opportunity that we have. Um, uh, and it's it's interesting when I saw the size of the, the the 30 feet versus 36, and I'm reminded of again going back to 1414 and at a discussion that we actually had based on true building practices that building 33 feet was barely enough to have two slip boathouses, and these were small slips. Uh, so uh, 36 feet, I, I think, is the, the number, uh, sort of the smallest number that you can go for, for that type of, uh, even in a one-story boathouse. Um, I, I don't, I'd love to be concerned about the neighbor's view, but I'm really aware that this property owner has rights. And I think it appears that he's being um, aware of, of the impacts that it may have on the neighbors. Um, and, uh, but the, the fact is that he does have rights and it has to go somewhere and we cannot protect views. What I would be concerned about though, uh, because there's, it, it might even be in this Bay Area, um, where people are putting uh, floaties out. You know, I, I've talked about this before, these big trampolines and all of these other things that get even worse, like when all the property owners and things, and, and then it, it gets to be a more challenge for people to um, enjoy their waterfront because the neighbor's got a floaty that doesn't have to comply to the same regulations that our, our structures do. So anyhow, I, I, would, I would be moving this application forward. Um, again, I'm very concerned that um, we, have, we have had these precedents before 
and approve them uh, with somewhat perceived shortages of frontage. Um, but again, adding the, the uh, six feet to do a decent boathouse, I think is, is responsible. Thank you. Uh, to your point, Councillor Nishikawa, Mr. Mr. Sharp, could I ask perhaps, because I went to the GeoHub map uh, on this application, which shows the location of the neighbor's house and the docks and everything else. Mr. Sharp, do you think we could have just a snapshot in each one of these from the GeoHub that will give us sort of the whole, the whole area to look at going forward? Is that a big ask? Not sure. Uh, I totally understand uh, sort of your your preferred approach. Um, I think part of the difficulty is is with each application, we we never have the ability in advance to know who might um, make a submission or or make a, a comment. Uh, we're always able to put up the key map of, as and screen share, screen share the key map. And um, you know, back in the day when we met in person, we used to do that all the time. Uh, people could point out on the screen. Um, where their property was in relation to the, the property being discussed. Um, we could certainly try to do that in a, in a digital uh, context or digital world. Um, so we do have the key map available. And um, I believe uh, Miss uh, Miss Olin's, uh, Miss Craig Olin's rather, apologies, um, her property is located directly to the north. So it's the abutting northerly property, which would be the, uh, the property most impacted. So if you're looking at the, um, the key map, I just will turn to it uh, in the agenda package. I, I don't recall exactly which uh, page it is. It's page 190. So the subject property um, is hatched and the uh, Olin's, the Craig Olin's property is directly to the north being the abutting uh, northerly property. Sorry, Mr. Sharp, maybe I wasn't very clear, but they, the geo hub, the zoning map on, on the district's geo hub, you can, you can go in on that and get that whole area, but it shows properties and it shows, it, it actually shows the docking. Um, that's anyway, that's where I went, Councillor Nishikawa, right. so that I do well, have an understanding. If, of it. if I could just have a supplemental then. Sure. What, what my challenge is, is looking at this is I don't know where their structures are. So it, 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 it's just, although I have to remind myself that as much as I try, I, I can't protect views, but I don't, I don't have a, a clear understanding of where their structures are. Uh, yeah, going forward, just uh, apologies, uh, Chair Bridgman, uh, to interject, but just going forward, you know, we can try where we can to include an aerial photograph and a report. We do do that from time to time, um, and we could try to do that um, going forward if that would be helpful. Um, the the uh, shoreline structures on the, the property to the north are sort of located, uh, you know, near the end of the, the embayment or the narrow, the, the, the bay in this context. So we definitely try and do that. Thank you. Um, I'm not asking for that, Mr. Sharp, and I don't want that much work to go into it. I was just asking for a snapshot from the GeoHub, but I, I think we can do that perhaps even at the meeting. Somebody can go online and share that online. Um, it's very simple, um, but let's take that off. Let, let's take that off here, and I'll, I'll chat with you afterwards uh, on that. I was just trying to help out here on on more information. Uh, Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, and through you, I, I guess I have a question and then a statement. So, if I could ask the question, this uh, the, the, all the photos uh, appear the, the nice white uh, two story building, the cottage or, or home uh, appear to be. It, it looks to me to be a new build. Is is this a uh, is this a new build? Is this a relatively new two to five year cottage? It's built, and now the next part of the development of the property is is this boathouse or. Um, no. I'll, ex I'll explain in a moment why I'm asking. I can, I can answer that, Madam Chair. Friedman, I, yes, please go ahead. It's not a new build. What we did is we, it, it's, it was an old, it's an old cottage, older cottage. We just repainted it when we, after we bought it and it looks a lot newer now because it's, we call it the white house, <laughs> not to, uh, not to, um, you know, distort 
Canada and the United States. <laughs> Given our audience today, that's interesting. Uh, an interesting moniker. Right. Look, look at, I, I will. I will say based on that, and thank you for that information. Um, you know, this committee has had some success uh, over the over our term of uh, when we see concerns like this from stated by others who are neighbors, uh, and in that very vein of being neighborly, I, I might uh, suggest a deferment on my part. I would certainly suggest that for, you know, 30 days where perhaps this group could get together, your group could get together and, you know, not so much come to terms, maybe, maybe it, it is come to terms. Um, I think some understanding here, there seems to be, a, and I use the term very loosely, an ignorance piece where some people don't understand where the proponent uh, is going and why. And, and while we can't protect views, certainly, uh, we certainly can do whatever we can do as a committee to help people join hands and, and live together in this beautiful place. So I would suggest uh, personally that I would love to see um, this group go away for 30 days and come back. Um, perhaps the ultimate uh, end result is the same, but I think in the interest of working together and the spirit of this place, I would that would be my preference. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Thank you, and through you, um, I did pull up the aerial photographs from the geo map and I was able to um, get a better idea of what exactly we are looking at. And um, the on the other side of, the property where the dock is, uh, it's, it's a very large bay. There are two boathouses already in there. Um, I, I'm just thinking if, if it's going to cause issues to be closer to the uh, Craigs, maybe you could consider moving it around to the other side. From the aerial photos, it looks as if it's very shallow on the uh, Craig side, but it is not so shallow on the other side, and there's much more room for boating. So I'm just wondering if you'd considered that at all. I and believe that's- if, if, Yeah, and if your neighbor has a, a launch pad out, um, looking at his property, it, it, I don't think it, if you were to have it between the, uh, where the cottage is and where the dock is, I, I don't believe he would have his pad out quite that far. Um, it, it does give a little bit more perspective when you're looking all the way around the bay. So I just, believe that's I, I'm just, just thinking, that. could we get a deferral to consider that? I think, I believe you've directed that back to Mr. Friedman, uh, uh, Councillor Hayes, to answer that question. Yes, uh, Councillor, the, the, the issue of the, of the side that you're speaking about, the problem is the boats would have to enter into the bay. And what we're trying to avoid is either entering into either bay by the boat. And given where the location is now, there would be no entrance into the bay and we would cause no uh, issues for anybody that was in the bay. And if we moved it to the other side, we would have to enter into the bay. There are already a number of boathouses in that bay. And I think it's more logical and less of an impediment to, to place it where we did. And we canvassed that location extensively both with Miss um, Gibbs and others as well. Thank you. Supplementary? Supplementary. Um, I, I, in some of the correspondence, um, they mentioned that the lot has been severed and it was their understanding that with this severance that any, any boathouses would be on the Southern shore. Um, does staff have any, um, any record of this that we could verify it? Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and thank you for your question, Councillor Hayes. Uh, just to get back to the question about the GeoHub, I do have uh, the mapping that I can share if that would be of some value to committee, but to answer the question first, yes, uh, the subject property was a retained lot in a consent application from 2009. Um, and it was actually an undersized frontage that required a, a zoning uh, bylaw amendment approval in order to recognize it. And um, there were no restrictions recommended by staff of the municipality at that time on the location of shoreline structures on the retained lot. Restrictions were put in place 
on the severed lot to the south, but no restrictions were put in place with respect to the subject property um, that we have that we're dealing with uh, today. So I'd be happy to share that uh, screenshot if that would be helpful, Chair Bridgman. Well, why don't we do that now that I put you to all that work? <laughs> so. Okay, now it's saying that I can't screen share. So I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> so not, not, not to um, belabor all of the points here, but um, uh, thank you if we can do that easily and people still want it, that would be great. Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just heard uh, Mr. Friedman state that um, he doesn't want to put the boathouse on the what I'll call the southern side of the property, southern shore, because he has to enter from the middle of the bay. Uh, I'm not quite sure why we couldn't enter from the west again. It's just the inverse uh, perspective of that boathouse. Now, I do know if you decide to go in um, on the southern and put the boathouse on the southern point of your shore, you're going to have objection, which we already do, from the neighbors to yourself. So I, you know, I think we've got objection from both sides of the equation here. And I guess which is more palatable to this committee going forward. Um, you know, I, let me ask specifically, Mr. Freeman, why cannot you drive straight into the boathouse if the boathouse was from the on the southern shore? Why can't it have the same orientation um, as on the northern shore and driving straight in? Well, because if I might, um, Mayor Harding, uh, the, the entrance would be into the bay on the south side, as opposed to on the north side, where there would be no entrance into the bay at all. And so what we're trying to do is avoid the entrances of the boats into the bay. And as I've indicated, there are mm. boathouses in the bay, which creates traffic. And I'm trying to avoid any boat traffic whatsoever into either bay any more traffic into the south bay and any any traffic at all of of the boats into the uh, north bay okay let me just be maybe a little bit more specific if the boathouse was rotated 90 degrees you could enter from the due west why could that not happen if the boathouse was placed on the southern shore Mr. Freeman? I, 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 the boathouse being placed on the southern shore would require entering into the bay, regardless of which way the boat, the the docks, sorry, the uh, entrance faced. It would still require entering into the bay. Okay, I guess I'm sort of misunderstanding. And <clears throat> if I look at what I'll call seven o'clock on your property. Um, just below that dock, if you were to put the boathouse there in between your two docks, you could drive straight into your boathouse and almost put your boathouse on the point. I, I, I don't think so, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think we would have to enter into the bay to get into the boathouse, regardless of where, uh, regardless of which way it was structured. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, but I mean, that's, we've looked at that in with great, with great, um, uh, and many times in order to decide what, to, what location would be best for our neighbors. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so um, thank you, Bryce. I actually, and I, we're not gonna go any farther with this. This is great, this gives everybody an idea. I actually meant the zoning map because it sh distinctly shows everything, but that gives us a great overview and I'll chat with you after <laughs> on that. Uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Thank you, Chair. I'm actually following on to the earlier discussion. Um, and my question is, if we look at where the boathouse is, it's not facing directly um, away from the property. It's facing, uh, and I don't understand, you can leave it where it is, but just twist it so that you enter from the wide, big water. So it could be on either side. I think I agree with the mayor, either side would do it. The other problem with the way it's situated in my view is that this has a, a very large uh, a deck on it. And that deck is now facing into other properties. Whereas if the boathouse was just rotated, so that faced out into the large water, I think that might solve uh, a number of the problems. And, and my second question, I'll just ask the two together, was that in the photos, 
there's some type of a uh, item that's covered in a cover on some type of raised patio or sun deck. And I just wondered what that object was that's covered on that raised uh, patio or sun deck. Thank you. So I, 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 I can okay. answer that question in terms of what's covered, Councillor. And that's just a, uh, uh, it's a chair, a, um, a bed chair that sits on the, uh, on the ground. Thank and you. we cover it in order to avoid it from getting wet. Uh, at least Dr. my wife, Dr. Stephanie Bott covers it because she tries to keep it dry most of the time. Thank you. So as far as turning the boathouse to face out, what, what's your comment on that? Mr. Friedman? I'm going to leave that to Ms. Gibbs if I can, because I, I, I'm not sure I understand what the impact would be. Ms. Gibbs? Thank you very much. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the boathouse is faced due west. The boathouse and the slips are, are due west out the left side. If you're looking at the site plan, it's going out the left side directly into the main water. Um, back to Mayor Harding's comment previously about why we don't move it to the south. Um, we no longer have that map up um, that Mr. Sharp brought up. But if you do look at the aerial photos, what we are looking at is our property and both the neighbors to the north and the south, their predominant views are directly west. If we move that boathouse to the south shoreline, even if it's directed in the same direction as now, as Mayor Harding suggests, we're gonna be sitting directly in front of the cottage to the south. Far worse site impediments than we're doing right now. Um, right now, we're not sitting in anyone's sight line except our own. We're actually sitting slightly in front of the cottage. So when you're sitting on the dock, you see the corner of the boathouse. And we've done that to try to get it as close to the point as possible. Um, we really just feel that any relocation onto the north or the south shorelines bring boat traffic into the bay and it's really not necessary. Not when we have the option to set it out at the peak and have boats coming in and out directly out of Lake Muskoka and really not touching our neighbors at all. Um, again, we're over 125 feet from the neighboring dock and 400 feet from the neighbors to the south. So I really don't see any impact on this. And yes, just to read it, everything is directly left uh, west into Lake Muskoka. So. Yeah, just quick supplement, you are correct. When I looked at the boathouse in the picture I'm looking at uh, from the permit guy, I interpreted the top structure as being a slip and I thought the slips were facing to the north. But I see it now that that shaded piece is actually the upper story and the slips are facing to the west. So I apologize, so you, you've answered my Not question. Not at all, I will make my site plan much more uh, readable next time. I'll show this. No, it just there. appeared like it, you'll see the lines going out. It looked like those were, the door is facing. So you've answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just to want to uh, have all of our people who are sitting here just understand we're, we're now in committee discussion. So unless you're directly addressed, this stays as committee um, uh, discussion. Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, views uh it was saying it's impeding views and i think even mr fauner if we ask him if he's been before the uh, was the omb at that time your view is straight out from your your uh, cottage if you look at figure three on page 194 that cottage looks right into that that is a view that is being obstructed and that i can't support this it can go on the other side there are other boat houses there so uh they're used to, to looking at uh, boat houses and that, but I would not be supporting this uh, and that. And yes, he can put a one-story boat house there, fine, but he doesn't put a two-story there. Thank you. So committee, am I getting somewhat of a read that this, this with the two-story boat house may not go through? Do we have people not in support of what this is at the moment? enough that I'm going to ask if if Mr. Friedman and uh, Mayor Harding. Sorry, thank you. Um, and I, again, my comment, I, we're gonna offend a neighbor on either side, whichever side this boat host is on, I think is a fundamental reality. Um, as Councillor Ever suggested, the views um, are typically straight across your property. 
but in that particular case, you're only looking at your neighbor's shoreline. So I'm not getting a view down the end of the lake um, because the view is at the end of the point. The one question I ask um, in the applicant, have you considered rotating the upper portion of this second story boathouse to parallel the shoreline? The one corner on the north side sticks out close to the property, would have the most visual impact <clears throat> to the neighbors. Agreed, you can put a one story boathouse, so I can't change the way that's going to go. But the orientation of the upper story, and maybe uh, to Mr. Fawner, if that would be more palatable, should that upper story parallel the shoreline versus being oriented perpendicular to the shoreline, if that might be more palatable to your clients. Mr. Fawner. Yeah, thank you. And through the chair, um, I think that's something I discuss with my clients. So again, you're in a, what I feel anyways, is a very tight situation. And I agree with the mayor that there may potentially be some impacts to the property owner to the south uh, if it's put on the south side, but I won't get into that. I still think that would be better overall. Um, if you turn it parallel to the shoreline, then you're having a greater face of that second story will still be facing onto my client's property because Keep in mind when uh, Mr. Sharp had the uh, key plan up or someone had the key plan up, my client's property has got considerable frontage that goes actually beyond, slightly beyond the end of this point. So they're always gonna be looking at it almost regardless of what's put there. So um, I think one of the things that would be very helpful, uh, I think overall is that uh, the outline of this structure be actually put out on the property. Uh, in some way, it can do that by floats uh, and show exactly where this boathouse is going to be. You know, I think there's been, you know, some conflicting information, for example, from the applicant who's saying how much space there is. Um, I'm only going off the Skoka Geo Hub, which again is, is you know, it's, it's good, but it's not perfectly accurate. Uh, but from the photos, I was quite shocked when I went down to the dock as to how close things were in that, uh, that immediate area. Um, maybe that's something that uh, would be helpful uh, to everyone is to point out exactly where this boathouse is going to be and exactly where it's going to be out in the water. In other words, put floats out at the corners. I, I know I didn't directly answer the question, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I would have to discuss it with my clients. And I think maybe if there's more information available to everyone on site, uh, then that might be helpful. Councillor, so I, we may get back to you on that, Mr. Foner. Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I, I, um, I was listening to the mayor and I, I appreciate what he brought forward. Um, I do feel that there's some wiggle room to reconfigure it slightly. I don't, I don't think it needs to be switched to the other side or anything like that. Um, but having the, um, the, the habitable two story, not the patio uh, up against the, the shoreline makes better sense to me. Um, as well, I was a little concerned with a couple of comments because Generally, we trust an applicant that the information that they've brought forward is correct. And, and, and certainly when Mr. Fawner has brought applications forward, I've trusted that his information has been correct. So I don't believe that the information that's been presented today is incorrect. Uh, I'm going to give the applicant the benefit um, of the information provided. Um, but again, I look at the reality that this could be a one-story boathouse. And this, this would still have the same impact. Um, would I like to not see the, the, the party deck up top? For sure, uh, that would be nice, but they would be allowed to do that if it was a one-story anyhow. So um, again, I, I don't know that we need to defer this. I know that, um, I don't get to see what everybody else is, but I think that this, this question could be called today. Thank you. Uh, just for informational items, I've pulled up the map that I like from GeoHub for me. And um, 
Miss Gibbs comment about the neighbor on the south being directly impacted by a boathouse on that shoreline. I can see your point, Miss Gibbs, because I can see where that cottage is situated and where it looks. So I think you've got a no win on both sides of this in terms of impact. Um, all right, so I am um, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I This is a hard decision. Uh, I prefer a deferral as uh, Councillor Zavitz was suggesting, for the neighbors to just discuss their, their positions in that and see if there's some sort of mutual ground that they can they, they can fall on. It's uh, I, I'd like to actually go out. I've only had to go out two or three times on applications, but go out myself and take a look at what's going on in this lot, on these uh, on this application. So so I, I, I think we should go for a deferral. How's it gonna... Like, What's the big risk of doing doing a deferral? Well, quite quite honestly, if Mr. Friedman is not interested and and his group in any discussion of moving the boathouse to the other side, I don't actually see deferring this, uh, Councillor Roberts. But uh, we'll find out. Um, I I'm not in favor of that. I'm with Councillor Nishikawa. There, they have a right to build a boathouse wherever they want on this shoreline. So, uh, Councillor uh, Zavitz. Thank you. And just a lot, just my last word. Um, they do have a right to build a boathouse here and they sure have a right to build a two story boathouse. I don't think we should be going into that whole area with all due respect to to some of the other councillors um, to suggest they can build a boathouse, but they should just build one with a, a party deck on a second floor. Uh, that's that's LPAT <laughs> right away, isn't it? Because now we're restricting their rights. Uh, I do like the idea of uh, the neighbors getting together, taking a month. Uh, you know, Mr. Friedman seems like a reasonable person, as do those fine other folks. I mean, if, if it goes nowhere, it goes nowhere. I mean, 30 days, the boathouse has never been there. So my thought my thought would be conciliatory, uh, high, wide, and handsome. Uh, let's give everybody 30 days uh, to have a little chat. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Oh, thank you. And through you, yes, I, I would like to see this deferred so that the neighbors can have um, a chat about it. This is Muskoka. We like everybody to get along um, and to see if an, another option could be be found that you haven't considered yet. Um, bringing it back here in 30 days, I don't think would hurt anything. And it would give any of the councillors a chance to go out and take a look at it physically um, so that they can make a, a better dis, uh, decision on this matter. Okay, thank you. So, Ms. Gibbs and Mr. Friedman, it's your application. Would you agree to a deferral? Mr. Friedman? Uh, would I agree to a deferral in order to have a discussion with our neighbor to the north? Uh, I see nothing wrong with that. I'm a corporate commercial lawyer, um, and, and so I do a lot of battles. But um, I, I think that having a discussion with the neighbor to see if we can appease the, their concerns or deal with their concerns, I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Terrific. All right, then I think, well, Mayor Harding, I will let you speak, but I believe we're, as a committee, going to defer this. Mayor Harding? Yeah, thank you. Just to um, uh, the Freeman's perspective on the bots. Um, you know, what I've heard from those most in opposition is mark out on the lake where the boathouse is going to go, try and do as much of a visual representation, mock-ups, if you will, of what their views are going to be from different sides of the property. And I think that at the same time will help all of uh, council and committee uh, make an appropriate decision. So uh, hopefully those are good working orders and uh, maybe come back in June. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So committee, we just for our, for our clerk's sake, we all agree we're going to do a deferral. And yes, yes, Councillor Edwards, you may speak. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, Mr. Friedman, would uh, it be possible for any councillors that want to go out to actually access your uh, property without trespassing? You're more, you're more than welcome to uh, thank you very to much, sir. Our property, uh, either by by water or by land. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. No, no problem. Could I ask, could I ask the, the same as the neighboring property? Can we visit their property? Yes. Mr. Fawner, we've got a we've got a thumbs up. So okay, we are going to defer this and uh, I think we'll leave it up to 
staff and, and uh, to uh, work with the applicant to see when they want to bring it back. And that's terrific. So, okay. So, um, do we have, I'm mean, just wondering if we should break now for lunch. We can have an hour's lunch and we will be back at one o'clock. So we'll see everybody here at one.
Mr. Zavitz, have you been sitting here the entire time? Heavy on the mister. Well, I was trying to talk to you earlier, but they somebody had muted me. So <laughs> now that the chair is back, we're unmuted, I guess. Big, big brother is watching. Yeah. So how are you doing? Uh, fine. I'm enjoying the weather. Got over, to, got over to Bala for a few minutes, saw my lovely wife, and uh, yeah, told her I'd see her tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> okay, well, it's yeah, it's crazy weather. It's going to hit us probably. It's going to get cold again, isn't it? Uh, yeah, today's dandelion day. Has anyone else noticed that's dandelion day everywhere? It's, uh, it's a dandy day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, are we got any rain coming? Uh, here we have a fire ban. We do. Yeah, I well, gotta get this. Gotta get the signs out. <clears throat> They're actually out all over Bala. Oh, we put out four extra signs on our on every one of our entrances. Big red, big four foot long, about uh, twelve inches high, red on white. Total fire ban. What do you mean our entrances? What are you talking about? We own Leonard Lake. No, <laughs> all the all the Leonard Lake uh, cottage entrances. There's there's four points of entry into Leonard Lake, one by boat, and three roads. And if I can get everybody to start wandering back, we'll start again in a couple couple of minutes. It's a crazy meeting out of four subjects: uh, one approved, one defeated, and two deferred. Wow. <laughs> I think we're recording live on YouTube too, Councillor Jagowitz, if I'm <laughs> correct. But you're right; it's a very unusual meeting. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> hmm. Okay, everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we will um, resume at this point with our last um, with our last public meeting, which is District Road 118 Holdings, Inc. And Ms. Darling, I believe you are up. Yes. There you are. Good afternoon, everyone. The next application to be heard is Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application ZBA 722. Bylaw 2022-024 in the name of District Road 118 Holdings, Inc. The property is known municipally as 3859 Muskoka Road 118 West. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan on page 233 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. The zoning bylaw amendment application has been submitted to construct a new office slash storage building. An exemption is required for the minimum interior side yard setback requirement of 100 feet. Proposed office and storage building is to be 49.9 feet. Another exemption is required for the maximum lot coverage of 5%. The proposed lot coverage on the entire lot um, is proposed at 5.5 or 10,487 square feet. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 20 days in advance. Um, comments were received from Tim Sopko, the Township's Public Work Technician, and Nick Snyder, the Chief Building Official, and these comments were forwarded to Planning Committee prior to today's meeting. Since the comments were circulated to Committee, one comment was received from the District Municipality of Muskoka's District Planner, Curtis Sivrat, and the District doesn't object to the approval of the application provided that Town Council is satisfied that the proposed development is compatible with adjacent mineral aggregate operations. So I have prepared a detailed staff planning report for committee's consideration. Staff have no concerns with the application and I have no further comments at this time, but would be happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. I believe Mr. Zerbach is the agent representing the owners here, so we can just let him in, Elizabeth, that would be great. Welcome again, Mr. Zerbach. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Uh, just one uh, note in particular, um, and I apologize, I believe the owner, uh, Jim Broham, had sent two letters of support to the, uh, the general planning email address. Miss Darling, I, I don't know if you actually received them. Um, yeah, I, I, I missed it on my notes, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, so um, just in general, there's a letter of support uh, from 3859 Muskoka Road 118 uh, from a Jennifer Hollywell. And there is another letter of support from uh, Ron Brent, Brent Corey's, um, uh, re sorry, related to this application. Uh, so you've got them in file and I, I just wanted to note that, thank you. Um, I just have a very brief presentation and uh, hopefully Councillor Jagowitz, I can tip the scales with uh, the way the, the applications have been going today. Um, Stefan Sherback, Planner with Planscape, 104 Kimberly Avenue. I'm here to today to speak on behalf of this well-established business in Port Carling. And I understand the owner is also observing these proceedings. Uh, first of all, again, thank you, Ms. Darling, for their gui guidance and assistance with this application, uh, together with a thorough planning analysis that's uh, contained in the staff report. We agree with, the, with staff's overall review and the recommendations related to this request. Um, again, the request in front of you is for increased lot coverage and a reduction to the side yard setback uh, for this new building. The main reason for the relief to the setback is to avoid uh, placing the building on a significant rock outcrop, and it is uh, situated on a relatively flat property, um, uh, portion of the property. Moving the structure to meet the required setbacks will result in significant blasting and site alteration, which the owner clearly wants to avoid. The policy analysis is very similar to our review. And uh, it's just as important to also point out through these strong official plan policies that encourage business expansions and uh, focus on maintaining well-established businesses within your community designations. Clearly, um, the way that the construction industry is going, this uh, company does employ lots of uh, individuals within your municipality and the um, expansion of this site will also encourage and, and maintain this um, trait. Again, several letters of support, which I just rhymed off, and we're fully in support of staff's recommendations and agree that the application fully conforms to the, your general intent of the official plan. It complies with all other zoning uh, bylaw provisions and it represents good planning. Thank you very much for the time to speak today. Okay, thank you. Um... Elizabeth, anyone wishing to speak for? Against? All right. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to committee then. Any comments, questions, committee? Seeing none, I'm going to read the motion. Moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Jagalowitz. Be it resolved the Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment ZBA 07 22. District Road 118 Holdings Inc. Roll number 6 25 073 02 be approved. Any comments? All in favor? Okay. Madam Clerk, okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Zeebach. That's, I think that's you for today. So have a nice day. Okay, we are, are we are now going to uh, move on the agenda a little bit um, to, and we're going to go to number 11, which is our site alteration and tree preservation bylaws. We're going to try and stay with the one o'clock time that we, we asked um, uh, delegates to delegate at. And so I think what we'll do is have, I uh, have Mr. I just see if I see Mr. Kennedy. We'll have Mr. Kennedy. There you are, Mr. Kennedy. We'll have you introduce it, and then um, I think we'll we'll hear from the delegates. And just as a note, we have heard from all three of our our fairly large interest groups. That would be 
Friends of Muskoka and the MLA and the R Muskoka and also R Muskoka Rape Payers Association. They are not speaking today, that last one, but that has been circulated to all of the councillors. So I just want to make sure that's on record that, it, that we all received that and we have all read it. So, okay, Mr. Kennedy, please take it away. Excuse me. Uh, good afternoon, uh, committee and uh, count the rest of council. Uh, this report comes forward to you, uh, as you guys have uh, seen a few times now, uh, starting in December, we had our first meeting uh, in regards to the tree, what we have now um, altered the um, name to be as a tree conservation bylaw and the site alteration bylaw. And most recently, we had another meeting with the first draft of the bylaw in March. Uh, and in that uh, meeting, it was directed that we look for further public input uh, and put this up on the uh, Engage Muskoka Lakes page, uh, which we did uh, just about at the end of March, I believe. And it was up there for about 30 days, um, just to give us time to be able to uh, bring this report forward for May. Uh, in this report, you will see uh, quite a number of appendices here. Uh, you will see two versions of the draft bylaws. Uh, one is a red line version of the changes that we've made from the first draft that was introduced in March. Uh, you will see we've, uh, I, I like to say that there is a lot of minor changes that have a big impact, uh, especially in the tree conservation bylaw. Um, there was uh, some consideration at the last meeting that the arborist definition was a little bit too restrictive. So we have relaxed that a little bit with the uh, last caveat in that uh, definition. Um, and over the last month, we have been able to speak to multiple contractors, uh, multiple residents, multiple associations, and we were actually um, pleased to partake in a webinar that the MLA put on, I believe, uh, April 17th, uh, which, which was very, very well received. Uh, I've, I've continually gotten phone calls in the last couple of weeks uh, with people actually explaining that they listened to it and, uh, and they thought it was very, very informative. Uh, so that, that was really good to be a part of. Um, but uh, other than that, I don't think there's anything else that uh, needs to be said. If there is any questions, I am happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I think we'll bring our first delegate in. And I believe Ms. Brown is going to speak on behalf of our Muskoka excuse me, Armaskoka. So maybe Elizabeth, we could bring her in and Mr. Sift and Mr. Clark. So they are all part of uh, Armaskoka's presentation. Welcome, Ms. Brown. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, we can, that's great. So just give us your address. And then uh, please carry on. You have, I believe you have five minutes. Perfect. My name is Allie Brown and I'm speaking on behalf of our Muskoka Stakeholders Association and a permanent resident here at Port Carling at 10 Bailey Street. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Our Muskoka has reviewed the staff report and both updated draft bylaws and would ask that you consider the following comments regarding these significant changes in bylaws that are not appealable once approved. We did make our position clear on this bylaw review in our letters submitted previously, our comments still stand. For multiple reasons, and we still, we detail some of the major ones below, we ask you to direct staff to host a proper public meeting in regards to these bylaws. We also ask that all public comments and survey responses be provided, perhaps in the form of a clear list, as we believe it is important for council and the public to understand the comments received before a decision is made. These draft bylaws have come back to the council multiple times now with few improvements or adjustments from our concerns. We ask that you please consider our points below. One, if it is enforcement measures the bylaw officers need, increasing the land subject to the bylaw does not foster this. In our opinion, there is no need to increase the size of the area regulated for site alteration or tree conservation in both the waterfront designations and communities and urban centers. Is the township seeing issues beyond 200 feet or 25 feet in the specified areas? We ask you to consider keeping the land subject to bylaw as they read in the current site alteration bylaw and tree preservation bylaw. Two, the stone patio addition is great. However, we are confused about where the patio size of 200 square feet came from and hope you agree that lot frontage should weigh in on what is allowed for specific properties. How will patios that were built before this draft bylaw be dealt with in regards to fines? How will the township determine what is considered new? 
Existing patios, driveways, landscaping steps, et cetera, do not require a building permit, so the township will have no record of them. How does this impact enforcement issues? Are owners at risk if they can't document the dates the work was completed? What if an existing patio was recently replaced and appears to be new? The bylaw should include a section about existing development and how it will be treated and if restoration reconstruction is permitted. Three, what is the plan to educate our community on these bylaws? Will you touch base with specific business owners, garden centers, landscapers, builders, et cetera, so they know about the new mulch prohibition? If early birds have already laid their mulch for the year and it goes outside of this new prohibition, how will owners fight the $1,000 fine? Installing a silt fence when removing a tree does not make any sense if no soils are exposed. This requirement should be removed. Five, sediment control measures, tree protection plans, and sedimentation control plans are all newly introduced in these draft bylaws. There are some clear instructions on how these measures are pl and plans are to be outlined. However, does the township have staff with the necessary qualifications to enforce this bylaw? Do all planners and bylaw officers have the appropriate training, education, and experience regarding site development, erosion control, protection, tree preservation, et cetera? The township is quick to require owners to hire an arborist, engineer, environmental consultant, et cetera, but what qualifications does township staff bring to the table? The planners and bylaw officers are experts in planning and bylaw enforcement, not tree preservation, site development, erosion control, tree health, et cetera. They are not arborists or biologists. Therefore, to get to our point, it seems ill-advised to enact a bylaw that requires enforcement by staff that have no training, education, or knowledge of the issues. Learning on the job is not sufficient unless the trainer is qualified. Will the township plan to hire consultants to assist staff where they lack adequate knowledge? Furthermore, when a possible enforcement issue arises, other than clearly evident tree removal or dumping fill, how do staff properly identify the issue and advise owners of the required re restorative actions? The more details and requirements in the bylaw, the more experience and knowledge will be required by staff. This is problematic. Proper staff training is essential for this to work. Is there a plan for this put to put into place? Six, my last point is that we do not see any of the comments or survey responses in the agenda package. To respect those who provided comments, the public submissions and survey responses should be made available to council and the public before a decision is made. A list of all contractors and companies that provided feedback should be included along with all the comments provided. Important decisions should not be made without a thorough review and understanding of public comments. So many people spent so much time providing detailed and thoughtful comments and everyone should be able to review them to not only help with the understanding of the bylaws, but also help council reach a decision that can be supported by the public community. These bylaw drafts will change how property owners enjoy their land and we appreciate your time and consideration of the above points. We believe that there can be a change in enforcement and rules being followed with the right education and clarification on the expectations. We appreciate the bylaw officers need more tools in their toolbox. However, we oppose more restrictions as the existing restrictions are sufficient. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Okay, Mr. Sift, I have you next on my list. Welcome, Mr. Sift. Hello, everybody. Um, Jason Sift, 3687 Highway 118, POB 1J0. First off, I'd like to thank Council for the opportunity to voice my concerns today and staff for their efforts to put this together. I not only represent myself, but I represent others in our communities, in our community, both businesses and individuals. In a delegation in December, I made many points regarding the new site alteration bylaw. I, I again made more points recently in March. I'm disappointed to see that none of our comments or concerns have been addressed, and we are still in the exact same place, just more restrictions have been added. First, let's talk about the bylaws. We ask you to reconsider the limitation of a 200 square foot patio for a property with 100 feet of frontage versus that of a much larger lot. This is not an apples to apples comparison. Alternatively, allow a patio in addition to a sauna, gazebo or pump house, not in exchange for them, maybe on the larger lots. I might mention that losing the right of two of these buildings in exchange for the patio has never been in the survey. Please provide more details on how you'll deal with patios built prior to this bylaw. Site alteration bylaw should only affect the first 200 feet. Please reconsider enforce, enforcing this bylaw, not sorry, reconsider enforcing this bylaw to an entire island. This unduly targets island owners and it's not fair. Most smaller ones are not deeper than two to 300 feet anyways. Why is this needed? Both the site alteration bylaw and the tree preservation bylaw are gonna require studies and reports. Who will do these? Who in the town will process them? How much red tape is being created? We are all struggling to enforce the rules as it is, um, 
or process applications in timely manners. Another new one that, was been, that has been called financial assurance has been added into this new draft. The language is very vague here. We need to know what this will be based on. The approved site plan? Will there be an appeal process? Is there another example of something new? This is another example of something new put into the draft that the public has no idea about and was not asked in any of the survey questions in February. I ask you to please read through newly added items six through 10 listed in Schedule A of the site alteration bylaw. All I can say is, wow. I'm not sure if everyone here has experience with building in Muskoka. The ground is not flat. It is not easy to build on. We are not in Toronto. All these requirements are way overstepping. The tree conservation bylaw will still require increased accreditation for local arborists. Thank you for some relief in this new draft, but please lay out for me how town staff will define sufficient relevant experience. Is the town gonna to start an accreditation program or, or will they decide arbitrarily who's approved and who's not? Sorry for the sarcasm, but the wording is very vague. I could keep going, but with five minutes, it's hard. Now I'd like to go on to my last point, public input. I think the overwhelming consensus at the last few meetings was that more public opinion was needed before these new bylaws go before council for approval. Nothing has changed. How since March has the township engaged the public? We have expressed concerns with shortened deadlines, insufficient review periods, and inadequate opportunities to raise concerns and educate those unable to keep up with this momentum. Unappealable municipal bylaws that affect the permanent residents and cottagers require ample time to fully understand the extent of the changes. We only got the documents on Friday. In the last meeting, we were told changes would be made. Two months later, no changes were made except adding more restrictions. Since the meeting in December, the only thing that has happened is a survey. And at the time of the survey, we could not even review the tree conservation bylaw. I will keep asking this question. Are we going to governor, govern with the use of surveys? Is this the only means of public input? In our opinion, this is not an accountable means of retaining information that affects the livelihoods of residents and property owners. Bylaws and policies being presented on an individual basis cannot properly assess, be assessed without the bigger picture being presented. As the township is in the process of reviewing and updating the official plan, and with all the changes in these bylaws and policies, no one has the full picture of how restrictive it will be if this passes. Can we suggest making simple changes that add strong language to the already existing bylaws so that they can be enforced? You were all sent an email last night. In it, I demonstrated how hard it was to even find these new drafts of the documents. I'm starting to get suspicious as to why this is getting pushed through and why the public is not being properly consulted, both cottagers and residents. In conclusion, these bylaws have huge implications for the property owners. And in our opinion, it, is not, it should not be sent to council for ratification yet. Please take the time to get the public involved in this and hear the voices of all constituents. Please direct staff to draft a document outlining what the people want, but first we need to find out what that is. I know staff has increased, have had some conversations with the public over the last little while, but none of those have been public or, or not public enough that all of us have seen what those comments are. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sift. Uh, Mr. Clark, welcome. Welcome and uh, thank you staff and council for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'll, uh, I'll be very brief. <laughs> I think uh, probably mostly out of frustration. Um, I will say um, my simple uh, statement will be that I'm in complete agreement with Mr. Sift and uh, Ms. Brown on all of their points. Um, I will say that um, what I'm going to address is um, a little bit ironic. We heard from several councillors that our submission of actually documenting um, the tree preservation or conservation um, and uh, site plan uh, alteration uh, bylaws, when we actually put those into a form letter so that our uh, members could actually understand what was going on. All we asked them to do was to fill their meeting in and respond that they were in agreement with our points. I had several councillors come back and say, stop wasting our time and a form letter doesn't, um, doesn't have any impact or, um, or, or, or any weight in these decisions. The shocking thing to me is that's what you're doing to us. You keep sending us the same tree preservation and the same site alteration bylaw three times in a row. And I'll be honest with you, I think it's in the best intentions, but the fact of the matter is 
our members, and I don't think anybody in this township has the time to revisit these things three and four times to only be presented with the same document or a more restrictive document every time they get it back. So if you're wondering why you're not getting a lot of input, it's because you're right, people are giving up, you're winning. You're just saying, just go with it. We're obviously not gonna get anywhere. We can't find the thing on the website. Um, and we don't even understand what these changes what these changes mean. Um, my final point is gonna be, you know, we, um, we provided a lot of input based on um, input from people that actually do these jobs, work with these people that wanna build these um, properties, patios, remove trees, do all of these things. We're telling you what people are doing, what they want, why they want it, um, and it's not being reflected. Uh, if I go to somebody with a thousand feet of frontage and tell them they get the same patio as somebody with a hundred feet of frontage, they're going to do exactly what they have been doing. They're going to ask us to break the law and not enforce your bylaws. And, and it just frankly doesn't make any sense. Um, I've started spending some time looking at tree preservation or conservation bylaws. You know, Georgia Bay, the district, Bracebridge allowed 25% tree removal. We don't, we've already got the most restrictive tree preservation by law, uh, probably in Ontario. And we're going deeper than, than where we are right now. So I just implore you as we continue to go through these things, make it easier for the public for input, make these things more concise and clear so that we can understand them and don't need to hire a planner to understand them. Um, when you come up with a number like 200 feet, could we please somebody give us an answer as to where that number came from? Well, we think a fire pit's 36 inches and most families have eight people that want to sit around it. It could be as simple as that, but it's just a number and uh, with no explanation. And that's hard for us to sell and to go to our clients and say, this is what it is, instead of saying it's 200 feet, because we picked a number out of thin air. Um, so listen, I, I know you're all working hard. We're all putting tons of hours into these things, but you know, if, if we're going up for surveys and things, let's publish it. Let's, you know, it's, it appears to me that we're listening to one group and I know that isn't what you're doing, but that's what's coming out every time I read these documents. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Clark. All right, we're going to now uh, move on to Ken Pierce uh, from Friends of Muskoka and Susan Eplett from Muskoka Lakes Association. Welcome, Mr. Pierce. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Bridgman and uh, fellow councillors. Uh, I'll just start right in. Uh, Ken Pierce, Friends of Muskoka, 2232 Muskoka Road 169. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit different uh, tack than the, uh, the previous uh, speakers. Uh, I think that uh, it's time to move forward on, on these bylaws. Uh, they've been under review since December. They've come up multiple times before uh, your committee. Uh, there's been a survey. There's been ample opportunities to comment. Uh, changes have been made. They are uh, relatively minor in my view. Uh, a statement was made that um, there are new things in here that were never in there before and specifically mentioned were the tree preservation plans, the, the sedimentation control plans and sedimentation control measures. Uh, in fact, those are in the existing tree preservation bylaw and they're also in the uh, current site alteration bylaw. So uh, it uh, is a statement that is actually not accurate. Uh, we continue to comment within the time provided. Uh, we are uh, uh, quite prepared to do so. Uh, we've noted that uh, there was a, a response, an email from uh, Roger Oatley and, and we uh, endorse that. Uh, the problem is sugarloaf and sugarloaf type situations. Uh, the mayor has assured us that uh, uh, that would be show the sugarloaf situation would be addressed, and we would hope that council would do so. Uh, I believe council is running out of time with the municipal election uh, fast upon us. 
Uh, I think that uh, we also need to move on to other important bylaws. These are just the first two. Uh, there's also the site plan control bylaw and the uh, form of site plan agreement, which is probably even more important. And to get into this, this is not a permitting bylaw. This is not a bylaw where you're going to go and say, I would like a permit to blast my property flat or cut all the trees down. I think uh, staff has said, Rob Kennedy has said, there's been six of these permits in the last 12 or 14 years. This is not a permitting bylaw. This is a bylaw enforcement uh, situation for the sugar loaves of the world. Uh, this is where we need by bylaw enforcement to have the proper tools to ensure compliance for the people that want to cut and blast everything in sight. And that's the purpose of it, to increase the fines, to have set fines, and to also have the tools in the toolbox uh, and also have the coverage to allow people not to blast the centre of an island out. Uh, I think another point is that um, we wanted to tie in the definitions and that was a, a technical comment that we've made before. Uh, and I understand that the plan is to do that uh, in the final drafts. It's just a, a, a clean up type of matter. Uh, I, I agree that we need to have streamlined applications, even though nobody's going to actually be making out any applications, but they should be uh, uh, easy to fill out uh, and uh, there shouldn't be too much detail required. Uh, I think the one for the site alteration uh, reflects this. The uh, tree conservation bylaws, it's now called, I think needs to have a, a, a simple section. Uh, not only do you need to provide uh, your name and address, but some very simple information about the number of trees and the general location of where they're going to be cut down so that uh, uh, when people get a permit, they don't cut down 100 trees instead of the, the handful that they propose to do. Uh, the last point I'd make is no more Muskoka palms, please. please. And, and I guess the, the final comment would be, please get on with this. Uh, we, you know, the, the next sugar loaf is around the corner and, and we would not want to see that happen. This needs to be dealt with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Ms. Applett, welcome. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and thank you, committee members. My name is Susan Eplett. I live at 45A Walker Road in uh, Rosso, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Muskoka Lakes Association. The MLA has approximately 2,100 family members, which translates into about 11,500 people. Together with Friends of Muskoka's 4,000 supporters and accounting for some overlap, our two organizations together represent about 15,000 people. The MLA and Friends of Muskoka are aligned in our views on the draft site alteration and tree conservation bylaws you're considering today. I will be focusing on two sections in the draft bylaws. First, the proposal to increase the land covered by these bylaws from 200 feet to 300 feet and to all of islands other than certain very large ones. <clears throat> As you may recall, this proposal was a response by staff to the shocking devastation on Sugarloaf Island last year. We believe it will be very important in helping to prevent another sugar loaf from happening again. In the townships survey, over 62% of respondents supported this increase in the land covered by the bylaws. Some wanted it to be even greater. Interestingly, Seguin Township, which has an environment first philosophy embedded in its official plan, is also proposing to increase the lands covered by their shoreline bylaws to 300 feet and all of islands. Since many of the undeveloped waterfront properties in the township are on steep slopes, tree removal and blasting further from the lake will be more visible from the water than on flatter properties. Extending the bylaws to 300 feet will help prevent highly visible bare spots from being created on these steeply sloped properties. The province has recognized the link between shoreline development and lake health. The provincial policy statement has many policies to help protect the environment, including woodlands, and the water. The Ontario government's lakeshore capacity model provides a quantitative link between the level of shoreline development within 300 meters, that's a thousand feet of a lake, and the level of phosphorus in the lake. This model recognizes that water runoff from cleared areas within a thousand feet of a lake increases phosphorus levels in the lake. The District of Muskoka's official plan includes an objective of maintaining and where possible improving natural heritage features and areas as well as surface water and prohibits development or site alteration on lands adjacent to these areas 
unless an environmental impact study demonstrates there will be no negative impact. The district's protections extend 300 meters or 1,000 feet from the lake for lake trout lakes, which includes lakes Muskoka, Joseph, and Rosso. Rebecca Wilson, the district's watershed management technician, explained at the MLA's water quality webinar on Tuesday that some of the most important things we can do for water quality are on the land, because in Muskoka, the land slopes down to the water. So when we clear the land, we increase the amount of runoff into the lake, and this runoff carries with it chemicals, nutrients, and sediment that damage the water quality. So the province and district both provide environmental reasons that support extending the lands covered by these bylaws to 300 feet and all of islands. We'd also like to reinforce that extending these bylaws to additional land won't prohibit development and activity on the additional land. It only means that the proposed development will be subject to review and controls because of its impact on lake health and water quality. The second point I'd like to speak about is staff's proposal to prohibit pre-clearing a site before obtaining necessary approvals. Mr. Kennedy's report explains that pre-clearing has become an increasingly common occurrence within the township. And unfortunately, I expect most of us have seen it happen. We strongly support this proposal. We believe it is an enforcement tool that will help prevent illegal tree cutting, illegal blasting, and other illegal site alteration and will be particularly helpful when full site remediation is not possible, such as when very large trees are removed and cannot be replaced in our lifetime, or granite cliffs are blasted and the rock cannot be put back. The MLA would like to thank Mr. Kennedy and his colleagues on staff for the effort and care put into updating these bylaws over the past five months. And we are optimistic that with enforcement and meaningful sanctions, the proposals will help ensure that Muskoka is developed in a way that future generations will thank us for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eppel. Okay, so Elizabeth, I think we have Arnie Colson, Kai Tuckums, and Peter Cowan. We could maybe bring them in now. Mr. Colson, I see you there. I don't know whether you're connecting yet. There, we're just connecting. There, do you have me? There you are. Okay, thank you very much. Just uh, your address, please. And you have two minutes, so please go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Arnie Colson. I reside at 1461 Butter and Egg Road in Milford Bay, P1L0J9. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Committee and staff. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am one of uh, the owners of Colson Brothers Cow Service. My family has been involved in the uh, development of water access properties for uh, in Muskoka for over 50 years. And uh, we're very fortunate uh, enough to be sixth generation Muskokans as well. Um, given that I both uh, operate a business and live in the Muskoka region, uh, the balance of environmentally uh, responsible development and property owners' rights, uh, I understand is a, is, is a struggle uh, and an ongoing concern. Um, even considering my extensive background in local development, I struggle to understand the draft bylaws as written, and I'm wondering how property owners are expected to navigate these documents. Uh, these proposed bylaws have the potential to uh, significantly impact property owners. Uh, so I feel strongly that it's, it's imperative that we are, they are written in terms uh, that we can all understand, property owners, contractors, everyone involved. Uh, without hiring a planner uh, to, to help interpret or, or a special consultant to interpret. I think there's, uh, there could be problems with that. Um, the township already, I feel the township already has in place a, a community generally accepted bylaw that when properly enforced works well to preserve the area. I have concerns that the addition of further bylaws, more restrictive bylaws will dilute the existing bylaws and could potentially lead to additional loophole exploitation. Above all, I have concerns with the township's ability to enforce these additionally more restrictive bylaws. As it stands, I do not have total confidence in the ability of the township to, effic uh, to effectively police the current uh, and uh, implemented rules, let alone additional bylaws. Um, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, the township has no winter travel equipment to, to go to any water access projects. 
Um, they have uh, master boats and uh, a significantly uh, small bylaw staff. Um, Mr. Or, Mr. Or Mr. Col Mr. Colson, you're at two minutes. So could I ask you to wrap it up, please? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Just as a, I've got a number of things. Unfortunately, I didn't get on in time. Uh, anyways, I just, I, I feel strongly that uh, the best way to preserve Muskoka is to better manage the existing rules we have in place rather than adding more. And uh, I would ask that we uh, postpone this uh, for further consideration. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Hey, thank you, Mr. Colson. Uh, next on my list is Ms. Mr. or Ms. Tuckums, but I'm not seeing them on the screen here. Am I missing something? Mr., thank you. I apologize for that. I Okay, Elizabeth, are they in? Can you, can you hear me? Oh, no, I can hear you. Yes, I, I can see you now. Katie. Okay. Okay, I've got Sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, so if you would please just uh, your name and address, and if you can turn on your video, that would be terrific. Uh, and you have and you have two minutes. Perfect. Okay, uh, I'm going to be very brief. My name is Kai Tuckums, uh, uh, 1138-13 Ferndale Road. Um, the uh, kind of first part is more of a question to the township that hopefully can be kind of taken offline. Uh, I've been asked several times just about these bylaw updates. I've tried my best to participate over the last, uh, you know, kind of year uh, as these have been talked about, joining meetings, et cetera. One of the things that's constantly asked to me is uh, uh, there's a lot of feedback that goes back, um, but people just don't understand kind of who the gatekeeper is for comments that are coming into the township from both sides. And then what, what comments get, get, kind of deemed to be important enough to, to actually modify one of the draft plans. So I don't know if that there's something as a takeaway here that, that maybe the township can say, here's what we do, here's how we kind of mark comments as being valid and valid, and here's how it actually affects the next version of the plans. Uh, because it's just something that everybody's trying their best to participate, but, but you know, don't really understand how their comments are making their way into to feedback. Uh, my, my general point for this, uh, or for my comments specifically to the, the, the bylaws as they've been updated, uh, I just want to make sure that there's a, an understanding that there's a cost and an effort to, to these bylaws that are being proposed to owners of properties. Uh, uh, and it seems like the benefits are really going to be only if things are, are, there's compliance to the existing rules. Uh, and so the, the, the challenge I, I, I still continue to see is that a lot of this is new rule, new rule, new rule, uh, which is complicated in itself, but it also there, there doesn't seem to be a section of how this is like the compliance of the existing rules, let alone the new rules are going to be kind of administered going forward. Uh, and, and specifically, you know, how the township's going to process these additional kind of paperwork requests that are going to have to go into the township, but also on the, on the back side of things, uh, the compliance portion of it. And so I just don't want the township to get away from the important stuff on, on uh, the compliance side of things, which, which I don't think any of these new rules address. Uh, uh, and, you know, if, if we just had compliance with the existing rules, I think we would have a, a much better environment for, for our kids going forward. So I just wanted to say that those are my two points. I think I'm under two minutes, I hope. Uh, uh, that's, that's my piece. Thank you. I was just about to hop in. So your timing is perfect. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. And then Mr. Cowan. Well, hello again, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Council. Um, my name is Peter Cowan, owner of Cowan Tree Services. I live at 1106 Paul Maris Road in Milford Bay. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, there, the concerns that have been put, and sorry, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Mr. Kennedy and Pink and Ms. Miners for a, a great meeting that we had a very good back and forth dialogue after the last um, panel that we had. Um, the issues that have been expressed to me by um, customers, builders, private customers, and others alike um, relate to the policing of pruning. Um, I understand Mr. Pierce and I hear you loud and clear uh, with regards to please no more smoke palms. Absolutely, we are with that. But what some people need to understand too is a lot of the work we do pruning wise is preventative with regards to addressing the climate change that we were experiencing. Uh, all of you will have noted how many more wild windstorms we've been having 
And so much of the work we do with regards to pruning and whatnot is for prevention and safety. Uh, also, with regards to um, the implementing of uh, no clearing before a site plan is, or a site is approved, I appreciate that and I'm in favor of that. However, there needs to be assurances that this will move forward quickly uh, with regards to the approval for sites so that the, the folks who are going to be doing the building and construction are not left waiting, uh, sitting on their hands. That's been an issue that has come up to me. Uh, as well, the additional costs to customers regarding the reports and extra consulting that will be required as per these bylaws. Um, as any of these things that are being done on my end are taking time away from myself with my two little girls and my wife. And so, of course, those are going to be passed on. Those costs are going to be passed on to the customers and they are concerned about this. Um, as well as the understanding of extra work being done, as I said before, preventatively with regards to hazard trees and getting ahead of things. Mr. Cowan, you're yeah. at two minutes. So if you could mm -hmm. wrap it up, please. Yeah, as I said, that that is, I, I hear loud and clear both sides of this um, from both the Armaskoka side, as well as the other um, delegations that have been represented today. And I really do believe that there is more discussion to be had. I appreciate thoroughly the discussion that has happened at this point, the changes that have been made, but I do think that based on the wide gap between the two sides, that there is still a need for more time and more discussion. Okay, thank you very much. All right, that concludes our delegations at the moment. And I did, I know that the Muskoka Ratepayers Association did not delegate today, but I do want to, for everybody listening, uh, let you know that their main, they, they, many of their thoughts line up with our Muskoka. Um, they don't need, they, they don't believe we need these changes. Um, uh, one of the suggestions, which I thought was quite good is when we do engage Muskoka, state in the beginning what we're, what we're trying to solve before they take the survey. So I thought that was really good. And the rest was the same opposed to changing the, the coverage area don't want patios uh, regulated. And uh, they in their letter, there was a reference to the driveways, but we did take that out um, uh, upon discussion with our, with our group. So now I'm going to try, before we turn it over to, um, to committee here, I'm gonna try and, and answer some of the concerns that have come into us through, um, through our delegates. And uh, one of them was, how did we get the 200 feet for a patio and I'm going to ask Mr. Pink if he wouldn't mind just explaining where that number came from. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Uh, thank you, Chair, I'm happy. Uh, thank you for that question. Happy to answer it. And I tried to diligently uh, uh, jot down a lot of the comments that we heard. I'm happy to respond to a, a number or all the comments uh, that were made. I think, um, I think there's still, continues to be a sense of some confusion in the community as to uh, the way the current bylaw functions and the proposed bylaw would function. Um, maybe to start at the beginning uh, to explain the process, there's been a number of concerns about uh, the public consultation process and background and not having enough time to review changes or that uh, comments received are not resulting in changes. Keep in mind staff brought this update forward um, last fall uh, after uh, an initial review by planning committee, planning committee directed that an online survey uh, be conducted, a dedicated website uh, be hosted and the community allowed to review that. After that consultation period concluded, there were a number of changes to the bylaw, uh, or to the draft bylaws, uh, and a number of comments and concerns were heard um, and changes were made. Um, for example, I know concerns about uh, uh, driveway widths and other numbers. Uh, widths of um, uh, the gaps between patio spacing, um, the qualifications of arborists. So a number of those concerns were heard and changes made. Uh, when the matter returned uh, earlier this year, uh, the concerns were heard that again, the latest revisions, uh, the public did not have enough time to review those. So at the last planning committee, the direction was received to staff to post them on the website for 30 days. And I believe they were clearly identified on that engage page, very bold letters at the top. So the public had uh, an additional 30 days to review those. Uh, the changes uh, that you see in front of you today are 
quite minor, um, just really typographical changes uh, that we've corrected since the last uh, update. So hopefully that helps explain uh, again a bit of the background. Uh, with respect to, again, I think a better understanding of the bylaw, uh, I think Mr. Pierce really hit the nail on the head. Uh, this is not a permitting bylaw. It was never set up that way. It was never set up in 2008 to result in an administrative uh, burden or hardship on both the municipality and its resources, but also on our ratepayers. Essentially, uh, if a property owner obtains site plan approval, if a property owner obtains a building permit, they are permitted to clear trees, they're permitted to alter grade in accordance with that site plan and with that building permit. I can't be more clear with that. There's no requirement to apply for a tree removal permit or site alteration permit. That's how the current bylaws work. That's exactly the same as the draft bylaws are proposed to work. There's no requirement to make applications. I heard a number of uh, comments about new rules, new rules, new rules. There's essentially no added restrictions in those regards. If one obtains a building permit, uh, or site plan approval, they're permitted to remove that vegetation uh, as of right. Um, so the, the comments or the concerns, again, we heard a lot about the added studies and the technicalities. That is if a property owner needs to make an application to remove trees or alter grade outside of their building permits, outside of their uh, site plan approvals. And all that's been added to the bylaw is the ability at the township's discretion if an application happens to be received that we have the ability or the right to ask for those additional studies. To uh, the Ira Muskoka's comments uh, directly, I think they hit the nail on the head. Planning staff, bylaw staff are not biologists, we're not arborists. Hence, if an application is received, we have the ability to ask for those technical studies to review said application. That's all that's been added to the bylaw. It's not a new rule. It's not a new requirement. It should not be a new hindrance on the community unless they need to remove trees or vegetation outside of what the zoning bylaw permits. Nothing's being changed in that regard. Sorry for the very long-winded response, but to directly answer the question on where the 200 square foot gazebo came from, um, what uh, the background on that, I would agree with the comments we've heard. We do have the most, one of the most restrictive, if not the most restrictive, I believe in Muskoka. Uh, currently official plan policies and tree and site bylaws with respect to alteration. We do not allow alteration or tree removal in the front yard and stop. That's uh, where the 200 square feet is coming from. Uh, through planning applications for many years, we've reviewed uh, many, many environmental impact assessments. Those qualified professionals consistently and regularly state that the shoreline area should be disturbed as little as possible. But they do allow minor pathways to the water, airways, and small uh, areas such as that. So uh, the only really changes in the bylaw that are being proposed are in a way, uh, in essence, somewhat of a loosening in that currently, the bylaws do not permit any patios in the front yard. They do not permit stairways or walkways in the front yard. Uh, the draft bylaws propose to permit those and 200 square feet is coming from uh, the fact that our zoning bylaw since the 80s has allowed gazebos, pump houses and saunas up to 200 square feet in the front yard. Uh, that is a permission that's been long standing in the township and it would allow that small area to be cleared in the front yard. Staff felt it was reasonable uh, if uh, seeing as many property owners are uh, constructing pathways and walkways to the water and are constructing small patios and fire pits, uh, that we stay in line with those permissions that allow a 200 square foot gazebo. Uh, if one is able to remove trees to construct a gazebo, is there uh, any added harm to allow that to be a patio instead? And that's essentially where that, uh, that figure uh, is coming from. Staff feels it's a reasonable amount. It uh, doesn't mean that is the only patio space an owner is permitted. Uh, property owners uh, do have the right to construct sun decks and patios in compliance with setbacks outside of the shoreline buffer and potentially at a much larger size. But it would allow one 200 square foot patio uh, in the shoreline buffer. Uh, I think the, if I can with your indulgence, I think the last uh, one of the principal concerns or comments heard was in respect to um, 
what will happen to pre-existing bylaws and how will we enforce our pre-existing patios and how will we enforce that. Uh, that's uh, an issue that bylaw staff deal with with every bylaw change and we can't be retroactive. What I would say is the current bylaw does not allow any patio in the front yard. If this bylaw is approved, it will allow a small patio in the front yard. So we will not be laying charges or issuing tickets uh, for pre-existing patios as the current bylaw will allow them. Uh, oddly enough, the old doesn't. So it's more of an issue currently uh, than if this bylaw uh, was changed. So I hope that helps answer some of the uh, concerns and, and questions. Sorry for jumping ahead, Chair, but I, I thought there were a lot of questions raised uh, in those presentations and I thought it might be helpful just to give a, um, a high level summary or overview and respond uh, to some of those and staff is available to answer any further questions if committee has. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Perhaps just one more, and that was um, the process. When we get the, when you get the survey results in, could you just give us the what what happens in the back room before we get to the meetings? Yes, um, happy to answer that. So again, when staff return with the survey results, we do our best to summarize, and we can point to previous reports. Uh, we try to summarize all the comments received in a more uh, digestible type of format for uh, council. Uh, and I believe that happened in January when the uh, surveys were completed. Uh, we provided all of that input and as also the results of that survey. Uh, what staff is happy to do, we're happy as we do for planning applications to forward all the submissions in their entirety. Uh, Mr. Kennedy has a very neat and organized file of all the submissions received. We're happy to forward those to council uh, if uh, you wish to see them in their entirety, but we have reviewed those and uh, responded to them in subsequent reports. Okay, thank you very much. And Mr. Kennedy, maybe we can just clarify too that these, what we're talking about now will be based again on a complaint basis as far as enforcement goes. Am I not correct on that? Uh, yeah, through the chair. Um, generally, yes, it, it will be on complaint. Uh, you know, as as we know, a lot of the properties that are on the waterfront are, um, you know, you can't really see them from the road, so it's not like we're going to be driving down the road and peering into people's properties to look if they have a, you know, a patio that's that's there, or, um, you know, site alterations going on. If we see construction um, by by law and under the municipal act, if if we feel there may be a violation to any of our bylaws, we are able to go onto the property proactively. And, and just ensure that everything is, is, is uh, being done in accordance with what their approvals are. Um, but I would, I would safely say that I'd say 95% of the time where we're dealing with site alteration or tree conservation, it's due to a complaint that we've received. Okay, thank you very much. And I have one more comment before I turn this over to committee. And that would be the comment that the public has not been able to review this and look at it. Our Engage Muskoka Lakes page is terrific. And this is this is listed as a major project. And as soon as you get into it, the whole history is there. And there is a great chart on that page that explains to the layman's level, my humble opinion, exactly what it means. And so I certainly have had lots of public imp imp um, uh, response. I have 400 people on my newsletter list that it goes out to. And my, my responses have all been in favor of, of this. So I don't want it, you to think that I'm operating in, in limbo here. Um, as far as I can see from my constituents, this is the direction they want our committee to go. So I just wanted to make sure that, that uh, everybody understood that too. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you. I'm going to speak once and that'll be it. I'm hoping to cover a little bit of ground here. Um, if I were to vote for this today, and that could be well where we're going, I, I, I won't be supportive of uh, voting for this today because I don't, I'm not so sure it's ready. And where I'm not so sure it's ready is, you know, first of all, the, the use of the word Sugarloaf Island in relation to what the, the enormity of this task uh, you know, it's, it's almost like it's the battle. It's like the sword. Uh, I, I don't think that that's the way we should be looking at this. I think it's a much bigger issue. It, it is. It, and I'll go back to budget time when we had the existing bylaws that we are currently working under. Uh, some of us tried to uh, move on more budget, uh, more budget for enforcement. Um, we weren't successful. The township, you know, Rob Kennedy, uh, Rachel, they do what they can. 
this township needs to get really serious about enforcement or all these rules, these new rules and regulations are not going to be enforced. If you're waiting for me to rat out my neighbor and uh, have him get a $2,000 fine, it ain't going to happen to the extent that we would need to take care of this place in a genuine manner. I think the public needs to have a public meeting. I know they're after us. Uh, the way I see it right now, I've got about 15,000 people uh, that are MLA and Roger Oatley who want us to support it today. I've got about 5,000 who don't want us to support it today. So there's 20,000 people that are, are pitted against each other. And you know we're the, we're the taskmasters, if you will, that have to say yay or nay. When I don't believe this township has shown yet, I'm so sorry, I, I don't believe we've shown yet a willingness to actually um, walk the talk. So until next budget, when we actually do hire uh, another bylaw enforcement officer to give them a car, give them a boat, give them a snowmobile and get them out there and actually be proactive, then I think people are going to take solace. But I'm very genuinely serious. The public should have a public meeting. I would love to see the MLA, the MRA, the Our Muskoka, um, and the list goes on. I'm sorry if I've left anyone out. Why don't they get together and have a meeting? Come back to us using this document as a template and tell us what they see. Because, I mean, we're conciliatory. We're, we're all smart folks here. We, we want to get a solution. Um, I can't vote for this today. I just think it's... Uh, it feels like an overreaction. If people are prefacing this as the sugar loaf response, I, I can't be part of that. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Um, I just, I really thought, found value, as I have in previous meetings, what Director Pink, how he answered the questions. I, I, don't know why we don't ask um, our communications officer. I guess I'm going to rephrase that. I would suggest we ask our new communication um, person to listen to what David Pink had said and craft um, a, a letter, an open letter to the public uh, explaining exactly what David, so it gets out exactly what we're doing and what we're not doing. So I guess I'm going to ask for it right out. Why wouldn't we do that? Because one of the frustrations I've had, and I've had him for about many years before, is, it, is that I called it the dumb look when I would present to council and make a point, and they just nod, and then all good, any points that I had were not answered. Why aren't we put answering some of these questions and putting them to bed in a pub, on Engage Muskoka? So there's, there's my questions. I guess uh, I say uh, over to you, Madam Chair. Well, I'm going to let Mr. Pink respond. I'd be happy to have that explanation go on to engage Muskoka Lakes. Mr. Pink. Thank you, Chair. At the last planning committee meeting, I went on a similar uh, yes. rant. And uh, I think committee asked that I try to put that in textual form. And I did so. And that chart is on the engaged Muskoka Lakes page and it is attached to the current agenda as an appendix. So it's our best attempt uh, um, to put that in writing uh, and explain it. I think, again, uh, I think the concerns we've heard, and that's certainly open for debate. Um, you know, again, I think process wise, um, I've, I've tried to explain the, you know, really the lack of changes before you. Uh, what I believe is before you are discussions on is 200 square feet the correct number, uh, is 200 or 300 feet the appropriate number uh, to. Um, uh, to have the bylaw covered. Those are uh, changes and new, but in regards to the comments uh, with respect to Sugarloaf, um, keep in mind, I, I don't believe this current bylaw or the, the updated draft really will change anything in that regard. Uh, as I believe uh, councillors are aware, charges have been laid against those owners on Sugarloaf. Uh, they contravene the current bylaw today. Uh, I, I don't want to mislead uh, committee uh, regardless of what bylaw you pass, there will be property owners who choose to contravene them. And bylaw enforcement uh, can't prevent that uh, in every instance. Um, however, we will follow up and investigate and take appropriate action that we feel is appropriate upon uh, a thorough investigation. Supplemental, please. Uh, please go ahead. Yes. 
Um, thank you. I did look at the engage in Muskoka and I just actually went on it again to see what the problems were and it quickly found, you know, the, the current uh, uh, bylaws and the, and, and the proposed bylaws and such. And I saw the chart, but you know what? Maybe I'm a person that can't read, does, doesn't really see that in that chart, but I really heard loud and clear on your words. So I would, I would like that um, on engage Muskoka be written out and it's quite simple. Is it's it's it, you know you you're quite succinct, and that's what I'm asking for, Mr. Pink. Can you can you craft something for us for for that, or would you like to respond, or take it offline? If that's the direction of committee. I'll I could certainly try to uh, expand on the the current chart or or clarify it and, and post again. I'm uh, the direction of committee. I'm happy to, to try. Okay, thank you. I think more information is usually better, so that would be great. Mayor Harding? Uh, thank you. I'm going to make a couple comments, uh, have a question, and then a couple follow-up comments, depending on how the question is answered. Um, Councillors Abbott referred to this as sugar loaf and reactionary, and I think a lot of people are suggesting that and that we need more bylaw and we need more bylaw. I think the reality is our bylaw officers are doing the right job. Um, they are, quote unquote, catching the outliers, those people who are not coloring within the lines, who are not following the process. Uh, we do remember we had a bylaw uh, report, and I believe 97% of people were compliant with our bylaws. So people are generally following. We now have an incredible bylaw department that are I'm amazed the number of files of which that they are dealing with and creating enforcement and making things happen. So I appreciate that. So bylaw to me is working. I will also say, and we had this discussion, had it several times when Sugarloaf first hit uh, the market, that we need more education. We've now hired a communications officer to help educate about these bylaws. I want to thank and commend the MLA who held a seminar and was referenced earlier about a month ago, within the last month. And if I'm not mistaken, it would have been one of your largest attended events, more than almost AGMs and everything else. If I remember, there was over 200 people craving information on what they can or cannot do on their property that want to follow the rules, that want to understand. So we certainly need more of that education on what you can or cannot do. Uh, my question, and then I'll come back with some comment after, um, I believe this new bylaw, however, does one thing. And currently, if I have a dead, let's go within 200 feet, I'll comment to 300 feet in a second, but if within 200 feet, if I have a dead tree on my property, I can remove that or have it removed without having permits or fees or documentation. Afterwards, you may say, yes, it was removed, it was dead, so on, and we're trying to prove. I believe that currently the way this is drafted, maybe I'm wrong, that if challenged, we don't have to ask for a permit to remove it, but we are going to certainly have to provide documentation from an arborist or somebody that says, yes, that tree was deceased, was damaged or problematic and needed to be removed. Is that correct or not? Mr. Pink? Uh, through you, uh, that is correct. Uh, just one slight um, clarification, that is only for disease trees. I think, again, uh, we wouldn't need anything more than a picture if it's clearly dead or dangerous uh, leaning on a house. However, uh, again, staff are not experts. If an owner claims that a number of trees had to be removed because they're diseased, uh, the bylaw would say you should have received some uh, an arborist opinion to come to that determination. And again, you're not required to apply for a permit or to show that. It just happens if we get a complaint or are proactively enforcing and see some tree removal, uh, they would have received that uh, confirmation from someone qualified prior to taking those actions. So again, we've tried to make it mm -hmm. as uh, least burdensome as possible on the community and staff. So supplemental then is where, where I may go. And, and I appreciate that, but, you know, at the end of the day, people still, uh, you know, we have some pruning sections and I think the language says to make sure it's in a, appropriate pruning technique. I think we actually need to really tighten up on what we talk about appropriate pruning is um, and maybe do some more work on that. But we take down trees and trees die, but we don't replace trees. And where I'm going in this is that 
I, I'm not so much worried about a regulation that I have to have um, a documentation when that tree is dead. I can show a piece of dead wood or the hole in the middle of the tree before it fell over. Um, I think it's pretty simple to say that tree was dead. We, we're very tight with our rules. But what I would love to see is a replacement of said tree, meaning if 10 inches of dead tree comes down, I have to replace somewhere on my property 10 inches worth of new trees. Or maybe we do it as an increase and that becomes 1.5 replacement value to actually increase um, the tree canopy on our properties. And I'm not sure if that's happening or not. I'll, I'll park that as an idea and make a quick comment on the gazebo perspective or on this patio perspective. Personally, I don't believe a 200 foot gazebo built at the water's edge is the same visually as a 200 foot fire pit. Um, you, there's really no visual impact to that fire pit. Um, and I I'm, I'm think we need to treat them differently. I do believe properties are different. If you had a hundred foot wide property, I wouldn't want to see a 200 foot patio. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, is there the sliding scale somewhere between a hundred foot, like, and let's call it 10% squared. So if I have a hundred foot lot, I can do a hundred foot patio. I had a 200 foot lot, I can do a 200 foot patio up to a maximum of let's say a 400 foot patio, which then differentiates the frontage. Because again, if I have a 600 foot lot, I potentially can add a little bit bigger patio without having any negative impact as the only waterfront building. So um, I'd love to look at sort of that kind of an idea, but maybe Mr. Pink can tell me about the replacement of trees and uh, how we might look at that because I think he turned on his camera. Mr. Pink. Thank you. Um, that process you described with replacement trees is a common discussion during the review of a site plan application. And through that negotiation and discussion with applicants, depending on what's proposed to be built and the amount of alteration and tree removal on a property and the current state of a property, we regularly uh, have those discussions with applicants and require replacement. Again, the way the bylaw is currently set up, there wouldn't be an ability to require uh, replacement trees. Uh, we'd have to set up either through orders or permit process, uh, every tree removal to have receive an application or permit. Um, we could then get into that and I'm not sure if, uh, if you want to consider that given the, the related consequences. With respect to the gazebo uh, and 200 square feet, again, I, I don't believe this, in my opinion, is a visual uh, or aesthetic impact type issue. I agree the, the sizes are modest enough. It's not uh, a visual concern. Uh, the thinking was though uh, 200 square feet gazebo is gonna remove a certain amount of trees uh, and provide that amount of impervious area uh, on a shoreline. And whether that's a roof above a gazebo or stone on the ground, uh, that's again where staff came with uh, 200 square feet. It's been previously permitted um, and perhaps property owners should have the choice between the two. Okay, thank you. Mayor Harding, one more? Supplemental just on the replacement. And I appreciate when we get to site plan, we're asking for a replacement. Much of this bylaw and the general property do not ever hit site plan. And I guess as opposed to having to show an arborist report, it'd be really easy if I was to take down a 10 inch tree, which someone's gonna complain that I took down a tree, all I have to show is here's the base, here's the stump. I know I took down this 10 inch of tree. Here's the 20 inches of trees that I have subsequently planted. Here's how I've net bettered my property. I don't need an arborist to tell me that. I don't need anything else. It's really easy for a bylaw to come in and say, this was removed. And really, you can see a brand new tree planting that was replaced. And I think uh, that may be another path forward. And it certainly would help the overall environment. So I'd love to see if that as uh, potentially something coming forward. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. And through you, uh, I'm going to just change this up a little bit. Uh, you know, first of all, we had some excellent presentations and I want to thank everybody who did step up and contribute to this process for, for doing that. Um, I, I don't want to focus too, too much on some of the issues that I heard about process, the clarity of the language. Um, I, I'm comforted, or I'm, I, I have great comfort that we followed the, the uh, rule and the process has been honored. If the language isn't clear, we will make it clear or we'll find a way to communicate it in a much uh, clearer uh, way simply because 
um, the effectiveness of this of these changes is only going to be uh, useful to us if everybody understands what they're supposed to do. Um, I do want to talk to a couple of issues, though. One of them is the the overriding tone that I heard in some of the presentations and certainly in at least one of the written presentations that all of this has been brought about as a knee jerk reaction to sugar loan. Um, I can tell you, and I can't speak for everybody, but I can tell you for, from my perspective, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, this council, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, I think uh, Bob Clark hit on the 200 versus 300 feet, and whether there's science behind it. Did we just pull that number out of thin air? But let me just tell you to remind everybody that every person on this council was elected three and a half years ago to put the environment ahead of all other concerns. And quite frankly, we may have done a, 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 a poorer than average job of explaining it, but that's at the root of all of the things that are being prescribed here. Um, we, we have an issue that I, I don't think anybody can deny with water quality. Uh, and the best evidence of it, the, the most obvious evidence without pulling out you know, chemical te uh, tests, is the growth in the number and the frequency and the location of um, blue-green al uh, algal blooms. Um, we also have had a, a kind of a running spring runoff flooding issue, which is also a water is uh, quality issue or water quantity issue. Um, so clearly, uh, something needs to be done. We, we kind of find ways to explain it and understand it. And at the end of the day, we got to do something material to fix it. Believe it or not, the science, and there is science behind this, and I'm not a scientist, but I've, I've tried hard to understand it. The science says that our biggest ally in this fight is a healthy, uh, a sustainable, and long-living um, tree cover. Uh, the trees, you know, and I'm, I'm just going to bore you for two seconds. A typical hardwood tree, say 70 feet tall, and I didn't, I don't weigh these things, but I, I found the, the information elsewhere. 70 foot hardwood tree, 24 inches in diameter at shoulder height, weighs roughly 20,000 pounds. Half of that weight is water pumped out of the ground, pumped away from where it would be running over your shoes if you were standing on a dock in Bala three weeks ago. That tree pumps on average 100 gallons of water every single day. And trans, you know, through the transpiration uh, process, uh, purifies it and distributes it into the atmosphere. The other half of that tree, the other 10,000 pounds that is in water, is roughly all carbon. And where does it get the carbon? It pulls it out of the at atmosphere again in its normal life process and helps to fight the climate change that. Uh, I think it was Mr. Cowan referenced climate change. It's bang on. Trees are our perfect ally in the fight of climate change. Big trees, healthy trees, growing trees, not, you know, two foot seedlings, ones that have stood the test of time and have been standing for a long time and are actually uh, in the place where they can continue to thrive. So the trees that we have out here are doing a great job and they're working hard for us, but they're clearly not enough. We're, we've got a protection limit of 200 feet under the present bylaw. We still have problems. We can't seem to get ahead of blue-green algae. We can't seem to get ahead of excess water in parts of our water system every spring. And we know we should pull uh, uh, dams open faster and sooner, but the fact of the matter is, we're not taking it out of the system fast enough because we haven't got enough trees. We need to take and protect more of that forest. 300 feet pushes that envelope back an extra 100 feet. Is that the right number? I don't know. 200, it seems to me, is failing us. 500, I suspect, would be uh, outrageous. So I'm willing to bet that at 300 feet, we're going to have a healthier uh, system of trees ringing the lakes. People who measure success by the view from the canoe will be thrilled to see more trees. People who look at those trees as part of the solution to the climate change that risks everything we're here to, to defend in Muskoka uh, should celebrate the fact that there's more trees. Yes, it needs to be, you know, if it's not already clear, maybe it's clear to me because we've read it 50 times, 
it, it has to be made more clear, more seminars, more explanations, more whatever it takes. And the other thing that this isn't is a, is it really you know an enforcement exercise. In the perfect world, we should never have to enforce our bylaws. Uh, we would be able to explain them, and people would understand them, and they'd want to they'd want to comply with them because they'd see the value in compliance. And we'd never get a phone call saying anybody was making too much noise or chopping down a tree. Uh, I know that that's not true, but please don't mistake what's happening here as a irrational knee jerk to, to Sugarloaf, which was a, a well, which is before the courts all stay quiet. Uh, it's not a, an irrational knee jerk to that. And I certainly don't think it, it, it really even touches on the uh, enforcement issue that's being handled elsewhere. And that's something where we can probably continue to work on finding new and better ways to police and control and, uh, and enforce. But uh, for now, I really just wanted to put a little context on why I think we need to go from 200 to something more and uh, and preserve, use the trees that we already have here, make them healthier, allow them to thrive and allow them to continue to work to help keep the, uh, the environment clean. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hayes. Thank you, through you. I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach as well. Um, prior terms of council, when a bylaw would be uh, looked at or created, a group of public and councillors would get together. Um, we would have a Mr. Pink there, depending on what type of bylaw it was, but we would have representatives from the MLA, from the MRA, from the people that were affected by the bylaw so that we understood where they were coming from. From. So in the end, the bylaw was clear, concise, and fair. Now we're hearing from people like Mr. Sift and Mr. Coulson that the bylaw that is presented right there, they're having difficulty understanding. And those are the people that we need to understand the bylaw the best, because those are the people that are going to be dealing with the people that want the development. We need them to be able to articulate exactly what the bylaw can allow and does not allow. So I know that with COVID, we have been restricted to what kind of meetings we can have, but with things kind of getting a little bit better, would it be possible to get uh, representatives like, like Mr. Clark or Mr. Sift or Mr. Colson or Mr. Cowan in a room with representatives from the ratepayers? from the MLA and from the Friends of Muskoka and with our staff so that they could see and talk to each other and let them know um, why things might be, have to be done a little bit differently or stated a little bit differently or what we're trying to achieve. So that when you come out of the meeting, you do not hear the frustrations from people that I'm hearing today. Um, I don't think that this bylaw is quite to its, um, to its end game yet, so I would not be supporting it going forward at this time. And I would very strongly suggest that we, we do look at having a round table in-person meeting um, with all the players so that we can go forward with something that's clear, concise, enforceable, and easy to understand. Thank you, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of those who have provided input today. I know that all of that input is being taken seriously by our staff and uh, will, will be given serious consideration. And I think an example of that is the grasp that, that David Pink has of this task. I think he fully understands it. Um, I believe we're moving in the right direction. And I think we should continue and ensure that these bylaws get passed this term of council. And let me tell you from my perspective, I've heard a lot about it's a knee-jerk reaction to sugar loaf and so on, but this is my third year on council, three and a half years. When I first got on council, um, I was appalled at what was happening on Riverdale Road, because that's when I first saw the first 1,000 trucks of blasted rock being hauled out to uh, build a property that had been 
vacant there for probably 60 years. And I thought, isn't that horrible? But then that was just the beginning. Uh, then three or four other properties, the same thing happened. And one particular property was what I thought was one of the nicest places on Muskoka, perched up high on a rock, on, on a uh, rock, beautiful, beautiful property, tennis courts, just torn down because they wanted to blast the rock out. You can't blast the rock underneath the building. And, and that continues today. And I think that's what this bio is about, not about rock blasting entirely, but about trying to get across that that's not the type of uh, behavior that we want here. So I, I, I believe we should move forward. And I agree we should keep the public informed and there should be information meetings. But I don't think we should stop. I think we should move forward, come to a final draft, have information sessions, and get something on the books that can be dealt with by our bylaw enforcement officers. And if we don't get it right the first time, well, we can, it can be changed, but let's, let's move forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Shikawa. Thank you. Um, just briefly, I'm, I'm just going from my own enjoyable experience in other municipalities with their tree preservation bylaws. Uh, I'm gonna use Gravenhurst, or excuse me, Bracebridge as an example. Um, I, I did a few properties there. And quite frankly, um, staff met us out at the site. We marked the trees that were allowed to come down. Um, it went very smoothly. There was no issues. I had the same situation in Lake Bays. And, this has gotten very, a little bit complicated just because there's a lot of speakers and a lot of words being used. Just to wrap it up really tightly, I, I will say once a bylaw is in place, it's very easy for, for a, a, I don't wanna say a developer, but a builder uh, to just um, meet with staff out at the site and determine what, meets the bylaw and what doesn't meet the bylaw. And I hope we can get there because it shouldn't be as complicated as it, as it the discussions feel that it is. That's just my opinion, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nishikawa. Um, I think part of that was the confusion and the understanding which Mr. Pink's, Mr. Pink helped us with. Uh, Mayor Harding. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make a statement that may seem contrary to what some councillors said, that this is not a reaction to Sugarloaf. Since Sugarloaf happened, our emails, our bylaw, everything has been inundated about site alteration. So to sit there and say this is completely um, not even contemplating Sugarloaf, I think would be irresponsible for me anyway. There is a portion of this that's dealing with Sugarloaf because people have done certain things. So, um, I, and I don't have a problem with it being about Sugarloaf because we've had an idea and an, and an issue that has come to light. I agree with Councillor Jagowitz, we've all, and Councillor Kelly, we've all talked about the environment and everything we've done with official plan is increasing um, methods of the environment. Uh, and protection of the environment. I want to come back to a, a statement I made because there are a number of added costs and time and energy that we're going to put on the property owner here. And section J, the removal of deceased trees or stumps in accordance with good forestry practice, where accompanied by a professional arborist report is required. That's the only time we can take away a deceased tree is if it has an arborist report which means before I can do any work on that deceased tree, I've got to go hire somebody, pay my couple hundred dollars to get the guy out here to say, yes, that's a deceased tree. Um, so we are putting a ton of burden. Is there a big issue right now to are people taking down super healthy trees? I, I think the other way to look at this, and I, I've said it, we can net better the property. If we say you take down a tree, you must replace a tree. And I'd almost go to two for one. So if somebody says that tree came down because it was deceased and there was rotten, well, here's where I have done, I don't need an arborist to tell me that. I can go to the local nursery, I can buy two trees and I can plant them 
and get them done. And I think that is better for the overall environment as we move forward. I haven't commented on the two to 300 feet at this point. Uh, Mr. Sif commented that, you know, there's a lot of islands that are under 200 feet. So why are we really doing this? The flip side of that is if there's a lot of islands within 200 feet, it's a moot. So who cares if we do this? Because they're already subject to no tree removal. And at the end of the day, I don't want clear cutting 250 feet back or 300 feet back. All we're doing is implementing best practices to manage our properties. Um, I, I'm wondering whether or not to move some of this stuff forward if we piece off a little bit of this, because I'd be happy to move forward today a two to 300 foot across, but not with all of the other arborist reports and requirements and let our bylaws take into effect. But I would look at some kind of an automatic replacement in this bylaw versus just our staff requiring it in site plan. And I don't think that is onerous on a property owner to say, you've got to cut down a tree. We want you to replace trees. Really simple. And it's really easy to prove that going forward. So I, I kind of go on a simpler version of this to move forward. And as we get more complex, um, then we can have greater public meetings. But I, I think two to 300 feet is a simple way of moving forward. Mr. Kennedy, I see you there. My understanding was that they this wasn't going to put a burden on the landowner per se. So please help me out with that. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, um, as, as committee may recall, the last, uh, the last version of the tree conservation bylaw uh, specifically said that uh, owners actually had to provide the arborist report to us before they cut the trees down. Uh, and we've heard from a number of, of professional arborists that they said that would be a little bit too burdensome. So we changed that to say owners only need to provide it upon request. So if we go to a property on complaint that someone's cut a whole bunch of trees down and we and they say, yeah, they were all diseased, we say, okay, where's your permit, or sorry, where's your arborist report? They would provide it at that time. Uh, so yes, owners are gonna have to do a little bit of an extra step in that sense. The reason we've added that in is because, and you know, I've, I've, I've been here for um, pretty much a year less five days. And the problem that we had in regards to that specific situation was we would get a complaint for people cutting a whole bunch of trees down on a property. We would go out, and the exemption that we have in the current bylaw right now that says if they cut them down and it's dead, diseased, injured, um, destroyed, whatever, uh, and it's within the good for arbor uh, excuse me, just good forestry practice, let's just put it that way, then we can't do anything. We have to take their word for it. Um, there's, there's no way that we're going to be able to get an arborist report because the trees are already cut down and we're at a loss. And I, I can safely say that there's probably been a couple properties that we've gone to that they probably cut down 10 healthy trees. And there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to prove that. So that's the reason why that section went in. Um, and again, historically in the last year, one of the reasons we've gone to the 300 feet is we've received a number of complaints four properties that are within that two to 300 feet. Um, most recently as a couple of weeks ago, a uh, property owner cut, literally clear cut a whole property, but it was outside the 200 feet from a navigable waterway. And he was inside the 200 feet. I'd say it was probably like 220 feet to, you know, 300 or 320 feet. And we can't do anything. So that's the reason why that goes, that goes in as well. And um, to back up to Councillor Nishikawa, uh, with the suggestion that the that staff met builders on site, we have done that in the past. Uh, if we get that request, we will make time to do something like that and educate them on site about what can and cannot be done. So um, that that's not something that we um, that is new. Um, it's something that we've done historically. Uh, it's just if no one asks, then we can't really do much there. But if they request something like that, then by all means, we can make a we can make an appointment and go out to the site and have a conversation with the contractors and make sure everything is done in accordance with the bylaws. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think that answered one of your questions, Mayor Harding. Uh, again, just a supplemental, just to make the statement. Um, I appreciate that we're not asking for an arborist report only if a um, complaint is lodged. 
But anytime somebody takes down a tree, you must then have an arborist report or you're gambling that you're going to be in trouble. So we are putting that on the property owners. You'd be foolish not to have one to try and take down a tree. So our arborists are going to get super busy. Um, now I can't get one down. I've got a tree leaning across through the windstorm that's about to fall on my building. And I can't take it down because I can't get an arborist out to get the report ahead of time. I think we are causing issues, um, whether we request it up front, whether we request it upon removal, whether we request it in case of a bylaw infraction, they're all the same thing. I am going to need an arborist report to take down a tree. Well, my understanding was a picture of that would be just peachy, but um, um, Mr. Kennedy, you want to respond to that? That's not what the bylaw says. Through, through the chair. Um... If, if a tree is leaning over a house, we don't require an arborist report for that. Um, that's the, the only time we are going to require a copy of an arborist report is if the tree was diseased. That's that's what we changed in the bylaw. But anything where it's where it's completely dead, um, it's you know broken off halfway up, uh, leaning over a cottage, um, posing a danger to any person or pieces of property, uh, they don't need an arborist report for something like that. Okay, I'm I'm uh, going to let Councillor Edwards and Councillor Nishikawa speak, and then try to maybe wrap this up a little bit. Councillor Edwards, uh, thank you very much. You know, I owned a plumbing company, and everyone had to follow the the uh, the uh, plumbing code. And you know, I thought that was great because it made everybody on the same playing field. All a lot of the the contractors I've spoken today are very good contractors. It's the catch the fly by nighters. The guy will come in and he'll he'll cut it down and he'll say, oh, it's, it's disease or something like that. And that we, we've seen um, applications come in where there are patios down there. The companies know that they're they're not supposed to be putting them in. As I said, they're not supposed to be doing it now. And that now we're saying a uh, patio can be 200 square feet. So we're, we're 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 bringing in rules that everybody has to play by. I don't see a problem with that. And that, and if you're going to have a, a round table, as, as uh, Councillor Hayes said, bring somebody from the Watershed Council in, from the Friends of the Watershed Council, uh, the environmental people and everything else like that, because that's what we're trying to protect is the environment. And the contractors know that. Thank you. Hi, uh, Councillor Nishikawa, could I let Councillor Mazan go first because she has not spoken yet, if you don't mind. Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you. And through you, um, I wanted to go back to a question. I believe it was Mr. Sift had asked. Um, it was about the financial assurances section. And I think it warrants some clarification because, it, and, and I think it was perhaps added more recently. And I think that that warrants an explanation also from staff, if, if I may ask. Yeah, Mr. Kennedy, would you like to respond to that? Uh, through the chair, uh, the financial insurance was in the first draft. It just wasn't um, really described all that well uh, within that bylaw. So the sections that we've added for the financial insurance at least broaden um, how that financial insurance is going to be taken and how that financial assurance will be used uh, in, in those permits. But again, uh, as, as we've said before, like the, these are only going to be in the permit situations, which very little are ever taken out. So uh, we, we may very well not ever have to use the financial assurance, uh, but it is there as an option for the township if it is a larger scale project. Councilor Mazan, do you have a follow up? Uh, just to, again, clarification as I'm listening to our conversation today. And I am going back to uh, Director Pink's um, very good summary. And he started out saying this bylaw today is, is intended to provide more tools in our enforcement toolbox. And it would be very rarely used if you're following the appropriate building process. That's a completely separate thing. So this is a if site alteration happens outside of your building permits and your site plan agreement, correct? So I'm just wanting to be sure that I am clear as well as the public that when we see a term like financial assurance, which I believe extends not just to the property owner, but to anybody who is actually on, on property, 
and actually doing any kind of work. This is specific to any work that is would be potentially happening as site alteration outside of your normal building permit process. And I just want to be sure we're clear because um, I, that's why I'm asking the question. Mr. Kennedy. Uh, yeah, through the chair, the way the bylaw is written right now, the financial assurance would only be taken out if there was a permit for a tree removal or site alteration taken out along with it. Uh, so the financial assurance would, at this point, unless we change it, um, would not be used uh, in conjunction with, uh, say, an order to remedy if we had a violation uh, under the site alteration or tree preservation bylaw. So if I could um, ask for an example, because I, I've heard that this could be used very rarely, um, as to when we think that that type of activity could happen, um, I, I'm thinking beyond the normal building permit, the very logical thing that happens is the building of the sport courts slash tennis courts, et cetera. That's where a lot of slight, site alteration happens. So if you could just, even using that as an example, help us understand as council and as the public, how this, how this impacts each of our different audiences as a property owner, and as a business person who is actually going in and conducting the work. I see Mr. Pink has turned on his, uh, his um, yeah, you're there. Thank you, Chair. And, and sorry, Rob, I know uh, you probably, we haven't issued uh, likely an application in your time here, so you might not have any examples at your fingertips. Um, and as I said, it's it's a very rare occurrence. I think uh, Councillor Mazan, you hit the nail on the head of the probably within five that I can recall us issuing in uh, over 15 years, uh, likely to do with a uh, tennis court that it doesn't require a building permit. So therefore, uh, a site alteration or a tree removal permit be needed. However, we typically deal with those through the site plan process. Uh, the other instance I recall as an example, I believe it was a timing issue uh, where a property owner had contractors lined up uh, to clear a site. Uh, however, the building permit uh, was not going to be applied for uh, for a few months and we reviewed the situation. I think it was again a seasonal uh, weather type situation and lining up with contractors and I think we, uh, we were okay uh, because again the removal that was occurring uh, was fully in line with what they were entitled to do. Uh, immediately thereafter. So those are really the very small handful of situations where an owner would have to uh, apply for a permit. I just wanted to, if I could quickly respond to uh, Mayor's uh, comments regarding tree replacement, uh, just in case that uh, discussion um, uh, goes further, I just quickly looked into the Municipal Act and it's clear the Municipal Act allows municipalities to pass tree bylaws controlling the destruction or injuring of trees. And in so doing, we can regulate it and issue permits uh, and add conditions to set permits. So I don't believe the Municipal Act would give us authorities to force tree planting. The only way you could really do that is if you required everyone to get an application or a permit, you could then make it a condition of set permit. And again, I think we're trying to avoid that administrative burden. So unfortunately, um, the site plan process is likely best to deal with those situations. And I'm sure committee members recall through official plan review process, the number of properties that are going to have to go through the site plan process is going to be significantly increased. So I think that largely addresses um, that uh, initiative or thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Uh, Councilor Nishikawa, thank you for your patience. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to mention uh, something that um, Mr. Kennedy had said struck me. Uh, for example, um, having a staff member attend um, and be, because basically that's what you have to do. That is part of the building application. It's on the, um, on the form itself, similar to a septic. Uh, so generally, Mr. Boss always goes out to every property before to determine where a septic should go. Um, so it's that same kind of way. It's part of the building permit itself. A site plan application is not part of, um, or was not at that time. So we're, they still were able to capture the key 
tree cutting without having a, a site plan in place, for instance. So, in, and in some cases, it is just by the building permit. There might already be structures on the property and everything else, but they want to add something. Well, that that's that's when the staff would look at your proposal of, of the trees that you want to remove. All, that's all I'm saying. It, it, it seems like the more we talk, it, it, we're just going to put more complications in uh, or costs. I, I think the cost is really what concerns me because while what happened on Sugarloaf and some of these other larger conversations that we have really tend to deal with, quite frankly, people with lots of money, but there's lots of people out there that don't have the money to, to um, just always toss around. I'll just say it that way. I mean, we're, I know we're, we're losing, um, like what is the saying? If you can't afford to be in Muskoka, you don't deserve to be in Muskoka, which I hate, but I really am concerned about, you know, those other people that are, let's just say under 2 million that don't have the multiple uh, thousands to, to just keep paying out because, 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 because I think there's, there's other ways we can do it without imposing more financial costs on people. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mazan, and then I'm going to really try to wrap this up. Thank you. I did have a second question, but I did want to let this, uh, I needed to think about how I was going to phrase this. Uh, the second part to this is, as I've been listening and recognizing that if you follow the building process the way it's intended and you you have your plans, you, you, you go through the planning process, you put your building permits in, this, what we're talking about today, that is not likely to impact most of us if you follow that process. This is for anything that falls outside of that process. And I'm thinking back to, I think Mr. Pierce was making the comment that this was yet another tool to add into our enforcement toolbox. And I just think it warrants another explanation from um, Mr. Kennedy, I guess, as to what in this bylaw, what tools, what additional tools does he now have to enforce in those situations where people have altered the site outside of what they were permitted to be able to do. I just want that clarification and I think the public just needs it in clear language. This is what's, this is what we will be able to do now. Okay, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, through the chair, I'm actually glad you asked that question. Um, so with this, draft these draft bylaws uh you you will note that there's quite a number of additional prohibitions in section four in both bylaws i believe the reason for those is to be i guess more specific and actually to be fair to be to be clear to a lot of property owners on on what things you can and can't do so for example uh, we have a site alteration and tree preservation complaint. We go to the property and we confirm that they've cleared trees and done site alteration within 50 feet of the water. The only charges that we have to lay are you've conducted site alteration within 50 feet and you've cut trees within 50 feet. That's it. Um, so with this new bylaw, we have things like the sediment fence, which is a very, very common issue that we have uh, on a lot of building sites is one, there, there may not even be a sediment fence. Um, and two, there might be one there, but it's not installed properly. Uh, so that's one of the big reasons why that has been inputted. Uh, the prohibition for the pre-clearing has been another major issue that we've had uh, where we get calls all the time. And I think uh, there's one that just came in this week where no approvals have been given and someone has cleared their whole land before anything has been done. No site, no site plan agreement, nothing. Uh, so those are two of the major issues that we've been dealing with in the last year that with this, these new bylaws, it makes it so that we can be more specific on what the problem is. Uh, the addition of the set fines is huge for us. Uh, anytime we have a site alteration or tree reservation complaint that results in charges right now, we always have to do an information and summons and we have to go to court we spend money on legal fees um, and we get a fine if we get a conviction and on you go. Um, you know, the legal fees at some points may even supersede how much we get in a fine after everything is said and done. 
So the set fines for these smaller issues, uh, you know, where someone's cut five trees down uh, in, in an area that they shouldn't have that's outside of the building permit or the building envelope, that can be now done through a part one ticket where we just write it up at the scene, give it to them and we're done. If they take it, if they want to take it to trial, they have, everybody has that right. Um, and yes, we'd still go to court, but it's a much easier way to do quick enforcement really of those minor issues. The larger ones uh, that we see in the township, we would still proceed through the part three uh, information and summons. Uh, but that's another huge thing that we can, that we can use uh, in these new draft bylaws. Uh, the again, you know, the, the permit stuff is there to be used if it ever needs to be used. Um, but mainly the bulk of the sections that we're going to be using in these bylaws is the prohibitions in section four and the lands that are subjected in section two. So th those are the those are kind of the meat and potatoes of both bylaws. The permit system is there to be used if it ever needs to be used. And uh, the final thing, the offenses and penalty section. Uh, if you note, the current bylaws only allow for a maximum of $10,000 fines on a first offense. Uh, I believe it's the tree preservation bylaw that uh, does have the 50000 for a corporation. That has now changed in these draft bylaws that we can increase it all the way up to $100,000 on a first offense. Um, truthfully, will we ever get that on a first offense? No. Um, but it at least gives us a leeway instead of if there was a big problem, we say, okay, um, you know, a guilty plea and you take $5,000 because we can only go 10 max. Now that we have $100,000, we can increase that quite a bit. Um, and and that, that can be used as a specific and a general deterrent to uh, the violations that we'd see throughout the township. Thank you. Councilor Mazan, are you all right? Yes, I think so. Thanks. <laughs> well, I know you're all right, but <laughs> I'm okay. All right. Okay, so I believe um, what I am hearing, if I can wrap all this up, is this is very not used very often, but it's a great uh, ability to give our enforcement people more power to deal with those who are outside of our bylaws. And I would like to move this forward. If there's a little bit of tweaking that feels we need to be done, it could be done before before we hit council next month, if anybody feels that strongly about it. So um, if there is no more discussion, I am going to read the motion. Moved by Mayor Harding, seconded by Councillor Mazan, be it resolved that Planning Committee recommends to Township Council that site, site alteration and tree conservation bylaws, primarily in the form of those attached in appendices two and four, to report number bylaw 2022-04, be prepared for council's consideration and ratification. Do I have any discussion? Mayor Harding. Um, thank you. Uh, I said before, I, I think there are some things in this bylaw right now that are too onerous on the property owner. And I think we do need to um, have a little bit more discussion. There's no question that this council wants to protect the waterfront. There's no question that this council um, wants to improve the overall quality of trees um, and, and site alteration. I'm concerned, I can't support this at this particular time because of uh, literally I can't cut down a tree. Maybe the tree, as opposed to having an arborist report, maybe I just need to submit a picture to the town or have a pre-conditioned photograph. Um, but the fact is I'm gonna need an arborist before I take down a tree in any variety for the most part. And um, that's going to be problematic. You know, when you try to get an arborist, if anybody's had an arborist come to the property to do some work, you can be waiting weeks and weeks and weeks to get so. Um, so most property owners up here have their own chainsaw to do some kind of work. It's not always the big contractors. And um, I just, I'm concerned about where some of this is going, being too onerous. And I, I'm going to have to vote no at this particular point and i don't because there's a lot of really good in this bylaw that i want to protect so i'll leave it at that so mayor harding if mr kennedy could come back with some changes to that at the council would you be willing to look at that i i think truly and as much as i hate deferring things to bring it to council when it gets published on friday with 
contemplated new significant changes, I don't think is appropriate to the public. I would have changes brought back to this planning committee and happy to have them come back next month. Okay. All right. So um, I, I hear you. Councillor Zavitz. You're on mute, Glenn. Glenn, you're on mute. Thank you. I can't even run my computer. Listen, I certainly echo the mayor's comments. I appreciate his words. And uh, I do not want to vote against this, but I will be. So I would hope that we could defer for a month and uh, get a, a little bit better runway. A lot of people spoke today, and I think we need to comprehend and collaborate a bit more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, okay. Councillor Hayes, I assume that's already been said what you wanted to say. Councillor Nishikawa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'm basically what the two previous speakers spoke of uh, are my feelings, but I also wanted to have the clerk remind me if we did have the vote and it got turned down, when can it come back again? Madam Clerk, I believe. Oops, sorry, sorry. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay. I believe it's 60 or 90 days, but I'm going to check the procedural bylaw for you and get back to you in momentarily. Three months. But I will get back to you with the exact section of the procedural bylaw. I, I, th Sorry. I think Mayor Harding may have a comment on, on this procedural Sorry. part. Sorry, thank you. And uh to uh or clerk um it's once council i believe has made a decision planning committee only makes recommendations so we could be overturning a recommendation of planning committee i believe it's once council makes the decision so if council turned this bylaw down then it would be three cycles until we can reconsider a council decision but not a planning committee decision if i'm not mistaken go, go ahead that's okay. Okay, we'll try now. Uh, I'd rather get back to you with an exact correct answer than give you hypotheticals or maybes. So if we, this is determinative of uh, what we want to do here. I'd recommend uh, taking a five minute break and I can get back to you. Barb, if I may, okay. I, I mostly just wanted the rest of committee to be aware of, of these type of procedures because we, we've certainly had this at our district where something was turned down, uh, maybe not at planning, but at council, because uh, sometimes presuming that we've passed it here, we're gonna pass it at council, um, but, in, but in fact, it doesn't get to, to come back on the agenda for quite some time. And so that's why I was asking the question. I wanted others to, be, to understand why a deferral is more uh, beneficial, I think. Thank you. Right, true. And I, I believe that's, I'm quite sure that's where we're going. Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd suggest that you take a straw poll as to who would support this if the question was called. I'd like to see something happen today if possible. I don't think we should be scared of it. If, if we're concerned about that uh, procedure, why don't you just take a straw poll and, and then you'll, you'll know whether to ask the question or not. Okay, just let me let Councillor Edwards speak. Uh, I was just gonna say when the uh, clerk checks that out, also check out uh, the same as the district that two councillors can ask for a, a reconsideration if, it, if it's done within a certain time limit. So we would I'd like that uh, as, as well, so we know what we're doing. Thank you very much. Hey, Lauren, you've got your work cut out for you. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna take just a straw vote. Who would like a deferral? I think we can deal with Mayor Harding's arborous part of it. Uh, one, two, I, I, I believe we should leave this at planning to get it cleaned up before we head it off to council. So, um, Madam Clerk, do you need something more exciting than that for the deferral? I think, uh, oh, Mr. Pink, would you like to speak? Yeah, okay, Mr. Pink. Thank you. Uh, 
don't know if that was, I presume just the straw poll, but if the decision is to defer, I would respectfully request if committee could be very clear as to the changes or what you would like staff to do. I think this is the uh, third or fourth time we've brought the bylaw forward. We made a number of changes and addressed uh, what has been asked in the past. And um, we need just very clear instructions as to uh, what, uh, what specific changes you'd like to see and staff would be happy to make those. Thank you. Okay, so I believe in terms of the arborists and, and Mayor Harding's concerns about that, that we don't impose more on the owners. Can we figure out how to do trees that are falling down, et cetera, et cetera? Would, would you like more guidance on that? Would you like to ask a couple of questions on that? Certainly, again, I'm not to extend the discussion, but if this that is the main or one of the issues. Uh, again, the current bylaw would not require anything to be done. Uh, we've always given the advice to owners if a tree is clearly dead or leaning on a cottage, something to that effect, the bylaw is very clear, you have the right to remove it and we're not adding any uh, difficulties to that. We always advise them to take a picture uh, in case we come after, um, a picture is very helpful. We did add, again, that if your claim is that it's diseased, that an arborist report. Uh, I don't really know any way around that other than if you'd like us to remove that clause, it's very easy to remove. I don't know if we need to defer for 30 days to remove it, um, but it is, as Mr. Kennedy pointed out, somewhat of a loophole. Uh, any owner can claim that the trees were diseased and there's really no way for staff to refute it. Um, so this was our, I guess, our simplest approach to say that you should have an arborist report in your back pocket if that were to occur. Uh, again, I, I mean, we can certainly put our minds to an alternative approach, um, but if uh, if there's concern with that, it can simply be removed from the bylaw. Um. Okay, so I'm going to now take that straw poll. I, I personally would like it to stay in. Um, so can we see who would like that to stay in? Okay, we have the majority wanting that to stay in. All right, so now I think I'm back to perhaps we can pass this bylaw because what are we asking for changes? I mean, we had a lot of comments today, but I'm not hearing anybody wanting to change the, 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 the 300 that we're recommending back to 200 or um, the patios being more than 200 square feet. I mean, they have the right to put a big one up above. Um, okay, Mayor Hardy. Sorry, thank you. Um, again, I think the patio should be more of a sliding scale up to a maximum. Um, if 200 is the number, uh, I, I think that potentially if I've got a thousand square foot or frontage of property might be too small. Um, I would go to a maximum of 400 feet. 400 is not a large area if I wanted to sit in front of a fire pit or something down. Um, tree removal is always going to be part of it. Um, but you know, maybe there's another way to, when you wanna go beyond 200 that we do impose a site plan and we look at how many trees are coming down or something along those lines, then it's not just as of right, but they actually have to consult with the township staff or the building department even for that matter. Okay, so I'm not sure I'm understanding what you said. Your main, your main thrust is, can we do a sliding scale up to say 400 feet for the patio on the shoreline? as opposed to a 200 foot max, which matches the gazebo, which was the reason why that was put in there. It's, it's called tree removal at the, at the shoreline. All right, do I have uh, anybody who would like to see that move to a sliding scale of 400 feet? Okay, that's not going to happen then. Okay, all right. So um, I don't believe that I am seeing other considerations here that we are thinking of changing. There were comments about education, there were comments about how does it work administratively, but I believe that that's what this, this committee um, has received this report. And I believe that we can vote on that at this point in time, because there's nothing to send back to staff to change. So I am going to read the motion. Be it resolved that uh, Councillor Hayes, Yeah, I think a, a deferral, I was really looking for one uh, to give us a chance to speak to uh, the, the um, some of the speakers today to make sure that we've covered off all of their uh, questions. 
prior to it going through to council. Um, I don't think one month is going to one month more is going to change very much, but it may change the way that this is viewed as going through. Um, give them a chance to, because many of them have said, well, we've put through our suggestions, our questions, but you haven't heard anything back. So um, I would, I would please ask for the deferrals so that we have a chance to check with uh, them so that we can make sure that when this goes to council, everybody's happy about it. Well, I don't think you're ever going to see that happen, but <laughs> so uh, quite honestly, Councillor Hayes, um, they have been presenting for three or four months and I, I'm quite clear on what they're asking for, but they're, but, but we are not responding. And I, I believe that that is probably the major issue here. As Councillor Kelly said, this is all about the environment and that's where we're coming from. So I'm not sure that I understand what a month's deferral is going to do. And our staff has spent a lot of time with all of these groups already. So I don't know, are we asking that they go back and talk to them again? I, it was quite clear to me what they were asking for, but I don't see any uptake in this committee on, on what, what was wanted by, um, by our Muskoka. So can I get some comments from anybody on that or? Mayor Harding. Thank you. I, I would support uh, Councillor Hayes in a deferral. Uh, we can, number one, have ongoing dialogue with those people pro and con to the uh, bylaw as it's presented. Um, there are, I, I still want to go through and understand personally some of the requirements necessarily for a disease tree or not a disease tree. Um, there might be some conflicting language in here, and I really don't want to be debating this at council. I don't believe there's any urgency for us to pass this today to bring it to council. To, for this to come back in 30 days, to answer all questions, and then make a decision I think is appropriate. That's my perspective, so I spark Councillor Hayes in that. Okay, well, you have to come up with specific questions, people, that you want the staff to, to look at then, please. Councillor Jaglowitz? Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, I believe we should move forward with this today. And I think that as far as the last speaker, he's the one that normally always says if we're unsure and we need a second uh, a look at it, we've always got 30 days before council. So if uh, certain members feel that they want to consult or staff with other parties, changes can still be brought forward when it comes to council in a month's time. So I, I ask you to please uh, bring it forward. Councillor Jay, uh, I'm sorry, you, you're finished. Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you and through you. And I do believe that uh, staff has been working with the different stakeholder groups as noted at the beginning. Um, and I would just urge, uh, I, there are some comments, I, I, I didn't touch upon mulch and a few other items that people have brought up uh, in their comments. It's a smaller item and yet it was something that was noted. Um, perhaps staff would be able to actually engage with some of these stakeholder groups, our Muskoka, I'll, I'll just mention them because they did delegate today, and go through this again with them. To, that's the engagement part of the process. And then perhaps staff would come back with any kind of potential changes or amendments, if so be, at the council the next month. But, um, you know, what I'm hearing is just the opportunity for engagement uh, which obviously by extension is education. So uh, perhaps I could ask staff if that opportunity exists, if we were to move this forward to council, would they have the capability or capacity to work with the different stakeholder groups who are still feeling a bit uncomfortable with, the, uh, with this actual document? So if I think what I'm hearing you say, you could vote to move it on if staff works with groups between now and Council, is that what I heard? Well, yes, I'm just thinking that what I'm hearing as a discomfort and I'm having it a little bit myself, which is why I put my hand up for a deferment. It's not necessarily the content in here, but I see the, the opportunity for community engagement and by ex Is your magic hand working again and now it's turning your microphone off? <laughs> no, somebody just muted me. That was kind of funny. By extension, um, that is education. 
And I think that's what we're trying to do here. And so I just want assurance from staff that if they have the capability and the capacity between now and then to meet with these different stakeholder groups, make sure that that has happened, then we could continue to move it forward, right? If we're not hearing anything significant here on some of the big ones, like the 200 feet to 300 feet hasn't been a big debated topic, um, there could be other elements, so. Okay, so Councillor Mazan, I'm gonna ask Mr. Kennedy, I have to tell you that he and Mr. Pink have always been open to talking to anybody. So Mr. Kennedy, would you be willing to do that in the next 30 days if, if uh, certain groups want to come back and discuss this with you again? Uh, yeah, through the chair, I'm more than welcome to. Uh, if they have an opening in their schedule, um, I'm going to finally be returning to the office on Monday. Uh, so, but I won't be able to walk too far. So I will be available in the office uh, most days up until next uh, next committee. So I will be available if uh, any any of the groups are Muskoka, MLA, if they want to discuss things further, um, I'm more than open for it. Okay, that would can uh, also the MRA. Actually, I know you're open to discussing it, period. Uh, Councillor Hayes? Yes, through you. Um, I think you're going to ask the question and it's going to say that this committee recommends it. Um, I don't at this time and I would be forced to vote against it, but there's so many good things in it. I don't want to lose it. So I, I really don't don't see what a 30 day pause would be um, in getting this going to council perfect. Um, there are things that were brought up from the MRA as well as sedimentation, erosion control, um, uh, different things that, that were brought up even today that I'd like to have a chance to get to go through. And when it comes out of here, this is where we do the heavy lifting. This is where the work happens. So when it goes to council, it should, if there's a minor tweak, it should be because of new information, not because of an ongoing discussion. So I would feel more comfortable if it remained at council uh, for one more month. I know you meant planning. Uh, Mayor Harding. <laughs> I concur with Councillor Hayes. And, and I think, number one, it's, it's staff talking to the uh, interest groups in particular. But I think at the same time, it's council and this committee talking to interest groups, having the one on one discussion. Some of these submissions came in today. Some came in last night. We haven't had an ability to fully digest and have that dialogue one on one as to what their concerns or objections are or why the reason for moving this forward. Again, we have a tree preservation bylaw. Yes, there are some loopholes. We're trying to close those. But 30 days or not, and, and Councillor Ray said it, tweaks, a little minor adjustment at Council is why we would move something to Council. But there may be some other things. No, nobody you know, is really on the two for one. Can that be added in here? That's a significant difference um, that I think should be trying to be contemplated. I would like to have a conversation with staff, not in a yeah. Zoom meeting. We've been two hours at this at this point. So, you know, let's put a little pause. We are talking about some significant changes and let's make sure we get it right. I just muted myself. Um, if, if this is about um, pause or no pause, I'm gonna take a straw vote at the moment again. I'm not sure at this point, I see a problem with a 30 day delay. If, if what we're asking is that our staff and particularly Mr. Kennedy is open to discuss with our groups further so that they completely understand this, um, then I, I would support that 30 day pause. Uh, Councillor Jaglowitz? I, I, I possibly have a solution. Why don't we um, defer this and hold a special planning meeting ahead of our next council meeting just for this purpose to review uh, so it can go forward to council. I, I, that would maybe solve both. It'll move it forward and it will give time to consult and, and, and come forward. It could be a very brief meeting. Well, I, I honestly, Councillor Jaglowitz, we have so many meetings that I would prefer to leave it within uh, the docket of the planning meeting. And hopefully it won't be two hours next time because we've done a lot of talking this time. So I will not be supporting the motion for deferral. That's fine. That's perfect, perfect right to do that. Uh, Councillor um, Zavitz. 
Yes, thank you. And, and through you, I will be supporting the deferral. Thank you. Okay, can I see who would like this just deferred for 30 days and strictly just for more information for education for our constituents? That's that's Councillor Mazan's magic hand up, I think. <laughs> oh, and then can we have a pose too, just so our clerk knows what the vote was against delaying it? Okay. Have we got it? We're carried on deferring. Okay, so so um Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Pink, you're you're clear that we really aren't looking for any rewrite or anything at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I agree. That was a long discussion, and I know it's time for a break right now. So let's take a 15-minute um, break. We're back at 325.
Okay, everyone, can we come back? Okay, so we have eight out of 10. So I think we will start again. I'm sure they'll be back. Um, I'm going to move now to uh, item 12, which is our, our, our last uh, delegation that's come in. It's our unfinished business. And that is the Muskoka Trust, formerly known as BMO Trust Company. And Ms. Walker, I think you are up for this. Welcome back. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Um, the next application to be heard is Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA 52 slash 21 bylaw 2021-161 in the name of Muskoka Trust. It was formula, for, formally circulated as BMO Trust Company. The subject property is known municipally as 1038 Bayview Avenue. Bylaw 2021-161 will have the effect of permitting a proposed dwelling to be 55 feet in height where 35 feet is permitted permitting a fire egress tower to be 48 feet in height where 20 feet is permitted and permitting a storage slash utility building to be 26 feet in height where 20 feet is permitted. The application was originally heard at the February 17th planning committee meeting. Committee deferred a decision on the application at that time and requested consideration be given to the following matters. One concerns over the amount of glass proposed and potential light pollution, fire protection measures, servicing specifically on-site sewage disposal, a reduced height, or sorry, a reduction in the height of the proposed dwelling fire egress tower and the storage utility building, additional details regarding existing trees, including height and species details, and a graphic analysis of the as of right development potential for the subject lot. A full analysis has been included in the staff report, which is attached to today's agenda, and the applicants are also here today to speak to each consideration. The site plan and drawings can be found in starting on page 480 of the agenda package and no changes have been made to the requested exemptions. One additional submission has been received from Northern Vision Planning on behalf of the Muskoka Lakes Association. This submission was circulated to committee prior to today's meeting and can be read at, in full at the request of committee. I prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. If committee is considering recommending approval of zoning bylaw amendment ZBA 52 slash 21 bylaw 2021 161 staff recommend the following. One, that bylaw 2021 161 be amended to limit lot coverage on the subject property to 7,557 square feet or 5%. And two, that the subject property and proposed development be made subject to site plan control. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am sorry you had to wait until this time. It happens to us in planning from time to time. So I understand um, we have a number of people who would like to speak and do a presentation. So who is my sort of leader? Is that you, Ms. Smith? Are you going to welcome? Then perhaps I can just turn this over to you to sort of direct who you'd like to speak next and et cetera, et cetera, if that would be all right. That would be absolutely all right. We're very glad to be here. Uh, shall I begin? Uh, yes, please, just your name and address and that would be perfect. I'm, I'm Catherine Naismith. Uh, my, my address in Muskoka is 2509 Windermere Road and the postal code is P0B1P0. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Bridgman, Mayor Harding, and committee members. My name is Catherine Naismith. I'm an architect and I enjoy working for my office in the former general store and post office across the street from Windermere House. You may be familiar with my volunteer work with the Muskoka branch of the Architectural Conservancy Ontario, the Windermere History Project, and the Muskoka Built Database. Today, I'm honored to be here as the agent for the Muskoka Trust, applicant for the zoning bylaw exemption that is before you. The Muskoka Trust holds and operates the Miller family properties at the mouth of the Dee River in, in Muskoka Lakes. 
I'm part of a team of professionals working together to realize an exemplary project. I'm here with Catherine Miller and Thomas Patch from the Muskoka Trust, Eamon Roche and Steve Metzger of Roche Modern Architects of New Haven, Connecticut. And finally, Sheena Sharp of Cool Earth Architecture in Toronto and Perry Sound. Sheena is our expert on environmental technology. When we last met about this project, you were kind enough to defer our application to give us an opportunity to answer your questions. We are pleased to have support for the project from municipal staff and from our only neighbors, David Buckland and his sister. You may recall Mr. Buckland appeared at our last meeting to offer his endorsement. Since we last met, we have been busy preparing explanatory materials. We have also met twice with municipal staff, uh, Bryce Sharp and Caitlin Walker from planning, chief building official, Nick Snyder and fire chief, Ryan Murrell. You have all been extremely helpful. We have resolved the fire access route to their satisfaction. Staff are also satisfied. There's plenty of room on the lot for a conventional septic tank and leaching tile bed system. We hope to explore with staff other more environmentally sensitive alternatives for waste disposal through the site plan process. The order of speakers will be Catherine Miller to introduce the project to you. Sheena Sharp will speak to our chosen approvals process as well as the architectural reasons for the height of the house and the storage utility building. Eamon Roche will discuss visibility from the lake and the response to dark sky concerns. Steve Metzger will present two options that could be built without special planning approvals. And lastly, Thomas Patch will conclude with a description of the architectural process that led to the project and a video showing the approach from the road to the proposed dwelling and a trip up into it. As a heritage, as a heritage architect practicing in Windermere, I'm aware of the quiet way that the Miller family over several generations have contributed generously to life in the village, sponsoring many things, including the construction of the United Church. Already on their property are two landmark mid-century buildings of international significance, Landrust and Landfair. The project before you today is in that same tradition of excellence. Hidden in the trees will be a positive addition to the significant concentration of important architecture in the village of Windermere. By the end of our time together today, we hope you will agree. I'll pass it to Catherine Miller at this time. Thank you, good afternoon. I'm Catherine Miller, one of the five generations of my family that have been coming to this part of Lake Rosso for over 130 years. We bought this three plus acre site over 40 years ago and have been caring for the forest on it ever since. Could I have the first slide, please? With an expanding family who come to Muskoka every summer, we've been exploring how to build a vacation home that preserves this forest. This picture taken three summers ago shows the site with the existing boathouse on the left. The existing house is high on top of the cliff on the right, hidden in the trees. We have made sure that the new house will be hidden too, so as not to alter the forested nature of the site. I was a policy analyst for the US Environmental Protection Agency starting in 1970. And I've also worked with Environment Canada for over 10 years. So my part in this project was to study the Township of Muskoka Lakes official policy, as well as the forward looking Muskoka Lakes strategic plan and ensure that our design supports their goals. I am of course fully aware of the problems, particularly with the Manette site, and our family has been and are supportive of the MLA's efforts to ensure development in Muskoka is environmentally respectable and sustainable. The official policy vision statement begins with, respect the environment and maintain a high level of protection of our lakes and the protection and conservation of the natural and cultural heritage features. The strategic plan includes the same goal of pre preserving and protecting the natural and cultural environment. From the beginning, we have been determined to preserve our small forest by building on footprints of the existing buildings on the site, so as to minimize any tree removal and site disturbance. As you can see, 
This site is quite steep and heavily wooded with evergreen trees. So preserving and protecting the natural environment necessitates limiting the footprint of the new house. To do this means building taller. Our first step was to survey the trees on the property to determine their species and calculate their height based on their circumference at the ground. Section B of the official policy focuses on the waterfront and our site is clearly on the waterfront. Section B gives us some guidance. It says the height of any structure should be appropriate to its setting and terrain, including slope, tree cover, setbacks, and architecture, and generally not exceeding the height of the tree canopy. Last summer, we tested our height calculations by flying a balloon to the height of our proposed design. We found it to be well within the tree canopy, both in front and behind. The official policy also seeks to preserve the man-made environment. It says the development of waterfront, light, waterfront lots must be compatible with lots in the abutting waterfront area. By minimizing tree removal, we are not changing the character of the shoreline. Moreover, a larger house would be comparable to other developed properties in the bay, but would not preserve the trees. The proposed house remains hidden from view from the lake. It's also not visible from the street. There's one more goal we have for this project. During my career, I learned success in, that in success in encouraging change most often comes when you demonstrate rather than prescribe new ways of doing things. If people have never seen a different way that works, it is a sure thing they will continue to, to do what they have always done. But if you show them new approaches that work, they are more likely to change. So part of this project includes finding and demonstrating the best options for building and constructing the project and for operating and maintaining it in an environmentally sustainable way for the forest and for the lake. I hope this helps in understanding how we approach the project, the trade-offs and the compromises we made, and how we support and hope to further Muskoka's goal of protecting the environment. Thank you. The next is um, Sheena Sharp. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can, please go okay, ahead. Excellent. So colleagues, Steve Metzger, Eamon Rosh and I now wish to address the additional topics raised at the February 17th planning committee meeting and identified in the township's deferral letter of March 2nd. Firstly, to planning reasoning. We know that there are seeming loopholes in the planning act whereby developers show one scheme for committee of adjustment and a different one for building permit. The permit scheme meets the approval technically, but not in spirit, sometimes even the opposite of the original intent. The Millers do not want this to happen on this site. In order to eliminate this possibility, municipal staff have requested that a zoning amendment path be followed. This allows staff, staff to tailor zoning provisions to this project and not provide a blanket approval that could be reinterpreted for other schemes. The Millers have welcomed this approach. They understand that the approach reduces what can be built on the property and potentially reduces the property value in the eyes of some people. But value can be seen in many ways and the Millers see value in being able to develop their property in a way that protects the forest. Next slide, please. The planning committee has asked, if we could simply lop off the top floor, just remove the attic from the building as a way to lower the project's height. Let's take a look at the structural integrity of the building and how the building serves the family. Let's start with the family's needs. The family reads lots and lots of books, both in the living room and in the proposed family room or sometimes called the library room. They will have bookshelves from floor to ceiling. Like many families in Muskoka, they play games, tell stories, do puzzles, play musical instruments. Having two rooms accommodates two activities at once. 
Eliminating the attic would lower the building height, but it would also change the geometry of the family room. With the attic gone, the former family room library becomes the top floor of the house. Just like other floors, it would be under a pitched roof to deal with the snow loads that are, um, and now the ceiling will slope down almost to the floor and there won't be any room for bookshelves. The house will effectively no longer have a planning room. Next slide, please. What about the structure? In our first meeting, the committee asked, is there an architectural reason why the building has to go up as high as it does? And there is. There are two basic choices for structure of a house, a triangular shape or a square shape. If you use squares, that means you're going to have stresses at the corners, and that means the connections of corners is key to the stability of the building. A triangle is inherently simpler and more stable. Basically, the house is designed to take advantage of the geometry of the, the triangle. So where's the triangle? If you look at, um, I think there's uh, the next slide is actually an elevation. Uh, sorry, don't worry about it. If you go back, go back to the, the section, the, the house is the lines that show the edges. If you move in, there is a structural element that is a giant triangle. The main triangles are on the north and south sides of the building. If you look at the north elevation, you can see the um, you can see this form. The south side of the building will use the same system but modified to accommodate the stairs. If the attic was removed, the structural triangles on both sides would be compromised at the top. Instead of a triangle, we have a trapezoid, which is not as strong, stable, or efficient in materials. So you asked why the building needs to be um, built as designed and presented. The use, the tree-like appearance, the structure, the small put footprint, saving and protecting the trees in the forest, this is all integrated. The total design preserves and enhances the woodland character of the lake, which is so prized by the community. And hidden in behind the forest trees, it still beautifully accommodates the family's needs. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk briefly about the height of the storage building. Next slide. Moving on to this building, the structure replaces a decaying structure in approximately the same location shown here. The additional height is because of the slope that the building sits upon. If this structure was on a level site, it would be under the height limit by almost four feet. Next slide, please. This shows the proposed storage building. Because of the slope, the basement becomes partially exposed. The basement will house the site's fire pumps and is directly accessible from this structure's east elevation. Thank you. Eamon Roche is the next is the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Good day, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Eamon Roche of the architectural firm Roche Modern. I will be addressing the remaining topics contained in the deferral letter, except for the as of right development comparison, which will be presented by my colleague Steve Metzger. Please note that for the sake of expediency and clarity. Uh, we change the order of the topics slightly, but all are addressed. We are grateful for the opportunity to have further developed our design as requested at the meeting and as uh, subsequently generated by members of the township. Please uh, mount uh, presentation 02. I see that's been done. So we begin with the visibility from the lake, and this is very, very important, of course. Um, this study was conducted in three parts. There was a balloon test performed. There was a computer rendering a view from the lake. And finally, we have a summer winter tree screening analysis. Next slide, please. Um, right, so for, for context here, we reference section B of the 2013 official plan, and that was previously quoted in part by Catherine Miller. Next slide, please. Relative to the proposed height of the structure, observations were made using a balloon test set at 55 feet above the finished grade of the proposed home site. This uh, demonstrated that the home would fit within the existing tree canopy. 
In this aerial view, we have located the three viewpoints that we are going to show you, and they are designated on this view by colored shapes. As well, we have the viewpoint for the view from the lake computer image study, and that is designated by an X in blue that you can see. Um, also, of course, do note the subject property outlined in red. So we'll move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So these three photographs on the left show the three viewpoints with the yellow 55 foot high balloon, very well screened by the existing canopy. And if you look closely, you can see that yellow balloon um, in those three images on the left. The photograph on the right is the existing site with the existing home only partially visible on its ground level. Um, if you can peek into the understory there, perhaps you can see it. Next slide, please. Uh, now we turn to the computational study of the view from the lake. Next slide, please. So here we're going to that X vantage point we showed earlier. And on the left, we see again the existing view. And the middle image shows the computer rendering of the house at scale and located on the existing foundation. The image on the right has the simulated house inserted into the photograph, showing that the resultant screening of the proposed structure would be very similar to the existing structure. And you can see that by looking at the left side and then again at the right side. Uh, next slide, please. Here we see the 55 foot high balloon referenced on the photograph demonstrating the relationship between the tree canopy and the upper stories of the proposed home. Next slide, please. We now move on to our study taking into account any seasonal effect on the tree canopy. Next slide, please. And the inputs that we used were our comprehensive survey of the existing trees on the site, documented by location, species, and size. Within 100 feet of the lake, where it matters most, fully 96% of the trees are evergreens. Next slide, please. Therefore, the summer screening and the winter screening of the canopy are, for all intents and purposes, practically identical. Uh, and you can see that in the upper left-hand image and the lower right-hand image. Next slide, please. F finally, on this topic, this wintertime aerial view shows the full canopy and concludes our understanding that at all times of the year, the conifers will continue to screen the home. And please now mount presentation 03. Addressing dark sky and the impact of light visibility. On this subject, we have several ways to address the south facing glazing at the rear of the house. We note that any light pollution would be lessened by the sighting of the glazed stair as it faces not the lake, but the rising topography that sits behind it. Uh, further, we will be investigating treatments such as electrochromic glass, automated shades, custom lighting and custom lighting controls to fully adhere to dark sky standards as concerns this feature of the house. We note that the egress stair is not lit except in case of emergency. I will now turn the conversation over to Stephen Metzger for an in-depth look at the final topic raised, the as of right development comparison. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. My name is Steve Metzger from Most Modern Architects. The following is a graphic analysis comparing the 1038 Bayview proposal to as of right diagrams for a single and a subdivided lot. Note that this comparison was specifically requested by the planning committee. It is not a proposal being considered by the owner. Next page. We will first look at the 1038 Bayview proposal. Next, please. This site plan compares three categories with the as of right diagrams, lot coverage percentage. The 1038 proposal lot coverage provided is 2% versus 15% allowable. Habitable gross area, the maximum habitable allowable floor area is 7,500 square feet. 1038 proposal has 4,000 square feet, 53% of the allowable. 31 trees are removed. The dashed red circles show the location of the removed trees. Note the red section line BB from the lake to the site's highest point. Next page, please. This is section BB. The center right of the page, the 1038 dwelling is shown. The proposal is screened by the trees and is sited well below the tree canopy. Further up the hill are the water tower and photovoltaic array. Elevation 827 is the highest site point. 
Next, please. We now look at the as of right single lot comparison. Next. This is the site area, same site area as the 1038 proposal. Note the 25 foot tree protection zone along the lake. Next page, please. As the right, as of right single lot site plan shows, the dwelling accessory building, sun deck and new boathouse. The lot coverage provided is 8.5%, 15% is the maximum. Habitable gross area is the maximum allowed 7,500 square feet. More than 250 trees removed for view, site setback, fire setback, and fire equipment access. Fire access on all four sites is required when gross floor area is greater than 600 square meters. Next page, please. This again is section BB. 1038 project is shown for the height comparison to the as of right dwelling sited near the top of the hill on the left side of the page. The as of right dwelling ground floor is at elevation 820 plus 35 feet as of right height equals elevation 855, which is 10 feet higher in elevation than the 1038 proposal. Note the horizontal height line between the as of right dwelling and the 1038 proposal. This shows the 10 foot height difference. Next page, please. The second as right diagram is the subdivided lot comparison. Next, please. The drawing shows the subdivided lot A and lot B. Each has a 15% maximum lot coverage. Next page. Note the dwelling, accessory buildings, sun deck, and new boathouse for each lot. Two separate roads, access roads with fire truck turnarounds are shown. The lot coverage provided is 13.5 for lot A and 14.8% for lot B. Habitable gross floor area is the maximum allowed 7,500 for each lot. More than 350 trees are removed. Next page. The last two pages show 1038 Bayview proposal compared to the as of right single lot and then the as of right subdivided lot. Next. 1038 proposal with 2% lot coverage and 31 trees removed on the left is compared to the as of right single lot on the right with 8.5% lot coverage and more than 215 trees removed. Next, please. The final comparison shows 1038 proposal compared to the as of right subdivided lot with 14.2% lot coverage and more than 350 trees removed. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Naismith, I think you said there was a video too, did you? Uh, I'm, uh, my name's Thomas Patch, and oh. I'm going to uh, take you through it. We, we, need the, we need the last slide to start. Sorry, you mean the one that we just showed with the comparison? Yeah. Okay, just give us a second. We'll get it back up for you. Okay. There we are. That's great. Okay, Chair Bridgman, committee and staff. And the staff has been outstanding helping us with this. My name is Thomas Patch, I'm an architect. Catherine Miller is my sainted wife, and my job is to make people happy, and that includes all of you. Our design process began from two points of view, what the client needs and what the site requires. The program for the Miller family includes the rooms on plans you already have for a vacation home for families with children. The site, however, is a challenge. Starting from a west-facing 40-foot granite cliff, the property is rocky and steep with outcrops of rock-hard ledge that cascade down toward the north to the lake. The key to building on the property turns out to lie in the ruins of a small cabin on a 20 by 40-foot masonry foundation in a, in a grove of pines and hemlocks. The design became a quest to find a way to fit the new house on the old foundation in the middle of the grove without having to decimate the forest 
by clear cutting trees as required for a 7,500 square foot house. Going small with this simple idea, the possibility of a smaller house of 4,000 square feet announced itself. It took the form of a tree surrounded by the grove of pines. While this train a change does reduce the area of the house, it also saves the grove as a perfect screen to hide the house and it preserves the natural forest shoreline of the lake. I have a question. Has anyone here visited the site? Okay, the land there is pretty steep and walking the site can be tricky business. So if you do visit, please be careful out there. And now please start the video. Let's take a walk. We'll start at the driveway entrance off Bayview Avenue. We're gonna visit the design of the house in the virtual world of architects at work. We'll turn the corner And there it is. This is the only place you can see the new building from top to bottom. The main stair of the house is on the south side on the left. Let's go in the kitchen door, turn left and go up that main stair. The second floor has the master and guest bedrooms. And up to the third floor are the children's bedrooms. We'll have a look at one. You can catch your breath from climbing stairs and look out the west window. Now you're facing the lake, but you cannot see it through the trees and those on the lake cannot see you either. As we continue up, we're gonna pass what others call the family room, but I call it the library. Catherine's lookout is coming up on the left. It's a corner bay that pushes out an extra two feet from beyond the rest of the main stair enclosure. We're well above the forest, looking into high whispering pines. We've discovered a whole new perspective on forest life, and we've found a neat place to read a book. The stair continues up to the attic. The attic helps make the smaller house work for a big family. Some storage space will be needed in there, but that room is more than just a closet. Somewhere inside, this home needs a quiet, private place and individuals retreat away from the crowd. Remember when I said the architect's job is to make people happy? Well, the basement won't do it, but the top, the room at the top is a refuge in waiting. It brings essential harmony to a shared resource for the family. And those pines? Those pines will reach 100 feet by the time your children's children marry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patch. Um, we actually can't just go on properties. Just in answer to your question, if anybody's been on the property, if you tell us we can, we can. Otherwise, you be, be our guest, but do be careful. <laughs> and yeah. I'll put it in writing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you very much for that presentation. And the, um, the, the video was uh, really interesting to see. It does bring a perspective that was hard to imagine from where I sit. So, so, all right. So committee, um, as th this is a returning, returning item, I'm going to open this up for discussion at this point. Oh, there's one more. Sorry? 
Oh, he was on. Sorry, I gather Mr. Fawner's coming in. Forgive me. It's getting, getting late. Hi again, Mr. Fawner. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Bridgman and members of committee. Uh, it's uh, Steve Fawner, Northern Vision Planning Limited, 109 Meadow Heights Drive, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1A4. And I'm here today representing the Muskoka Lakes Association and uh, hopefully some committee members, uh, if not all, had an opportunity to review my letter, um, letter of objection uh, for the MLA. I uh, just wanted to point out a few things. I, I think certainly there's been considerable amount of work done on this uh, project. There's absolutely no doubt about that. It's probably the biggest team I've seen put forward uh, an application uh, of this nature. Uh, and I've certainly been around here and dealt with lots of applications in the past. But uh, so certainly commend them for, uh, for that uh, uh, portion of it. Um, I would have to say, though, I'm not going to go through my letter per se. Um, there is, in my opinion, enough policy basis to either deny the application or uh, request significant modification. There are policies in the official plan that actually says that the waterfront lots within communities are to be compatible with those in the surrounding waterfront area. And certainly you wouldn't see a, a building of this height at all uh, within the waterfront designation. And in fact, I had one on Jackson Island where the very small top of it was um, removed, if you will, by uh, committee and council. They did not approve it. Uh, very similar in this case, it was 42 feet in height and it was only 128 square feet uh, of uh, building and that was uh, uh, denied. Here we're talking 55 feet. Yes, we're in the community where you could potentially consider higher heights. So I would suggest that what I had was uh, of uh, similar uh, scale, if you will, to this particular application. Uh, I would say that, you know, you must stay within the framework of the official plan, and I do believe that this application does go beyond the scope of the official plan of what it would normally consider. Um, when you have a property and going by the elevation drawings. Mr. Uh, Fawner, it, uh, Mr. Fawner, forgive me, but you are at two minutes. Okay, all righty, I'll quickly go ahead. Um, it does, there is a policy. <laughs> you, yeah, if you could wrap it up, actually. <laughs> yeah, Please. okay. The th last thing I'll mention, the zoning bylaw is deemed to conform to the official plan and that maximum height is 35 feet because the tree canopy has been mentioned, but that's been implemented by a 35 foot high maximum height. And that's deemed to conform with the OP. So, and again, I don't believe that an environmental dwelling needs to be 55 feet in height. It could be done in, in less than that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, would would uh, Ms. Naismith, you would you like to respond to that, or can I turn it over to committee now? Uh, with your with your permission, uh, Catherine Miller has drafted a response to Mr. Fawner's letter. If Catherine could deliver it, that would we'd be appreciated. That please go ahead, uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you. When Mr. Fawner informed us that he'd been retained by the MLA, we did invite him to come to the site, but he declined. As a result, it seems he has some serious misconceptions about the location, the character of the site, as well as the proposal. Generally speaking, he says it's not compatible with the Muskoka Lakes policy concerning the preservation of the natural site and the man-made environment. In, in this meeting, as well as the February 17th meeting, we have shown that the natural site along the lake shore is unchanged with our proposal. We minimize any removal of trees and other site disturbance by building on the footprint of the existing buildings on the site. As to the man-made environment, he states, the Windermere House defines the village as low rise residences. Our site is located two kilometers from the Windermere House in the third bay to the north. It has a very different character than the Windermere proper. There are spacious slots with large houses steep cliffs that are densely wooded. And again, I say, we are not changing this shoreline. He also states that the official policy is silent on height. Not exactly, as I mentioned, it needs to be with generally not exceeding the height of the tree canopy. And this is exactly what we have achieved with this project. Mr. Fauner states in his opinion, when consider 
when constructing on a level or fairly level site, the height provisions of the zoning law can be complied with. He goes on to say that in the past, significant height exemptions were only provided when there was a terrain constraint, such as a steep slope, which resulted in a height exemption for the dwelling. We agree and we believe this statement makes our case for us. The total rise on the site is 87 feet. Our dwelling is 50 feet above the lake. The footprint of the puzzle itself has a grade change of eight feet, which is the height of one floor. In conclusion, this project will not change the character of the bay on Lake Rosso. We are very much in support of the MLA's efforts toward the future sustainability of the Muskoka region and feel that we have found a way to do this on such a unique site. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, all right, I'm going to turn this back over to committee now. Um, committee, comments, questions, uh, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you, it's such an incredible group of uh, people making the presentation, thank you. Uh, very well done. Um, I'm going to go back to when we deferred this and uh, the, the two things that were my, you know, where I was leaning in terms of deferral was simply um, the height piece. Uh, both uh, height elements uh, on the dwelling height and on the accessory structure, uh, for some reason you came back, well, I, I guess there shouldn't be for some reason, but the reason obviously is this beautiful architectural um, design would be altered significantly if you were to uh, uh, revise and amend it to what are our rules. And so I, I'm really torn here because uh, given uh, the, the distance between your 55 and our 35, I, I don't know where to go with that. I would have a real problem um, looking anyone else in the eye that we've, and we have had some, uh, we've had a very recent one very close to this, um, unfortunately, uh, unless there's a way that's either staff who have changed it to a proposal uh, of acceptance, if you will, and staff wants to chime in there, I would love to hear something on that, and, and, or, or yourselves in terms of why this uh, is outside, way outside our box. Uh, you know, in terms of the tree, uh, the tree uh, crown, if you will, um, I don't know how that ever gets into this discussion because quite honestly, the trees are the trees. We have rules and the rules are based on 35 feet and uh, wherever the tree goes, it goes. So I don't know how we can say, oh, this is great that we're underneath the, the tree cover. So anyway, all that having been said, I I'm gonna need some convincing here uh, if I'm gonna support this, thank you. So Councillor Zavitz, um, are you asking staff to explain why they've they said it could be approved? And then are you asking well, um, Ms. Miller and Mr. Patch why they've maintained the height? I all of that. Thank you for that. I, I, I guess I've laid it out there. Uh, if people want to answer it or perhaps some of the other councillors have uh, uh, like questions. I mean, it's, this is going to come down to taking our temperature on the height. Let's be honest. Okay, so maybe I could start, Ms. Walker, with the with the um, recommending approval. Or Mr. Sharp, there's Mr. Sharp. Mr. Sharp, could you give us some background on that, please? Sure. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and thank you for your uh, your question, Councillor Zavitz. Um, we did have extensive discussions with the applicants. I believe we actually had two meetings with uh, multiple staff members attending and their uh, design team. And, uh, you know, we did discuss um, committee's considerations related to a reduction in height and the response uh, from the team was simply no, that that's not something that they would be would be willing willing to do. And of course, um, you know, staff aren't the gatekeepers, so to speak, of, of applications and we've returned the matter for your um, consideration. I think there's a, a few things uh, to note specifically relating to our um, recommendation. Um, in the community's uh, designation, there is a fairly significant uh, increased coverage allowance as compared to what would be um, permitted in a waterfront residential uh, zone. Um, for example, in this case, I believe um, the maximum lot coverage amount is 15%, whereas in the waterfront residential zone, it's 10%. Um, and I think the, the applicants have, have done um, 
what committee asked for in the sense that they've provided you with some examples of what uh, some development scenarios, some alternative development as of right scenarios would look like relative to what it is um, that they're proposing to do, which is really, I think it's sort of underscores uh, longstanding um, arguments in the township about the benefits of building up versus out and um, you know the environmental uh, benefits or implications of, of those two uh, um, approaches which are sort of on opposite ends of uh, the spectrum. But with respect to our um, recommendation, we've um, recommended that lot coverage on the lot be limited to 5%. And I think, you know, the, the scenarios that were put forward by the applicants, particularly in reference to, uh, you know, what uh, development could look like if the lot were subdivided in the future were quite revealing to us. And we've actually recommended that um, the existing lot area and the frontage of the lot be uh, um, essentially recognized um, in order to, you know, I think the intent would be to, um, make it more difficult or uh, to require a zoning bylaw exemption application, uh, sorry, a zoning by bylaw amendment application to uh, undertake a, a future uh, severance. And staff have also recommended that the property um, be made uh, subject to site plan control. Um, you know, I, 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 I can appreciate uh, Mr. Fawner's arguments, but I think, um, you know, for every argument he's made, there's be counter arguments available uh, throughout the official plan, um, you know, based on various policies in the communities. So hopefully that provides a bit of a, an overview um, of, of our uh, take on the application and I'd be happy to uh, further elaborate or clarify if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. And uh, Ms. Miller or Mr. Patch, would you care to, um Answer Councillor Zavitt's question about not wanting to reduce the height? Sure. Um, we, by limiting the footprint of the building to the existing foundation or clo very close to it, we don't have to take down more than seven tiny trees. And the, the, the aspect of the house, so we're, we're, we're limited on the ground 20 by 40 feet. And we've got to have a four bedroom house, living room, family room, attic, kitchen, bup, bup, bup. Um, the only way we could do it was to go up. Now we, would, we, were, we knew we had to be really careful because if we went up, we had to make sure you couldn't see the house from the lake or a neighbor or the road because it's really, it's, it's stretching your limits. And that's why we did the balloon test. And we did the balloon test three years ago, way before we got into the nitty gritty of how to make the house work. If you can't see it, what's the problem? That's our question. If you can't see the house, yes, it goes up high. There's only one place where you can see the whole thing top to bottom on the driveway as you approach it. If you can't see it, okay. Go ahead. We'll talk about the client's needs. Okay, and and okay. So so there's that. And now the, Catherine has reminded me that I should talk about the the client's needs. If the house were, we just took away the attic. It wasn't really clear because the slides were switched somehow back to front, and but when the 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 family room is the top room in the house. Then the roof comes down and there's no wall. And it's no longer a family room. It's no longer a family room. It's just another attic. And we have to, you know, so, so having a, a house for Windermere with a large family coming and going, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, so you can't see it. It doesn't work without its height. If we go someplace else on the property or make it wider on the property so it's not as high, we're taking down trees. Now, Catherine has worked for EPA and, and Environment Canada, and she is dedicated to taking care of the biosphere, 
taking care of the environment. And, and she is really, she's serious. If she can't do something that's going to really shake up people's awareness of what we need to do, and this is saving trees, what we need to do to hold on to the temperatures on this earth, and that's a worldwide problem. If we can't do anything to do that, it stretches just a little bit of a number. Where did the number come from? The number came from fire truck ladders. It's a human safety thing. That's where the 35 feet came from way back when. So, thank you. Okay, there you thank go. You. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I have to get back to what my thoughts were. I I like this application, quite frankly, and um, I actually have my own personal. I feel like I live in a treehouse. Uh, we do embrace we the things that we do. We're actually allowing somewhat the forest to take over the the mess that we created, um, and it's a long process. But what I really liked to hear is, um, I think I heard there's no blasting. And Correct. That was a, a huge one for me. Because, you know, I think a few of us have been to some properties that they blasted down probably 25 feet in some cases. I know I've been on Lake Rosso uh, and it's shocking. It, it's just shocking. And I believe that there's more harm to that blasting than to allow a, a building to go higher. Not every building can go higher. You know, the, the lot has to appreciate it. And, and I certainly recognize that, um, especially basement areas, which are utility space, but it has a door. So that's where the measurement has to come from. Um, I, I, think, I think this municipality should embrace some unique, different methods um, because we're eliminating some of the harmful methods that we are currently allowing today. And again, it mostly is blasting for me. So I, I um, and the fact that I'm not seeing this building from the water uh, makes a big difference for me. The, again, um, I, I want to embrace it. So I want to look at some better practices and I feel some of the, sometimes we're not listening to the better practices that come forward um, because they're not in our rule book. And we should be opening up our minds to there are better practices. And certainly, I know personally, I, I tell people, keep your costs down by going up. That's the reality. Don't widen things. Don't, you know, uh, that's a, just a bigger footprint. It's more costly. I don't believe, I'm not looking at this particular application from a cost perspective. But certainly from an environmental perspective, I think it, it works. And I hope that we can find a way to move this forward. If there's some tweaks and things, and, and I, I was encouraged by some of the information that Bryce had shared. Um, and as I said, I, I, th I think I would like to be more uh, optimistic and look at the possibility that this can work in our township. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, and through you, it certainly is unique and beautiful, but I do have some concerns. Um, the height, um, you've justified the height by the mature pines. Uh, one good downburst and um, that property will look like page 491, option B, sitting up there all by itself. And it does happen because Breezy Point uh, wiped out about 36 to 40 mature pine trees in one day, just with a downburst. So how high you build it shouldn't be dependent on how high the trees are. We've said 35 feet for a good reason, because if the trees go away, 35 feet is not intrusive. Um, there are two glass turrets and I do have concerns with them, um, basically for dark sky. I know that uh, Mr. Rosh has indicated that there will be some kind of mitigation, but um, 
looking at your virtual tour through, every room has huge glass windows in it. So there will be a lot of, um, a lot of light bleeding into the dark sky. And I do have concerns about that. Um, and just, just to mention something a little bit different for environmentally, we have a big window. We lose about half a dozen birds a year with that one big window, just they fly into it. Um, there'll be a lot flying around in the pines. Um, glass windows are something that they fly into. So are we looking at, at that as well? That's just my thought for the environment. But yes, I do have, I do have concerns about the height. Um, we did deny somebody else for the same reasons. They had glass turrets and we said, no, we don't want those. Um, so I don't know how you're gonna get around it, but I, I wish you luck with coming back with something a little bit uh, better modified to suit the environment. Okay, thank you, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to clarify, when I mentioned that I visited the property, I didn't actually set foot on the property to your point, uh, but I did visit it uh, from the ice this winter and uh, had an opportunity to look around. Um, there, there's a ton of amazing environmental steps within this application. And I certainly applaud all of that. My fear is we don't have enough environmental metrics within our current zoning bylaw to be able to support an application of this nature. And I have, am, am deathly afraid of a precedence that says I'm going to go up versus going out and I'm going to remain within a tree canopy. If our bylaws strictly stated tree canopy and there was no height restriction, I would potentially be in more in favor of this particular application. I, I notice in your, your diagrams, you know, your mechanical rooms are both below grade. So there might be some blasting involved to get us into this footprint. We don't, not 100% sure of that, but, and when I'm looking at, I'm going nine feet down below elevation for two mechanical rooms, which to get nine feet, if that is as big a cliff, I'm going to suggest you're going to find some rock when you get down that far underneath. Um, so I still don't get the full metric between a 5% lot coverage and an 8% lot coverage. And I appreciate we can subdivide the lot potentially. Uh, we've refused subdivisions on certain properties and we've asked for bigger lot frontages regularly. Um, just as of right doesn't always mean granted. Sometimes we turn those down, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose at OLT. But the reality is I cannot support 55 feet. I stated that back in February, had asked for some other things. Our staff have asked for some other considerations going forward and I don't see any of those other considerations at this point. So moving forward to our council, um, I'm going to have to recommend against that at this particular time. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm in agreement with Councillor Hayes and uh, Mayor Harding. I cannot support 55 feet. And the reason being, if you look at page 491, as Councillor Hayes said, if there was a major storm, they lost the trees, it would be up there. Secondly, um, our dark sky lighting is for outside, and yet there'll be lights inside, and there's no way of stopping that. And we have turned down uh, 42 feet. We have turned down 40 feet in other areas, and that. And I'm sorry, uh, and that. And if you look at, at page uh, 491, if you take from the edge of one staircase to the edge of the emergency one, you could put that as a footprint. You could probably drop it down and uh, put two or three stories in and uh, get to the 35 feet. So I, I, I am very sorry. The Millers have been modeled in the uh, community. I realize that, but uh, I'm, I'm looking at, at the future. And the future is everybody's gonna be wanting it. And we have to, to, to stop at some point. And I hope they, they realize that and they can uh, and that realign it to 35 feet. And I'm sure they can come up with a fantastic uh, and that design for it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Um, I will echo Councillor Nishikawa just in the fact that this is really unique and I think it's environmentally really moving forward. I do have the concerns that Mayor Harding did in terms of how do we how do we structure our bylaws and whatever so that it can't be abused. And that's that's a real problem for us. Um, it is a, a unique design and the fact that that it's um, you're not blasting is is a huge consideration. But I don't believe with the way the structure is now of our bylaws and uh, what we have coming at us at this at this planning committee at times that I also cannot support this at this point in time. So anybody else care to comment? So I believe I'm going to ask um, uh, Ms. Miller and Mr. Patch, I believe it came through loud and clear that you are not willing to make any accommodation. Otherwise I would look at deferring this perhaps once more, if you could bring the, bring the height back into the 35 foot range. I, I don't believe that's what I heard from you, but I, I, I certainly am not going to make that assumption without you telling me what I, what I did here. Well, I guess I just want to say it's disappointing because what we are fundamentally doing are saving the forest. I would say, no, we're not blasting because the existing footprint has a basement. So that's what we're using. Um, you'll have bigger problems if you have the downburst that completely destroys all the trees in our forest. I don't, so, you know, my worry is I'm only one of this big family. They have agreed that we can do our project on this site this way because We're gonna pay we, um, we are not removing the trees. That is our really fundamental. So um, it, it, if, if we're not going to do this, then they're going to rethink what they want to do with this property. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed because, because I care so much about the forest there, but, you know, that's, um, that's all I would say. I'm very disappointed also. We thought that if we assembled a world fame, world talented team, we're willing to look anywhere. The engineer is in London. If we can find a hang on, sweetie. If we can find if we can find the best talent in the world, we're going to use it, and we're connected already to half of it. Um, as far as you're coming up with a way of controlling responsible environmental processes and construction and use and care and maintenance, we will have the people who are the number one people in the world to help you put together regulations that will work and be workable. I think you're throwing something away. This was going to be our gift to Muskoka. We have three other projects. We have a, a, a Connecticut project, for Yale University, we have a project in the desert in Arizona. Each one is speaking to environmental issues in that climate. And this was for the Northwoods in Ontario. So if you guys are so stuck, hang on, if you guys are so stuck with what you're familiar with, what you know how to manage, what you know how to penalize, that you can't reach out for the, the brass ring and say, what is the best we can do? That's the only thing that interests me. What is the best we can do? And we'll do it, but we're gonna be doing it someplace else because you don't want it. You don't want it. That's okay. it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Patch. Um, okay, so any more comments from 
Council, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you. Uh, emotional. Um, you know, you speak the truth, sir. <laughs> uh, but I'm not sure that's the purview of this committee. Uh, it's, a, it's a heavier lift. Uh, yesterday, as chair of General and Finance Committee, we turned down a quarter of a million dollar offer to put two electric charging stations in Bala beside a hydro plant. We, as, a, as an entity, don't have the horsepower here and now. And, and I think certainly perhaps as it's an election year, perhaps we could be looking at uh, uh, moving forward in the new years with uh, a committee that looks at engineering, technology, forward thinking. We don't have that here and now. We deal with here and now. And our bylaws here and now say we can't, we can't allow this. We've, we've just spent four years of our lives denying this kind of thing. We, so we can't we're not allowed to be forward thinking, unfortunately. I hear some of my counselor friends, you know, yeah, I love this project. Don't, don't, think, don't think I don't, I love it. I just can't, within the confines of the space we work in, I can't approve this. And so I, I, I beg of you not to be too disappointed. You know, I, I think it's wonderful you're doing things for the world and I, I wish you might have shared that earlier. It wouldn't have helped in the final decision, but, but thank you for your, you know, your efforts. I appreciate it. Councillor Edwards. Yes, thank you very much. Um, again, I am sorry that we have, have to turn this down. Uh, I know uh, Catherine A. Smith, she's a neighbor. I would gladly look at the property and see what else you could do with it if, if, if you want it. Uh, because the, the emergency staircase, it, it would probably be slab on, on grade. Some of it could be slab on grade. And, that, and I think you could work something out I wish you would ask for a uh, actual deferral at this time, because like as I, I just can't support it at this time. But I'd be glad to work with you on on something that uh, that, that that would be uh, a unique uh, opportunity for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. I do not believe that that's what our applicants wish is a deferral to change anything. I think they've been quite clear on that. So uh, with all that, I am going to read the motion. Uh, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Kelly. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA-52-21 Muskoka Trust Roll Number 3-2-074 be approved subject to the following. Amendments to limit lot coverage on the subject property to 7,557 square feet, 5%, and to recognize the existing lot area and lot, lot frontage, and that the subject property and proposed development be made subject to site plan control. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Okay. All opposed? All right, that is defeated. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, um, committee, it is, I know it's 25 to five. We have a few things that we would still need to get through today. We are hoping that we can do it by five um, because I, I, I believe we can go through it fairly quickly. Um, so, okay, so Mr. Pink, I think, the next thing up is development services, environmental is bill 109. Please take it away. Thank you, Chair. I'll try to keep my introduction as brief as possible. Uh, committee will recall last month, I prepared a report on a uh, draft bill, uh, bill 109 that proposed some changes to the planning act. Uh, somewhat uh, oddly in the middle of the consultation period, the province gave uh, that bill royal assent. So the uh, report today before you is the uh, outcome of the bill. Um, we uh, literally submitted comments uh, and later that afternoon, I got word that the bill received uh, royal assent. The two main changes I've highlighted for your review, uh, one which requires action. Uh, as of July 1st, all site plan applications, that's all commercial, industrial, residential development, must be delegated to an officer of the municipality. Staff's recommending that a bylaw be brought forward to council at the June meeting to do so. Uh, the second change uh, is in regards to uh, refund of application fees starting January 1st. 
uh, if planning applications in particular site plan and zoning bylaw amendment are not made within legislative timelines, applicants will be owed a refund. I personally, I provided my comments last month. I'm not in agreement with this change. I am expecting other municipalities likely to have concerns. I haven't quite seen it, although I did see one resolution on yesterday's GNF committee already raising concerns with the approach. I don't know if uh, more to come. However, starting January 1st, that will add an administrative burden and potentially uh, substantial impact to planning revenues given current timelines. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Uh, Councillor Jerry Lewis. Thank you, Chair. I do have a question for David. Um, David, you've, you've made it very clear that the province has indicated that we must delegate site plan approvals to staff. Um, was there anything said whether staff have any leeway? So they're all delegated to staff. Let's say staff feels there's one that's uh, a difficult for them to think, or they thought the council might, there might be a benefit to council considering it. Is there any provision would staff have any leeway to voluntarily bring something back? Mr. Pink? Through you, I, I'm not sure, I'm sorry if I didn't understand the, the question entirely, but if the concern is that there would still like to be some municipal oversight, one thing that could be considered is, uh, although the ultimate decision may be delegated to staff and we're mandated to have that, uh, I know a number of municipalities may have information type public meetings for more significant development proposals, and you can still uh, bring applications to planning committee or whatever forum you feel appropriate in order to, uh, again, make the public more aware or have committee uh, somewhat oversight. However, at the end of the day, it will be a staff delegated authority to approve it. Um, off the top of my head, my main concern, if you wanted to explore that approach is you'll likely will be refunding those application fees um, because there would be limited ability to meet the timelines under the uh, Planning Act if site plans were brought to Planning Committee and or Council. Uh, just a, a quick supplementary, um, but it seems to me that you had delegated authority, which was maybe a little fuzzy in times, but it seems to me you did bring some things to us that you didn't have to right in the past. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I just wanted, I wouldn't want to preclude you having the benefit of our great wisdom here, if you required it. <laughs> oh, Mr. Pink, comment on it all. <laughs> Appreciate that um, offer of assistance. Uh, yes, you're correct. Currently, the site plan bylaw delegates the authority to the director to approve of minor site plans. Doesn't define uh, what that is and states that major site plans will come. Again, doesn't uh, provide a definition. The rule of thumb staff has used is typically any larger scale commercial development that's visible to the public eye, we've been bringing to uh, planning committee. Again, uh, perhaps on those more significant proposals, staff will consider uh, a public information type meeting and we can invite councillors to uh, watch. Um, and the odd time we have done that, um, perhaps uh, we could give that more consideration going forward. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to read this motion then, seeing as it's law and we don't have much choice. Um, Councillor, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Roberts, be it resolved that planning committee recommend to Township Council that a bylaw delegating authority to approve of all residential, commercial, and industrial site plan applications to the Director of Development Services and Environmental Sustainability or their designated uh, or designate to be approved. Any discussion? All in favor? That carries. All right. All right. Uh, Mr. Pink, if you want to start in on uh, on Manette now, that would be terrific. Uh, Jared, I, I, I've declared a conflict, so I'm... The next out. report on the agenda is in regard to official plan amendment number 49 to the District of Muskoka official plan. I believe I did forward that meeting invitation to councillors. Uh, there was a public meeting, uh, I believe it was late April, uh, held by the District of Muskoka. Uh, when the Township of Muskoka Lakes adopted OPA 56, we recommended that the District of Muskoka official plan be updated uh, in order to be consistent uh, with the official plan amendment we passed. They held a public meeting and have circulated us for comments. I have prepared in chart form in the appendix 
uh, a few comments. I have spoken to district staff and their consultant. They have no issues with uh, our suggestions. Uh, the most, uh, I guess, prominent one I would note, uh, you may recall when council adopted the township official plan amendment, we wanted uh, those foundational elements embedded in the district of Muskoka official plan, in particular, uh, the limit on gross floor area and the number of units permitted in Minette. And that would give more certainty that uh, down the road, uh, future owners may not apply uh, to increase those numbers. It would necessitate a district official plan amendment, a fairly significant step. So staff's recommendation is to forward those comments. The public meeting at the district was fairly well received. Uh, minimal concerns were raised. It was general support for the changes. And I know district staff are hopeful to bring the township official plan amendment and their official plan amendment both for uh, approval shortly. Available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pink. It was a it was a good meeting, actually. Um, I did uh, I did watch it. Any comments from anyone? Okay. Well, all your comments look great, Mr. Pink. So I'll just read this motion. Uh, moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Kelly. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that staff report Plan 2022-91 Appendix One be forwarded to the District of Muskoka as the Township of Muskoka Lakes comments on official plan amendment 49 to the Muskoka official plan. Any comments? All in favor? Carries unanimously, Madam Clerk. We're good. We're good. Okay. Uh, Chair, uh, Chair uh, um, I tried to break in earlier. I had declared a conflict on that and I turned off my video and I'd like the minutes to reflect that. It was not unanimous. I did not vote on it. I think you are negated. So I think it's you. It, it was unanimous because we were the ones who could vote did vote on it. But I would like it recorded in the minutes. You didn't acknowledge me that I did remove myself from the meeting during that. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay. And so now we are on to uh, acceptance of the um, Heritage and Attainable Housing meetings minutes. Everyone okay? We'll take that into. We'll accept those and then um, the report from Mr. Pink again on the attainable housing rebate program. Mr. Pink, oh, hang on. Thank you, Chair. My batting average is a little better than my staff's today, so hopefully the last one goes smooth. Um, we have a uh, uh, currently an attainable housing rebate program where the municipality refunds certain municipal application fees for housing that meets criteria. That criteria is uh, currently spelled out in a schedule. And what we found over the years is the attainable housing uh, standards uh, change, whether at the provincial or federal levels, at the district level, and also our definitions have uh, in some instances prevented the ability to apply uh, in somewhat due to technicalities. So the attainable housing uh, and Heritage Committee has reviewed that program, has simplified it significantly to essentially tie it to uh, if the District of Muskoka uh, grants any uh, funds or approval, they would be eligible uh, for the same uh, for a rebate of municipal fees. And the draft uh, is before you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hey, committee, any questions on this? No? All right. Um, moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved the Planning Committee recommends to Township Council that the updated policy entitled CFS 11 Attainable Housing Rebate Program attached to report number plan 2022-86 be adopted. No discussion, all in favor? Carried unanimously. Councillor Hayes, would you like to just talk about the habitat build and the, what's happening on June 10th for a minute or not? I, it's before our next meeting. I, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Glenn to oh. talk about that. Okay, I just think all our, all our councillors should be aware of what's happening here, um, councillors Alice. Oh, this is a test. Uh, on June the 10th, and I, I, this is not quite fair, I do believe it's at 2.30 
uh, at um, on Elm Street, uh, where the Habitat Human uh, for Humanity build is occurring. There's a, uh, a sod turning event. I know all media is invited. Uh, obviously, the politicians in the area, certainly the Habitat group and the public. Um, and so there'll be a lot of information, a lot of uh, marketing done around this to invite people to that site uh, in Bala uh, for a sod turning um, and you can sit on a on a grader and get your picture taken. Uh, it's a big event, and, and it's uh, the first one in years uh, for Bala. And so, uh, thanks to everyone for you know all of the participation today. I do believe it's uh, June the tenth at two thirty uh, on Elm Street. Okay. I think it's 16 Elm Street. And then there's a reception at Muskoka Brewery as a fundraiser for Habitat from four to six. So. Uh, just thought I'd put that plug in for our attainable housing. I might. You do need to go on the site and uh, pay, uh, I guess, reserve tickets. So you can't just arrive. And it's a strange setup. But uh, you can go ahead on, onto that site and, and order those tickets. They're $16 per person. And it's purely a fundraising event. So thank you. But it ends in $16. So you could give 116 Wow, you are sharp today. <laughs> I am sharp today. Okay. Um, anyway, just for anybody who's interested. So, all right. So I think we're down to um, new business now. Would anybody have any new business? Uh, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you. And through you, and I will do my best to keep this one brief. Um, I have been in receipt, as I know many of us have, uh, of a number of uh, questions, comments, complaints, concerns as it relates to short-term rentals. And uh, I know that we have all been in receipt and understand that municipalities around us continue to change and evolve the things that they are doing. And as such, you know, I'm certainly receiving quite a bit of communication. I believe council has received and been on the receiving end of some of those as well. And so in conversation, and maybe I could turn it over to staff, it, it's a matter of trying to figure out how we approach uh, short-term rentals, the, the, the problem, the topic, as a township, we've clearly have an approach that we've been using for the last five or six years. This has been a long-standing discussion at council tables way before my time. Um, but the, the environment around us has changed and it continues to change. And so I think it's just incumbent upon us to say and work with staff to say, how do we create a path forward on this particular topic that's manageable from a staff standpoint, but is at least letting us have a relook at the approach we're currently taking and asking, is it the same approach we want to continue taking? So if I could maybe just ask uh, Director Pink, um, if he could just walk through, you know, the possible next steps um, uh, as that relates to this particular topic, that would be great. Thank you. Hey, Director Pink, I know you've been through, you've been here before, please go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yes, it is uh, certainly a loaded issue, and I'm not sure how much detail the committee is looking for uh, at this time, but uh, there are a number of ways to address short-term rentals. There's been a number of innovative approaches uh, across North America and, uh, and abroad. Um, really, uh, what I find in Ontario, most either pursue uh, some type of uh, prohibition, which is typically done through official plan and zoning controls, or a registry or licensing type system to regulate the activity and put those parameters on it. Uh, this municipality has studied this issue at length uh, for quite, uh, quite a long time, a few years ago. Uh, some councillors may, may recall that we're in the previous term. Ultimately, council uh, did not agree to uh, approve of any legislation or, or new bylaw or registry system. However, we did go through a steering committee uh, lengthy steering committee process received uh, quite a bit of public input. I had drafted a licensing bylaw. Um, I'm happy to bring those details forward as to what was done previously and uh, open to further discussions as to what can be done going forward. In, um, in my opinion, the zoning route is very challenging in a setting like uh, Muskoka Lakes. Uh, as we commonly see uh, through planning application discussions, the municipality can't be retroactive. So uh, the Planning Act um, grandfathers these uses. If property owners previously rented their cottages, that activity could continue and there's no way for the municipality to 
uh, prevent that. So in my opinion, that largely negates any benefits of trying to uh, prohibit the activity. It would be very difficult for by law enforcement staff to uh, prove um, that properties were not used in that fashion previously. Uh, I think also uh, most of the complaints that I've heard uh, revolve around things such as noise, uh, trespassing, uh, type of behavioral uh, type issues, servicing and ensuring the uh, property is properly serviced for the amount of occupants and the registry uh, or licensing type system can uh, be an effective tool to address those concerns. Uh, if you recall, during the official plan review discussions, there is a draft uh, in the latest draft. There is one policy that uh, refers to the township's ability uh, or potential to craft such legislation. And again, I, uh, I sort of sense that likely uh, I brought uh, this forward to committee many, many years ago before our neighbors started uh, examining the issue. And I, um, I think I've known for some time that it's likely to come back, it's somewhat inevitable. So I'm happy to have those discussions with committee and council going forward. My last comment, uh, just as you can see, there's a number of projects going on. We still have a very busy uh, planning workload, as you can tell by the, the time of day. And I just want to uh, sort of have one um, piece in that it will be challenging given the resources to try to do something during the summer months. Uh, likely uh, is a project that uh, perhaps staff may be able to try to tackle uh, later this year over the winter months if uh, if committee is desirous of reopening the discussion. Available to answer any questions. If I could just have a quick supplemental, I do see other people have their hands up, but uh, just given the time today, um, and I know that the report did come back to us before, I would be simply satisfied with um, the, the March report from I think it was 2019, with perhaps some further comments if it's fairly uh, not too time intensive on staff's part coming forward and making that part of the conversation um, and giving us all a chance to digest it, understand it again, and uh, having a more fulsome conversation at a later date. Um, that's why I brought this up under new business. I'm, I'm very mindful of everybody's time, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, I would be certainly satisfied with that approach uh, if, if that's committee's wishes, so. Okay, Councillor Mazan, I was going to suggest the same thing. Perhaps Mr. Okay. Pink could bring that back with maybe a few comments and we could have a bigger discussion then. I believe what we need to do is try to set a framework, like get money in the budget or ask for money in the budget going forward, because I agree, we can't take it on right at this instant, but maybe we can set the framework up for the next council. Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask because I like Lake Base. Lake Base just passed theirs. I think, um, gee, if Lake Base can do it, why can't Muskoka Lakes? Is <laughs> mostly the, you know, it really does come down to that. So I would, I would ask if staff could even bring their bylaw forward. Uh, one of the things that I get discouraged about is when I know that a uh, up, up, property that I'm, I've been in for over many years, which essentially has been a two bedroom home on the water that is now being rented out and generally has no less than six cars there. That septic system, and I confirmed it with the, the um, uh, previous property owners and, and certainly with uh, through Sandy Boss, the system is underserviced quite a bit, and um, and 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 he also in this case it's it's one of those old bills, right? So it's much much closer to the water, like those. But the fact that um, like I would like the ability to be able to call staff and say, look, this is you know we we knew the situation on um, we were able to do this at the property uh, on Curry Street um, that we were having so many problems with, um, I'll just say in 18, uh, 2018 and earlier, um, and because they weren't hooked up to sewer and water at the time, uh, they had the ability to be hooked up to sewer, but they weren't, but that was one of the avenues that we could approach them because they were, um, and in, their, in this case, same thing, little three bedroom cottage 
there would be 15, sometimes 20 people there, as noted by. So I, I just hope that we can see that other bylaw come forward and also uh, look at that possibility that we could start reporting when we know that a certain uh, a, a property cannot accept that many guests. Thank you, Councillor Nishikawa. I, 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 all well taken, and I think that's we'll we'll revisit that when we get the report back too, in terms of how we do that, etc. Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, yes, I, I I know this this is going to take a long time, but I just had one thought, David. Maybe you could answer. I'm more concerned about. I'm not. Where a person owns a place and rents it out, that's one thing. But there is a trend now of, of pe people and corporations buying property solely for the purpose of Airbnb or rental. And, and that's a commercial venture. That's not no longer residential. And we went through the opposite with our resorts. And I just wondered if uh, something uh, couldn't be done about those where it's clearly they're operating a commercial enterprise and uh, they shouldn't be doing that. Now you mentioned that if a property had been rented out like that, it was grandfathered, that, that kind of concerned me. So maybe you could add to that. Mr. Pink. Thank you for that question, uh, Councillor Jacob. It's a very good question and it's certainly been on my mind. I think that's largely the issue. I wouldn't wanna mislead that a licensing bylaw would prohibit the activity, which I know uh, some repairs feel we need to do. Um, but I do recognize that's that's the issue. Uh, I would note we previously did receive a legal opinion that even those uh, consistently rented properties still comply with the zoning currently. But I can uh, investigate that further as potential uh, options as to how to control that activity. I know there, there are ways in other places. Uh, the difficulty here, uh, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, elsewhere, typically, most municipalities have defined short-term rentals as 30 days or less. And that's where it gets a bit tricky in a setting like Muskoka Lakes. Most rentals are shorter uh, here, and it will be an enforcement challenge if we pick uh, a length of time, such as a weekend or a week uh, and that sort of activity. But uh, certainly that's on my list to explore if this matter comes back to try to address that uh, concern, Councillor Jagowitz, in the best way to try to do so. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Hayes. Thank you. And through you, when we had the um, research done on this last time, uh, Mr. Prink brought forward several really good licensing options. So if he still has those in his back pocket, he may want to send those out as well. I'm sure he can dust those off and send them out to us, I'm sure. Councillor Edwards? Yes, thank you. As far as new uh, and that business, uh, the Raymond Hall, there was a grant for washrooms there. And I know we've been waiting for the, the uh, parks, trails and, and rec centers, but you know, I'd hate to lose that grant because I think it was somewhere in the, the midst of $100,000. I would like to see us go ahead with that. It's a warming center, it's a well-used hall. I know there's over 2,500 or more people visit that hall in a year, so it's well-used. And, and I don't wanna see us lose the grant could we bring that forward? Thank you. Uh, certainly. Is that more under Mr. Becking's purview? I think. So, okay, we'll we'll ask Mr. Becking about that. So, okay, anything further, Council? I think we're at the end, but before we go, I have to tell you that we are, I am losing Elizabeth Markle, who has done an amazing job at bringing everybody in and out and anticipating my thoughts. She's moving over to buildings. So everybody else in the room is saying, she's still the family, but I'm losing her. So anyway, Elizabeth, thank you very much. It's been really fun working with you. Okay, I am going to read our um, motion to adjourn. I know that this time. <laughs> thank you. Um, be it resolved that planning committee meeting adjourn at um, 4 58 p.m and the next regular planning uh, committee meeting will be held on thursday june 16th 2022 at 9 a.m electronically from the council chambers municipal offices in port carling ontario further be it resolved that the special planning committee meeting scheduled for friday may 13th 2022 at 9 a.m be cancelled as it is no longer necessary all in favor 
Thank you, everyone. I know it was another long day today. We got a lot accomplished, and I hope everybody has a chance to enjoy the beautiful sunshine tomorrow. Have a good weekend.